This meeting is being recorded. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to, what is this, day three, I think, of our council meeting. <clears throat> Doing pretty well so far. I'll first ask if our executive director, Merrick Burden, has any announcements. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and council members. Um, so just maybe one announcement this morning. Um, as I alluded to yesterday, uh, we're starting to move a little bit of staff ar around and make sure we have redundancy. And so you'll start seeing that today uh, with Kelly sitting in this seat a little bit more, and then um, we'll have some admin uh, sitting in uh, Sandra's seat or next to her a little bit over the next couple of days. So that's all that's going on when you see that. Um, otherwise, uh, I do not have any further announcements, Mr. Chairman. Oh, great, we'll get started then. I first wanna welcome Rich Lincoln uh, here, an, an alum of the council and one of our representatives, but, in order for us to formally get started on agenda item F3, I'll turn to Dr. Dahl for an overview. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, council members. Uh, I'll read from the situation summary for this agenda item on the North Pacific Fisheries Commission, an update that uh, Mr. Lincoln will give in detail. Uh, so the, con the Convention on the Conservation and Management of High Seas Fishery Resources in the North Pacific Ocean uh, establishing the NPFC came into effect in 2015 with U.S. participation codified into law in late 2016. Its purpose generally is to address conservation and management of marine species, with some exceptions, in the North Pacific not already covered by pre-existing international fishery management instruments. Management currently is focused on eight priority species and their exploitation by trawl, gill net, and longline fisheries. These include fisheries targeting North Pacific Armorhead and Splendid, Splendid Alfonsino on North Pacific seamounts, as well as fisheries exploiting six priority species, uh, uh, pelagic species. And those are Pacific Sauri, Neon Flying Squid, Japanese flying squid, chub mackerel, Pacific soury, blue spotted mackerel, and Japanese sardine. Canadian longline pot vessels harvest a modest amount of sable fish on sea mounts in the Gulf, Gulf of Alaska. In the past decade, effort has been limited to three vessels permitted by lottery, with harvests in the last 20 years typically being in the 10 to over 20 metric ton range with two exceptional years around 60 metric tons. The commission also has a stated priority to protect vulnerable marine ecosystems associated with gear habitat interactions around various seamounts. Current members include Canada, China, the, U the European Union, Japan, Republic of Korea, Russian Federation, Chinese Taipei, the United States, and the Republic of Vanuatu. Panama has cooperating non-contracting non -co party status. Enacting law for U.S. participation in the North Pacific Fisheries Commission is found at uh, in U.S. Code, Chapter 16, or Section 16, Chapter 96. The law allocates one U.S. Commissioner seat to the Chairman of the Pacific Fishery Man Management Council or a designation, a designee of such chairperson. 
Mr. Rich Lincoln has served in this capacity since 2018 when he was appointed by the council chair. The NPFC held its seventh meeting March 22 through 24 this year in Sapporo, Japan. Mr. Lincoln will brief the council on the role and activities of the NPFC and the, and the outcomes of its most recent meeting. Um, and the only materials associated with this is uh, slides that Mr. Um, Lincoln will be presenting and speaking to. And um, there's not exactly a, an action here. It's just listed on the situation summary as council discussion and guidance as appropriate. Uh, so that is uh, concludes my overview. Thank you, Kit. Are there any questions on the overview? And if not, we'll turn to Commissioner Richard Lincoln. Welcome, Rich. Thank you. I guess it's time for Mr. Lincoln to get started. Nice to see you all after about three years. Seems like a long time. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to provide a, uh, an update on uh, the North Pacific Fisheries Commission process today. Uh, talk a little bit about progress uh, that the commission has or hasn't made towards meeting its mandate and hopefully provide some information that might help the council think about um, how they uh, want to, the relevance to PFMC and how they might want to engage in the uh, commission process in the future. So next slide. So it just uh, seemed like it'd be helpful to uh, just create a picture of, on a map of where where exactly that we're talking about. Uh, and this is that area. Um, you can see that it goes, um, you know, a fair, a fair amount south, but encompasses um, a lot of the uh, latitudes that the council uh, deals with and across the Pacific. Um, but also um, just thinking about the relevance of um, this area and other RFMO activities. Um, also just wanted to go to the next slide and uh, give a reference point in terms of other RFMO processes in the area. Um, so this isn't, uh, this definitely is an area that has some RFMO activity. Um, next slide. And so you can see where the, basically how the, uh, the convention area for the North Pacific Fisheries Commission overlaps, um, Western Central Pacific and I, uh, TT, uh, the Intertropical uh, Tuna Commission area in the Eastern Pacific. So the, the point I wanted to make here is that one of the things I think uh, for the uh, council to think about is that um, the parties that Kit, Kit mentioned that are um, uh, members of the North Pacific Fisheries Commission are also uh, members of the other two RFMOs in the area. And a lot of the uh, conservation and management measures that deal with um, monitoring uh, compliance and surveillance, uh, things like uh, VMS, uh, uh, high seas boarding uh, agreements, things like that, um, the degree to which there's consist consistency across those RFMOs is a, can be a pretty important thing in terms of um, uh, just making sure that uh, uh, there's continuity in, in, in terms of our ability to um, uh, make sure that there's compliance with uh, rules and harvest me measures in the areas. Uh, next slide. So I think uh, uh, Kit covered a lot of this in the uh, uh, sit some, so I'm not going to uh, go over um, all the details, but I will talk a little bit about um, the structure of the commission, which won't look unfamiliar to a lot of kind of RFMO processes. There's a scientific committee, a technical and compliance committee that uh, deals with those things in the MCS world, um, and then you know basically the uh, finance administration committee. The um, Commission meets annually. Um, it meets in conjunction with the Technical and Compliance Committee, and um, I think that that the conjunction of those two uh, meetings um, has been important because the commission has spent most of its time uh, since its establishment in really just trying to get the foundation built for basic things like data collection systems, VMS, uh, compliance policies, uh, high seas boarding agreements, transshipment uh, CMMs, and those kinds of things. Um, and I. Frankly, I think uh, um, my observation has been um, that the commission has struggled a little bit in really getting a foundation built. And most of the times in the commission process, when we talk about um, uh, 
policies or conservation measures that deal with uh, compliance um, on water monitoring, i.e. things like IUU. Um, most of the times the uh, delegations, especially from the, the US and Canada are coming in, uh, you know, using foundations from um, the other RFMOs, especially the Western Central Pacific, because there's a lot of foundation built that already exists. Um, and I think the frustration has uh, been a little bit that it seems like uh, there's a bit of pushing water uphill to try to get that consistency with things that are already in place that countries have already agreed to in other RFMOs. So, um, so there has been a, a really heavy um, focus on on those types of foundation elements of just the the structure, the foundation of uh, management and compliance. It's important for uh, um, this kind of a body. Uh, the science committee um, meets annually and intersessionally, but meets in the fall. So um, ironically, um, whereas in a process like this, the SSC is bringing forth things on stock assessments and dealing with topics like management strategy evaluation. Um, the science committee is never in, in the room with the, with the uh, annual commission and the members at the same time, um, which I think has um, my observation is that it, um, it feels like there hasn't really been a, a lot of focus on what I'd, I'd call stock conservation and management measures from for those uh, uh, priority species that uh, Kit, Kit mentioned. Um, so that's a, that's been a challenge. And I think just as a kind of a ref, reference point looking uh, towards the future, uh, the next annual meeting uh, next year is in the, uh, April 9th through 19th uh, in Japan pretty long sessions. The one that we just had in Hokkaido um, was about eight days, um, very long meetings, a bit dysfunctional. So it can be a little bit frustrating process like most um, multinational RFMO uh, meetings. This one has its own special flavors. Um, having missed a, a lot of in-person meetings in that period between the, the last time until um, uh, the two weeks ago that we had had an in-person commission meeting was in, uh, in 20, 2019. So it had been quite some time before uh, the members had been together in the same room and um, the virtual process of the, uh, of the commission had been, uh, uh, if you compared it to the council process here, had been um, kind of from one end of the spectrum to the other. So it has been a it's been a frustrating few years when a, a lot of progress hadn't been made um, during the virtual process, and there was um, quite a bit of work done um, at the most recent meeting. Uh, I think we go to the next slide. So I just wanted to um, just give a couple of uh, overviews, not to get into the detail on um, all those uh, species, but just to give you a little bit of flavor. So Kit mentioned of the eight uh, priority species that six of those are a uh, pelagic species important to um, in their own right as um, you know species harvested in the system, but certainly for their ecosystem importance and potential. Uh, the current trends on on stock status haven't been very favorable for um, for those uh, priority species in the commission process with the uh, with one exception that I'll mention, but Pacific starry has been a has been a topic of um, of key discussion with respect to the, the need for some management controls. As you can, on the left-hand side of the picture, the, the top line is uh, catch trends, the bottom line is effort. Um, and Pacific Sari at, are at record low levels at this point, um, having been up as high as um, 600,000 600, metric tons down to, you know, catches in the, uh, Maybe a you know just over 100. I think about 160,000 metric tons in both the commission and the uh, na uh, adjacent national waters. So the commission st struggled a little bit to um, set uh, total about total allowable catch limits that are consistent with the stock status. Um, there's still disagreement amongst just basic things like the stock assessment models to be used. Um, there are um, continuing pl plans in place to come to agreement on, on stock assessments for the stock and uh, do a management strategy evaluation. But I think one of the challenges there of trying to get basic um, harvest um, strategies and control rules in place for a population that is in the process of needing immediate protection is really creating some problems um, in that it brings up immediate questions of how reductions in catch would be allocated amongst the countries that have different, um, you know, different 
levels of interest and participation in the fishery. Efforts been the same. So at the at the most recent meeting, um, the, uh, there was some progress in that area um, that I'll mention. On the right hand side, Japanese sardine probably is the is the one bright spot of uh, those uh, species. It is at um, has been at fairly high levels. The uh, the catch is up towards uh, above 1 million metric tons. Uh, the uh, stock uh, seems to be in pretty good health. There has been some uh, effort um, response in terms of the abundance um, after um, summary, uh, some lows during the, during the COVID timeframe. Uh, next slide, Sandra. So then we'll just talk a little bit about the two bottom uh, fish species that, that Kit mentioned. They're both in uh, in pretty tough shape. Um, they're associated with the seamounts, uh, as Kit mentioned, in the uh, northwestern Pacific. Um, a couple of seamounts with, uh, you know, pretty um, vulnerable uh, habitats related to corals and sponges. Um, very, I mean, they, these are fisheries, though, that at, at current levels, have very low effort. There's just a few vessels out there. I guess I would almost call them, um, I don't know, uh, just kind of legacy uh, fisheries from uh, Japan, a couple of vessels that um, just the um, some of the uh, countries just really seem to have a hard time uh, dealing with. Uh, there have been some measures in the in those areas in terms of um, some uh, res restrictions on uh, on harvest and effort, um, it's the one fishery in the uh, commission process that requires a 100% monitoring or any observation at all for that matter in terms of observers. Um, so there is quite a bit of focus on this fishery, both in terms of uh, the catch and effort, but also um, impact on uh, uh, fragile bottom habitats with um, actually um, has some uh, TAC impacts with respect to corals and sponges in terms of the in terms of the harvest impacts. Um, and you'll see both for um, Pacific Armorhead and, and uh, Splendid uh, Alpha Encino on the right that um, uh, both the trends in, in catch and um, in effort are both in, in uh, very low states. Next slide. Uh, so just in terms of the, uh, some current status on key topics, I mentioned Pacific Sari, uh, record low levels. Um, the, com the commission just um, agreed to TACs that um, have been reduced from uh, considerably, but uh, I think from like 300, 000, 330,000 metric tons down to almost um, half that level. Well, a couple hundred thousand, but TAC is actually still set above the actual uh, recent harvest level. So the impact of the uh, TACs is relatively you know, inconsequential. The uh, parties agreed to um, effort uh, reductions in the in the recent um, in the recent meeting two weeks ago, um, and again. Uh, there has been uh, a lot of inertia based on the fact that stock assessments and uh, management strategy evaluations, you know, haven't been completed for those, which is a, a priority for the scientific committee this year. Um, Chubb mackerel, um, the, have been some concerns about effort increases. It's one of the probably um, uh, besides Japanese sardines, the next um, uh, largest um, harvest uh, that occurs in these species. Um, again, no stock assessment uh, for chub mackerel for the um, for the and the um, uh, squid species. Um, there are uh, uh, conservation management measures in place that have basically frozen the footprint. The parties have agreed not to increase their um, uh, effort uh, from recent levels and in, in, for all those other species in recognition that there are no stock assessments and there are you know, uncertainty about um, what their stock status is. Um, I mentioned the issues with bottom fish, vulnerable marine habitats. Um, I think uh, there are some, uh, probably some views in uh, from uh, not just Canada and the U.S. in the commission process, but uh, for some of the other parties that these may be particularly for those um, sea mounts that um, are very uh, m much focused of, of fishery effort that they may in fact be areas that just simply should uh, be subject to uh, complete closures. There's very little effort. The stock status is very low. 
climate change, the commission just adopted a resolution to consider uh, best scientific information on climate uncertainties. Um, there obviously, though, is work to be done as a, a general policy intent. What would that uh, mean in terms of implementation? Next slide. Um, talking about current status, the key topics on uh, monitoring, compliance, and surveillance. Um, uh, the high seas boarding uh, inspections have, were a particular issue during the COVID times, um, especially with Chinese vessels not um, uh, allowing inspections, uh, high seas inspections that had, had been agreed to in terms of uh, conservation and management measures. Um, there was quite a bit of suspicion from um, uh, most of the parties that that um, the, the government basically told uh, vessels not to allow boarding uh, over COVID concerns, but that that um, direction occurred after some um, IEU had been identified on on some of the vessels that um, that had been inspected. Um, so that was a big issue at the uh, commission process. Um, uh, a lot of discussion about whether those vessels should be put on the I, an IUU list. Um, high seas boarding inspection uh, uh, revisions were made at this most recent meeting to uh, try to deal with those loopholes. Transshipment is a big issue in the uh, commission process, about 2 million uh, tons of catch. Um, you know, largely all the catch in the commission area is subject to transshipment. Um, transshipment uh, measure was finally put in place at the most recent meeting in terms of uh, tightening up notification requirements so that um, those uh, transshipment activities could be inspected. Um, again, there is no... Um, there is no uh, observer uh, requirements in uh, for most of the fisheries outside of bottom fish, so it's a you know a significant concern about um, potential for IUU activities in the area. Um, there is some uh, work to be done on the on uh, developing observer and EM uh, observer and or EM requirements for on water monitoring, but I um, I would say that's um, has is woefully behind. Um, and then with respect to compliance monitoring, uh, whether the countries um, are meeting their, um, you know, their uh, commitments under the um, uh, conservation and management measures established under the commission is, has been a continuing discussion about um, how those should be measured and uh, when compliance isn't um, uh, being met, what the, you know, what the repercussions uh, should be. So, you know, a lot of these things aren't, a lot of these challenges aren't unique to the North Pacific um, Fisheries Commission. They um, show up in RFMO processes, but th I think these challenges are unique from the standpoint that this is a relatively uh, young uh, RFMO process and hasn't been uh, functioning uh, at, uh, I would say, optimum levels at all. There's been some changes in the, recently in, in terms of the, um, Secretariat that I think are going to be positive in that respect, um, and uh, I would say that the Canadians and the, um, the United States play kind of a unique role in the in the commission process in that um, neither country really has significant harvest opportunities um, in the commission waters, you know, with the exception of the um, limited uh, activity that Canadians have on, uh, some of the seamounts off the, off the West coast here, um, for sable fish, which is, you know, rel relatively minor activity. So they, uh, the two countries tend to play a role in the process of trying to, um, influence, uh, you know, good management decisions and, and consistency with, uh, with other RFMOs. Um, I think this is the next slide. So in terms of uh, uh, future PFMC considerations, I think with respect to, I mean, the, uh, uh, an obvious question for the uh, for the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, well, it would be like, what, what's in it for us? There's no, there's no U.S. fishing activity. Why should we really uh, be concerned? And I think that's a, you know, a decent question to ask. I'd say a couple of things that, uh, that the council might want to think about is that, um, I, you know, as we mentioned, the six of those eight species that are, are pretty significant uh, as pelagic species in an ecosystem that um, shares resources with, um, you know, other species and uh, that are important to the council in terms of fisheries, whether that be um, whether that be salmon in the in the North Pacific or even some of the um, tuna populations. So the, you know, the status of those stocks at the North 
Pacific Fisheries Commission is responsible for, you know, have some uh, ecosystem consequences that the Pacific Council should have some and probably should have some interest in. Um, I mentioned um, the need for consistency, I think, across the different RFMOs and the, the importance to that um, from the U.S. Um, for the other um, with the other RFMOs. And I, I wouldn't want to single out any other countries, but it's been challenging um, the uh, the dynamic between uh, China and Taiwan in the in this RFMO process um, is um, seems to have had some impacts on um, at least I don't know that not um, singularly, but it has had some impacts on what the countries are willing to agree to with respect to things that they've agreed to, have agreed to in other RFMOs. So I think the the U.S. you know certainly has a role to play in in that regard. Um, in terms of value-added contribution from the uh, from the Pacific Fishery Management Council, I'd say that the you know the current um, the current focus on some of the foundational monitoring, control, and surveillance things that I've talked about um, they're they're well they're well covered in the commission process. Um, I would say from the involvement of NOAA um, enforcement um, folks from the. Uh, from the uh, North Pacific in terms of really working on those issues where I'd say that priorities that um, aren't being addressed very well are science-based uh, species ma management ecosystem needs. And I think those things are, um, those areas are certainly things that um, uh, to the extent that the uh, Pacific Council is involved, um, have some opportunity to, to contribute some uh, some good thinking in that area. Uh, there's certain, certainly some potential trade-offs. The question of uh, does current uh, PFMC or future PFMC engagement create some lost opportunities um, in terms of things that are, you know, of uh, more direct importance to the council, certainly uh, worth um, asking and answering. Um, I suppose that there could be some future interest um, uh, uh, from the U.S. potentially in uh, sable fishing in the commission area, sable fish fishing in the community in the convention area. But um, to the extent some of that fishing is 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 pretty far offshore. I mean, those seamounts that the Canadians have um, some very limited um, uh, fishing activity on uh, are like 180 to 300 miles off the Pacific coast from about 46 degrees um, up to almost 49 degrees. Um, so that's a pretty, you know, it's, it, um, it's a, it's a pretty big investment in terms of fuel. And I don't know that, 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 that that's likely to be an, um, you know, to be a, a thing of uh, interest to the council in the, in the future, but there may be, uh, there could be, um, you know, interest from other countries in fishing uh, in uh, on sable fish that could be of, of uh, you know interest to the council in terms of impact on on its fisheries and its management plans. So I think that's it, Sandra. The, probably the last slide is just a thank you. So, all right, thank you very much, Rich. Let's see if there are any questions um, from around the table. Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for the report. It was interesting to hear um, how different R RFMOs operate, um, particularly one that has different species other than tuna, which has been the focus of IATTC and WCPFC. Um, in terms of the observer coverage and EM reporting, which you have said is pretty far behind, um, just can you provide any insight of the approach that they're currently thinking about taking? Is that in alignment with other RFMOs or um, are they, I guess, what kind of approach are they taking to address those challenges? Well, I, I think it's uh, it's probably a little hard to say. So I haven't got to the point where they even have talked about what level of co coverage might um, be adequate. I think the focus on uh, getting basic uh, MCS uh, measures in place and dealing with the need for stock assessments for uh, things like Pacific Sari and uh, Chub mackerel. Um, uh, there's just there's just hasn't been that much capacity. So there's been some work in the background in terms of just thinking about what the you know the logistics of uh, a what the features of a requirements for um, 
uh, for on water monitoring might be with respect to observers. Um, and I think um, while there's been some interest in uh, EM, because there really hasn't been any, even any um, observers on the water, the, the whole question of, you know, just thinking about what it would take to um, uh, operationalize, uh, you know, the, per, the, you know, the features of those monitor, monitoring activities, I think it has been a bit of a sea anchor on, on moving some of those topics forward and thinking about with respect to electronic monitoring, um, just the questions about what does that mean for, you know, data transmission and things when boats are, you know, at sea for two or three months and, you know, a long ways away and expensive transmission. So, um, there seemed there, there's just a, a lot of what I'd call, uh, uh, kind of mental kind of sea drag in terms of things moving forward. Yeah. Hey, Rich, I've got a question for you. Um, can you describe your role as a commissioner and what the uh, U.S. delegation is like? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, so the role as commissioner, I, I, I'm not sure what some of the other RFMOs operate like, but, um, the delegation usually like at the last meeting, there probably were six people there from, uh, six to six people there from the U S delegation. Um, there's, uh, Noah takes a, a lead role in terms of, uh, kind of spokesperson, um, works with the delegation in terms of. Um, it'd be much like uh, the states here in terms of morning delegation meetings, in terms of what what the strategies look like for uh, different conservation management measures. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, my, for, so the role that I play, or the Pacific Council would play in that process, is a uh, is an advisory and policy development role in terms of strategy development that the um, U.S. takes, and in, in terms of its positions and um, influence strategies on the floor in terms of trying to move things along. I would say that um, there's been a shift in uh, the delegation from when I started back in 2018 and 19, when we actually had in-person meetings till now. And I, I think um, there had been, I'd, I'd say there had been a um, less interest from, uh, from the federal government in um, active participation by the council members from the three councils that are um, part of the commission process, Pacific, North Pacific, and the Western Central. Um, that's changed a little bit. I think there's, um, you know, quite a bit of opportunity for uh, council member commission uh, members to take active roles in the commission process if they chose and had the time um, and, and the interest. Thank you. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Rich. Um, but I just wanted to first say thank you for your willingness to represent the Pacific Council in this on this commission. Um, I knew you'd do a great job, and you have. Um, I, I was wondering on the looking at Pacific Sari in particular, uh, looking at how the catches have declined in a pretty dramatic fashion of late. Um, the effort seems to be in that bottom graphic look look pretty somewhat stable and I'm, was kind of trying to reconcile the two about how catches tail off in that dramatic of way and yet the effort remains uh, somewhat static. Well, that frames the that frames the issue pretty well, Phil, in terms of the challenge that the commission's had and the um, inability that it's had to um, reach agreement on measures. The Japanese came into the, uh, into the session uh, basically um, uh, recommending that the TAC be reduced from 330,000 to 105,000 metric tons um, uh, and that the countries um, proportionally share that reduction. And I think the, I think the challenge in terms of, um, the countries, um, willingness to make an agreement, um, has to do with, um, it's, uh, potentially disproportionate impacts in terms of the, the way the harvest activities occur. 
Um, and so I, I think um, like most RFMO processes, um, since there's not a voting process typically like there is here at the council that if there's um, inability, inability to reach an agreement on really what should be done, uh, then there is some, something is done that is not, um, you know, in this case, certainly not uh, sufficient in terms of protecting the stocks. The, um, the Canadian and the U.S. delegations, um, uh, you know, have a, are, are kind of in a strange position, um, very vocally supporting uh, the need for those measures, yet being in a position where um, they can advocate things that have no, you know, no consequence directly on U.S. fishermen. So it, um, uh, the influence that the U.S. and the Canadians, Canadians have on the, actually the final agreement is a, a see that um, without something like national standards in place that really align the countries in terms of their The recording has stopped. Presentation. Um, can you explain how the U.S. contributes to the science that goes into this? I mean, I know there's no stock assessments, but how, how does the U.S. play that role? Uh, the U.S. Um, uh, usually one of the science centers assigns a person to work on the in the commission process. It's been as, as many as two people in the past. Right now, that person is um, comes out of the Western Central Pacific office. Before that, it was a uh, a person in the uh, in the Alaska Science Center, um, and so uh, I would say that it's. Uh, it feels like it's a kind of a lower priority. Um, I mean, just as maybe the council would think about here in terms of things of immediate management interest and where fishing activities or, or interests occur, um, it's staff, but it, um, these people obviously have, you know, things that they're working on. So um, I think that the... Uh, this meeting is being recorded. I think probably uh, it's hard for me to tell in terms of what the discussions look like in the science committee, what those discussions have looked like. Um, I think the fact that the science committee discussions occur and kind of get completed outside of the commission process, there's not much um, there's not much opportunity for query from policy folks of the science process to really um, that I think would be helpful in, in um, raising some of those questions. That um, if the science committee doesn't raise um, a question about um, uncertainties and what that might uh, what that might suggest, and there's no chance for the policy folks to um, query them. I think it, it um, you know, creates some impediments for, for good dialogue to try to really move things forward. So further questions for Rich, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Rich. Good to see you here. Thank you for the great report. I just had one question. What kind of workload does this represent to you on an annual basis to, to do this? Is it a full-time job pretty much, or just kind of get a sense of that. Uh, there's probably, so there's, there's two things that happen. There are U S delegation calls that occur throughout the year. And then the, the annual, uh, uh, commission and technical compliance committee meeting itself, which I said, which, as I mentioned, are, are linked together and, uh, it would be hard for somebody to, uh, intelligently engage in the commission uh, just the commission session itself, which occurs over three or four days without having uh, been involved in the discussions at the technical compliance committee. So anyway, uh, in terms of the uh, delegation calls, I'm, I mean, that's probably, that might, it's, it's fairly, you know, fairly 
a modest amount of time might be, uh, you know, you know, three or four days a year. And then the commission process itself, um, the last, uh, this past meeting two weeks ago was, you know, eight days plus, you know, plus travel time. So maybe 10 days. So maybe, a, you know, a total of, um, you know, two weeks over the year, something like that. Um, it could, I mean, it could use some more. Heather's question about what about science? Um, there was, um, I had an opportunity to, uh, you know, directly get engaged in some of the science work groups to talk about some of these issues. But, you know, honestly, um, it's, it's a time constraint. So, I mean, if somebody had some time to volunteer and invest in that, I mean, uh, um, the, the state department pays travel for a council member to attend the annual sessions, but, uh, for somebody to really get engaged in the science committee meetings that occur in the fall, uh, there's no, there's no travel support for that. And probably the council thinking about investing time for somebody to, to do that, um, probably, you know, makes it unreasonable. Um, uh, Personally, I would have, you know, been happy to do that um, had I had the time and the, the ability to do that. But it, it's challenging, you know. It's you know, if somebody if somebody has a day job, it's, you know, it, it, it's a, a bit of a stretch. But it could use it. It could use some help. The science and management, science-based management stuff could really could really use some injection from somewhere. I don't know whether it would come from the council process or elsewhere, but I think it's something that, you know. Um, the, the U.S. could contribute to it if it had capacity. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Rich. That was great. I the other the other sense I'd like to get is it you know you know you know full well that you're when you were on the council, your job at meetings was took some time and your prep took some time and all of that. But there was a lot of in between stuff you do. I'm just trying to get a sense of how work intensive this is. Should you engage fully, like you described, just to get a sense? Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think uh, I would, if if I had felt like I was really diving into some of these issues we talked about, stock management. Um, I think if you doubled that time that I was talking about, you know, it was a, you know a month out of the year instead of two weeks. You, I think a person could have some significant impact and influence on the process. The other the, the other thing that I would say though. Um, is the reality is, and I think maybe you'll remember, you know, some of some of Dorothy's work on the Northern Committee. Um, it's not only getting engaged in the process, but it's something about um, developing some relationships with people from other countries. Um, and that's, you know, a little bit uh, different story. You, you need to get engaged and you need to interact with people. Um, but I think um, that requires some some face to face time and um you know, it, I, I guess it, it can be helped a little bit if there are some other things that a person's doing that they happen to interact with some of those, you know, people on, on other issues, which, you know, um, I've probably have some advantage on in that we, you know, in my, in my day we work, I, you know, work on some Asian issues, but, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of the 10, it's the 2080 or 1090 rule, you know, what's, what level can you put into it to have maximum impact? So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions? Thank you very much, Rich. Thanks. Appreciate it. That uh, concludes uh, the only report we have. Uh, we do not have any public comment the last time I checked. And I'll double check, but I think that's still true. So that takes us to our council discussion here. Um, I think it was a very helpful report, and we understand that um, maybe looking for someone to step in the shoes that Rich has so ably filled for these years. So uh, not a discussion we need to have now, not a decision that's going to be made now, but uh, just something for us to think about. So discussion. And if there, Phil Anderson. Well, I don't know what the appropriate time is for that discussion, but my understanding was that uh, Mr. Lincoln uh, would be willing to continue his work there um, if we um, re requested that of him. Maybe I 
maybe he's changed his mind since the last time I've talked to him, but I think his, what he brings to this um, position um, is pretty unique and his uh, experience in the international uh, foray and f in the fishery issues and, um, you know, since he left his 30 some year career at WDFW, he has um, worked in the international community relative to fisheries issues. And um, frankly, if uh, he was willing to con continue to do that, I'd be, be trying to twist his arm a little bit uh, to continue. But um, so I. I don't know when the right time is to talk about that, or you may have had some discussions with him that uh, revealed some different perspectives. And I actually haven't had any discussions with Rich. That's word I received um, from a third party. So maybe I, we can ask Rich if this are are you if he's prepared to continue in this role, or whether he would prefer to transition out at some point. Um, that would be very helpful for the council to know that. Well, I, I have two answers for that. I'm more than willing to, to contribute if there is a council desire, but um, I also um, recognize that there may be council members that would have an interest in uh, doing this. So I certainly wouldn't uh, presume or want to stand in the, in the way of that if the council cho so chose, so chose. All right, that's very helpful. That's and that's a little bit different than I had been told. So, um, I think you've done an excellent job, and um, I, I also note that uh, looking at the 2024 meeting that overlaps with the council meeting, I think it'd be very, especially difficult for a council member to wear both hats at times. So. Um, what is the sense of the council here? Uh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, <laughs> if Rich is, well, I'm, I'm supportive of him staying on. I am, I will, you know, the, to me, the, from what I witnessed with Dorothy and have many conversations and my experience on the limited, however, is the Whiting AP, when we negotiate with folks in other countries, those relationships are huge. And I'm sure Rich has, has many of those relationships over time as he's been doing this. So uh, changing horses in the middle of the stream could be pretty detrimental to us, I think. And if he's willing to stay, I think that's a good thing. I also think that uh, if there's a, you know, there will be a transition at some point in the future, always is, right? We, we're not getting any younger. I think there needs to be some overlap. So whoever takes those reins in the future would uh, would have the benefit of me having some of those relationships ingrained. So I think it's, uh, I like the approach of keeping him on and doing this because of all that. And like you mentioned, the overlaps, but I also think we need to prepare for the future as well. So um, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Well, we have one appointment. So um, I think that um, it may be appropriate to discuss that transition when Rich lets us know unequivocally. Um, Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I wanna support Rich in terms of the commitment. I don't talk a lot about it for WCPFC, but in terms of attending scientific committee and some of the other work groups, you really do need to participate um, to be fully engaged when you go to the annual meeting. So I, I think you're three weeks to a month. I mean, that is legit. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, also think um, what Mr. Dooley had to say was important in terms of changing horses midstream. I am extremely thankful for the council to have given me a year, almost two years with Dorothy Lohman in terms of making that transition. <laughs> and that is something that I would fully endorse and encourage um, when the time does come to to put somebody different in either of those commissions or IATTC for that matter. Thanks for that. Look around the table and see if that captures the sense of the council here. Any further comments? 
Bill Anderson. So just for clarity, we would um, ask of Mr. Lincoln to continue on representing the Pacific Council on, in this forum and to when he's, when he's uh, ready to uh, 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 stop uh, representing us in that forum, he'd give us some uh, lead time so that we can prepare uh, someone to step into that seat. Is that where we ended up? That's that's my sense of where we ended up. Great, thanks. All right, thanks, Rich. Thank you, Council. Kit Dahl, how are we doing here? Well, uh, seems like you've had a very productive discussion. Uh, Mr. Lincoln, I think, gave you a very good perspective on uh, the role and activities of the commission. You have a greater understanding of of that body and its relevance to council interests. And then you also had this discussion around uh, his continued role here and um, and your perspectives on that, that he you fully support him continuing if he's willing to continue serving. And also when the time comes uh, to work out a, a transition process so there can be some overlap of uh, whoever is chosen to succeed uh, Rich and that he can help that person uh, get up to speed on the process. So I think you've covered that and uh, perhaps we'll look forward to hearing from Rich again in coming years, reporting back to the uh, council on, on the activities of, of this commission. All right, well, thank you. And thanks again, Rich. Um, and that will conclude this agenda item F3. We're going to transition now to Salmon E4 methodology review. I don't know if there's a change. Uh, there will be a change of a few seats here, so we'll just pause for a moment. We'll not take a break at this point. Marcy Aramco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we close out F3, I just would like to take the opportunity to thank council staff for scheduling this discussion as an administrative item rather than within a specific FMP. That was very helpful. Thank you. Okay, Robin, uh, anytime you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, members of the council. This is agenda item E for the methodology review preliminary topic selection. So this uh, agenda item is the first of a three part series where over the course of the year, the SSC, the STT and the MU look at potential topics that uh, that would need review. Um, we start this process in April. Um, let the council take a look at the potential topics, see what kind of work we can get done on those uh, during the summer, and we come back in September and let the council know um, if any work was done and if uh, the topics that were moved forward are going to be ready for review in October. And then in October, we have a joint meeting with the STT and the SSC and, and usually the MU as well. And then we all come back in November and give you the results of these uh, reviews. And the whole intention is to make sure that any information that we have is um, up to date and that it would be ready for um, uh, implementing uh, coming the next salmon season. Um, so under this agenda item, for your reference materials, we have uh, three advisory body reports uh, from the MU, the STT, and the SSC. Um, your action under this agenda item is to review these topics and um, request that uh, the agencies that 
are also going to be involved that may be outside of the council arena um, also um, provide uh, staffing and that the materials that are needed for the SSC to do the review in October are are there uh, well within the time frame, the two week time frame of that October meeting. Um, and so with that, I think that wraps up my summary. Thank you. All right, thank you, Robin. Any questions of Robin? All right, not seeing any hands, we'll get started here. We'll start with the SSC report. Jason Schaffler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Dr. Jason Schaffler from the SSC, and I am here to read agenda item E4A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, April 2023, Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Methodology Review Preliminary Topic Selection. The Scientific and Statistical Committee met with members of the SAMAN Technical Team and Model Evaluation Work Group to discuss potential topics to be reviewed by the SSC SAMAN Subcommittee in fall 2023. The SSC discussed potential topics for SAMAN Subcommittee review with responsible entities in brackets. The first topic, reevaluate use of survival covariates in the Sacramento River Winter Chinook forecasting approach, given new data now available covering a wider range of environmental conditions and this would be conducted by the STT. The second, review methods used to model south of falcon fisheries and Chinook fishery regulation assessment model. This will be conducted by the MU. The third, evaluate new methods to forecast the Oregon Production Index for COHO. This will be conducted by the Oregon Production Index technical team. The fourth, revisit the Sacramento River Falls Chinook abundance forecasting approach, and this would also be conducted by the STT. The MU discussed their efforts to continue documenting how the FRAM Chinook base period calibration was done. The SSC notes that documenting models used in public resource management is necessary and should follow best practices and be repeatable by other users. The SSC further notes it is important to quantify the uncertainties in the FRAM output. The SSC reiterates its suggestion to establish a formal process that outlines how and when salmon reference points and conservation objectives are reviewed and updated. Conservation objectives and reference points for Sacramento River Fall Chinook and multiple Washington Coastal Fall Chinook were derived from publications produced in 1984 and do not incorporate any information on run sizes, productivity, or other available biological parameters from the last 40 years. The SSC notes that the values for reference points are routinely updated as part of the coastal pelagic species and groundfish stock assessment processes and populations with, the, with assessments that do not incorporate recent data are judged to have increased uncertainty. And that concludes my statement. Great. Right, thank you, Jason. Are there any questions of the SSC? Thank you. Oh, wait, there's Marcy. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the report um, and for identifying the responsible entities. Um, these, the, the four items on the list, um, would be reviewed in the methods review activities that would occur this fall. Um, is it your expectation, at least with regard to items one and four, that those items would be completed during the methods review process? Uh, did you discuss the capacity to, to complete these tasks uh, within the scheduled uh, methods review process? We didn't discuss that in great detail, but the STT will be given a report, and I believe they'll be able to speak to that with more certainty. Thank you very much. Did, 
that that makes a lot of sense. I guess I'm curious if you, um, by placing these items on the list, then deem them to be a priority for the SCT's work. We are right. We believe these are all valuable topics to be discussed and reviewed over the summer. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Further questions of the SSC? All right, thank you very much, Jason. Oh, oh. I'm sorry, Susan Bishop. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just following up on Mr. Remco's last question. So do these reflect a priority in terms of the SSC's view, in terms of which tasks would be more important than others, or all of them have equal importance uh, over the next year? We did not discuss a priority other than to say each of these topics would be a valuable contribution. So there, there, there's not one that's more important than the other, in our opinion, yet. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have a report now from the MU, Angelica hagen -Bro. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the council. My name is Angelika hagen bro and I'm the chair of the Model Evaluation Workgroup, or MU. And I'm speaking to agenda item E4A, the supplemental MU report. The MU met on Saturday uh, to discuss potential methodology review items. Following our discussions, we also met with other advisory bodies like uh, SDT and we listened in on SSC discussions about methodology review and based on these discussions we identified two potential topics as candidates for review and uh, the first topic is one that's probably familiar to most of you it's documentation that's a, a big topic that the uh, MU usually tackles and it's FRAM, the fishery regulation assessment model documentation that's the model we use for Chinook and Coho impact assessment. And there has been a lot of progress made in uh, recent years to document uh, how to use FRAM and the algorithms, but the piece, piece that's missing for Chinook FRAM in particular is documenting the base period, how all the fun foundational data was developed, how it was, um, manipulated, what are all the exceptions? So there's a lot of pieces that are really important if you wanna be able to reproduce uh, the existing frame base period. So that piece is missing and we want to tackle that um, over the spring and summer to add that documentation to the existing web-based documentation. The second uh, topic is uh, review and consider improvements to methods used to model south of falcon fisheries in Chinook Fram. And um, that concludes my statement. All right, thank you very much. Are there questions of the MU? Thank you very much. We have one more report, and that is from the Salmon Technical Team, Dr. Michael O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will be referring to agenda item E4A, supplemental STT report one on the Salmon methodology review. Salmon technical team met with the uh, scientific and statistical committee and the uh, model evaluation work group to discuss potential topics for methodology review in 2023. Following these discussions, the STT identified four topics as candidates by review for review by the S STT and Salmon subcommittee of the SSC uh, with lead entities per, uh, in parentheses and potential contributing entities in brackets. <laughs> The first one is to consider technical modifications to the Sacramento River 
uh, winter Chinook abundance forecast by examining whether an egg to fry covariate can improve forecast performance. Lead entity would be National Marine Fisheries Service and secondarily STT. Number two, review and consider improvements to methods used to model South of Falcon fisheries and Chinook fram. Lead entity would be the MU and then uh, followed up by the STT. Number three, explore alternative forecast approaches for the Oregon Production Index Hatchery Coho forecast. Lead entity being the Oregon Production Index Technical Team um, and STT. And finally, number four, explore alternative forecast approaches for the Sacramento Index, the lead entity being Salmon Technical Team and the National Marine Fisheries Service. All right, thank you, Michael. Questions of the STT? Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a similar question um, that I posed to the SSC, which is whether these uh, the list of these four items implies any any type of prioritization from um, the STT's view. Uh, um, Ms. Bishop, there's uh, we we did not prioritize uh, this list of four potential topics. Further questions, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess following up. Uh, a bit on the Sacramento items, uh, one and four on the list. Um, these are two topics that um, are new. Uh, we have not in the council arena heard about work on winter run, at least recently, um, being needed. And then uh, alternative forecast approaches for the SI. Um, likewise, haven't, I think, heard that recommendation um, in general discussions of of late um i guess it's very it's, maybe you can help me here it's it's just very difficult i think for the council to consider these recommendations um in isolation recognizing the other uh, agenda items yet to come this meeting um, and beyond and how um, we might prioritize work on these items. Um, you've identified here that NIMS and the STT um, would be taking the lead on these uh, Sacramento items that are on the list, but then, you know, there's some pretty hefty expectations that uh, NIMS and the STT would be heavily engaged in work on um, conservation objectives. Um, so I, I'm just struggling, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say with, you know, this list coming forward in methods review and what we do with these recommendations uh, here this meeting in terms of um, giving our blessing to um, this preliminary list. Um, so maybe you can elaborate a little bit to, to help us out here. And then, you know, in particular on items one and four, I'm interested in knowing the workload that you anticipate here? I mean, are these activities that will keep you busy all summer long or are these activities that you think you can reasonably conquer in, you know, a couple days to a week or two? It's, it's just very tough to, to consider, um, you know, what feedback to provide you. And I guess, um, I'd also be interested in knowing if you believe you can complete these tasks as well as all the others on the list, um, in the scope of the methods review um, item this fall? In other words, items one and four, if they're to be added to the list, are they uh, things we can, you know, are these low-hanging fruit items that would be completed in the methods review process this fall? Um, or do you expect there to be ongoing work as a result of initial reviews in the methods review process this fall? I know that's a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uramko. I can try to answer that. Um, uh, well, I guess these topics are put here because of they've come through of owing to some discussions we've had with the ST, uh, SSC in the past, and also just some internal discussions with the, with the STT and just general observations in this year where Sacramento River Fall Chinook is uh, doing poorly and, you know, partly having to, uh, you know, close fisheries in South of Falcon as a result of the status of the stock. And, and not only because of its status, but because there's been a number of 
uh, discussions about you know the role of various forecasts in that status and uh, uh, to the, that led to this status. So um, we think this these are priorities for us, um, and we don't know what the our you know the landscape of our workload is going to look like. We have ideas because there's been a lot of things discussed here at this meeting and in uh, in March as well. Uh, but we may know more um, after the next uh, agenda item is finished. That said, um, we view the methodology review as a place to uh, put our aspirations in at the April meeting uh, with the hopes that we can complete them in time for an October methodology review. We report back to the council in September on our progress on these on these topics. Um, and uh, in many cases in the past, at least in my experience, we've um, we've come to September and not been able to produce documentation for or uh, uh, re reports on changes that uh, we or on a methodology review topics that we adopted or we looked into in April. So I guess I could say is our these are things that the STT wants to do, um, and the best we can say is that we would be able to give a more definitive um, sense of whether we're able to complete them when we see uh, the council in September. Um, uh, you asked about how long these um, investigations for the two Sacramento focused topics might take. Um, for the first one, the Sacramento winter Chinook uh, forecast one, I don't think that will be a huge heavy lift of several months. I think that um, that work has been done in the past uh, when um, we were uh, doing the Sacramento Winter Chinook work group process several years ago. We looked into this uh, and it, um, the modification we're considering here uh, did not necessarily at that time produce an incre uh, increased forecast performance, but we only had four years of data to evaluate that and now we have more data. And uh, but, so there is some groundwork already laid for that project. Um, for the Sacramento uh, index forecast. Um, we've also considered changes in Sacramento index forecast going back to, you know, 2014 or something like that. Um, and there have been changes in the past. And so uh, we have some ideas of potential things to look into, but that's really the stage we're at now. So it's the scope of the, that work is not exactly clear at this moment. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Th thank you, Michael. That's helpful. Um, one related question for you. Um, I note that, and, and I hear you about aspirations and the picture will become more clear um, as time passes here. Um, we're also aware through the NIMS reports that we've received the past a uh, few cycles um, of ongoing work on Central Valley Spring Run Chinook that, um, you know, it is a listed species. Um, is there additional work that will be, this is more of a, a NIMF Science Center question, is there additional work that's not reflected on this list that will be ongoing on Spring Chinook that might um, compete for time when it comes to workload over summer, uh, you know, compete for time with these items you've listed here with regard to Sacramento species. Mr. Ropico, I, I can say that um, the STT did not discuss that when we were talking about methodology review. Um, I mean, we're clearly aware of the work that's gone on with Spring Run and, um, and that, that's been pre presented to the council but that wasn't part of our discussion here for methodology review. And I can't really characterize what further work is going on um, outside of this process with, with Spring Run. I'm probably not the best person to do that right now. Thank you. Kyle Addicts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. O'Farrell, task three on the list, the <clears throat> explorer alternative forecast approaches for the Oregon production index hatchery coho forecast. My recollection is that forecast was a topic on methodology review back in April of 2021. 
my recollection is the work that came out of that was more a review of the existing forecast method. It seems like this is a more targeted to actually go explore alternate forecast to the existing method. Is, is that your recollection? And do you know if there's been any, any work towards that end um, since we last, last talked about this back in 2021? Thank you, uh, Mr. Addix, uh, for the question. Um, your characterization is correct about the review of existing methods uh, back in 2021. Um, and this uh, reflects, the, the, it came up in STT discussions that there may be some desire to look into alternative um, OPIT forecasts. And um, it's our, our understanding that there is some intention by OPIT to engage in um, looking into that. And so we, as far as the methodology review is concerned, we thought we would just mention that and leave it open in case there is a potential change to methodology that uh, we would want to have come through that process. <clears throat> Further questions of the STT? John North. Thank you, Chair. If, if I might, more of comments, I guess, but um, especially on the, on the OPIH uh, task that's being discussed. Uh, you know, having been a fishery manager in the Columbia River for quite a while, um, I was on the receiving end of the OPIH forecast, and, and I have to admit I had some questions myself about the accuracy, uh, especially in recent years. But, however, you know, reviewing the report that Dr. O'Farrell and Eric Suring of ODFW completed, you know, just a couple of years ago, I think I think you did a good job of pointing out that the current methodology is is working fairly well. It's tracking, um, it's got good fit, doesn't appear to be biased, and overall, it's you know working pretty well compared to other forecasts we use on the coast. So maybe the only issue here, I think, is whether the accuracy can be improved. Um, which I admit would be nice, but forecasting isn't easy. And just because we want it to be better doesn't mean we can make it better. Um, but I think, you know, it's worth evaluating some tweaks in the current methodology, maybe splitting out the forecast for early and late stock. Look at that. Maybe look at some, including some environmental variables or, or maybe look at data, the time series for the data. But, um, I guess what I wanted to say was, you know, staff staff only has so much time to work on this stuff. So, you know, if there is on that issue, if there is um, time availability, I'd support additional work, but I don't think it has to be exhaustive. You know, um, I think I think you can look into some things and see if there's any small improvements. But that's all I have. All right. Thank you. Any further questions of the STT? Thank you, Michael. Concludes reports. Last I looked, we did not have any public comment. So that will take us to our council discussion and uh, action. We do have action here. It's on the screen there. So I will look to our council members to get started with some discussion. There's already had some discussion sort of implicit in the questions. But let's let's get started. <coughs> Kyle, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll speak first to the the mu um, topics that Angelica brought to us. The FRAM documentation has been an item that's been on the. Um, Method methodology review task list for a long time. We've debated in some years whether it's appropriate to have it there. I've supported having, having it there and getting that documentation moved along as much as we can every year. So um, support um, the MU doing that work over the spring and summer. Um, our modelers tend to uh, over um, promise their time, but Ms. Hagen Groves assured me that th that's going to be one of her focuses this spring and summer, and she's going to get that as far along as she can um, comes by September. Also support, it was on both the MU and the STT list, the review and consider improvements to uh, uh, two methods used to model south of Falcon Fisheries and Chinook FRAM. There have been a few issues that have bubbled up since we did our FRAM period, um, FRAM based period update a few years ago and continue to support um, making sure our models for 
for fram fisheries and other fishery models that we use in our planning processes are are talking the right way and giving us results that make sense. Um, the other topic is that the OPI forecast um, more than a review, try to find alternative methods. I'm not an expert on that forecast, but I um, and don't want to overcommit anyone's time, but certainly um, support doing anything we can to improve that forecast method, whether it's within the framework of the existing model and figuring out how to improve it or um, looking at other methods and seeing if there's something better out there. Not, not sure who all would be involved in that and how we make sure that task gets, gets done, but I support it. Thank you, Kyle. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you're right. There was some implicit uh, <laughs> recommendations kind of in some of the dialogue exchange we had um, earlier with the uh, STT and SSC. Um, I'm, I guess, uh, you know, uh, I have difficulty um, prioritizing the items that are brought to us under this agenda item uh, in light of other um, methods reviews that we have um, scheduled in future agenda items this meeting. So um, with that, I mean, I support the fact that there are new items on this list. I think um, the reasoning for um, adding them to a methodology um, review list is appropriate. Um, we have new information on winter run, new years of data that um, it would be good to incorporate. And that was always uh, the vision, I think, of the work group and, and the group developing um, that assessment um, that we would review it periodically. So I can't, uh, can't discount that. I think it's appropriate to be on the list. Um, where it fits on the matter of priorities, I'm unclear. Um, and how much additional work and effort this particular item on winter run will take relative to others, still unclear. Um, looking to item four and the SAC forecasting uh, approach um, for abundance, I, I don't, I don't really have a good feel for how big an item this might be or the scope. Um, it, the label is fairly generic, just review the abundance forecasting approach. Um, okay, well, <laughs> what does a review lead to and how um, how big an item might this be? Um, again, just plants a note of caution in my mind uh, as we open up that, that topic in addition to others related to Sacramento fall. Um, so I guess I would say um, the other thing that came out in our delegation discussion about this um, preliminary uh, list. There are other things that are not on this list that I know other people are interested in adding to the list. So um, I'm feeling like we have one snapshot here um, of current priorities that um, the SSC and the STT have identified, but um, it's not lost on me that um, there are other things that might equally be ripe for addition to the list, but, you know, our, our challenge is going to be prioritizing and making meaningful progress on the most important priorities in the near term. So um, with that, I'm, you know, I appreciate the reports and I appreciate the uh, discussions that took place between the SSC and the SS STT. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this is just a point of clarification. Um, I think there was there was reference to the fact that we have a couple of other agenda items that the STT will be involved in, potentially heavy lifts of those as well. There may be some um, tendril connections between that work and some of the things on this list, at least with regard to the California tasks. Um, so my understanding is this is sort of a preliminary list of things that are identified and that the folks will come back to the council in September to adopt that list. So I'm curious what flexibility um, we have as we discuss the next two topics and as the, the teams do their work over the next several months and get a better sense of what the, the, the tasks might be and how they might be connected to come back in September and potentially revise the list as we know the information better. 
Mr. you are correct. This is a preliminary topic selection. And um, I want to see if Robin has any uh, can illuminate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as far as the topics on the list, correct, preliminary candidate topics, um, usually what happens is uh, the STT and the SSC, along with the MU, um, will come back in September and just let the council know what work has been done. Uh, the council can certainly um, prioritize topics for the STT um, you know, through workload planning or um, you know other avenues, but uh, for the most part, it's um, catch as catch can on you know where where the time is allowed, what work has already been done. So um, there is flexibility, but typically when um, we come back, when your um, teams come back in September, they'll let you know what they think is going to be ready for that October review. And I think if the council wanted to prioritize their work um, in light of what is already on the table, what may be added to the table, you know, what what warrants priority, prioritization in the council's view is certainly their uh, prerogative. So we have a preliminary list and we'll, we'll return to this in September, but in the meantime, some work is going to be going on. That's the intention, and, yes. Right, so to the extent, I guess, the council wants to prioritize the work between now and then, it could, because it, the plate is quite full with this and other agenda items. So, Joe Oatman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I did want to provide a comment on the uh, number three on the SGT report, the uh, Explore Alternative Forecast Approaches for uh, OPI. Uh, as um, Kyle mentioned uh, a moment ago, um, when this was considered in the April 2021 meeting, um, the Western Washington uh, Treaty Tribes provided a supplemental travel report that laid out um, uh, one of their concerns um, with the forecast and the interest of uh, trying to um, do some work on that. Um, that some of those same concerns that they uh, expressed then, I think are still relevant uh, today. I understand that um, some of the members from the uh, Quinault Treaty area uh, had wanted to uh, be here to provide uh, comment um, on that, uh, but they're uh, tied up in um, meetings uh, at the moment. And so I just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to um, reiterate some of the concerns that they uh, expressed back in uh, April 2021. Uh, one of the concerns is that um, the um, uh, over forecast uh, that, that uh, was um, observed um, in those recent years prior to 2021 uh, was concerning. Um, given that, um, you know, it does have a impact on, you know, ocean fishing opportunity, um, potential concerns on, um, you know, certain key stocks, um, as well as uh, kind of generally the pre-season modeling process. So I think those concerns um, are ones that they still hold. Um, and I think there's interest in, um, in doing, uh, you know, uh, what's being considered under um, the item three here in the SCT report. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Well, we do need a motion here. I don't want to cut off discussion. Or do people want to break before a motion? Oh, Kyle Addix. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't believe we've done a motion on this in, in recent years. Um, we certainly could put one together. I think we've just kind of given guidance um, from the council at this stage in the process, but uh, others may recall differently. Okay, well then at least I'll look for a nod of heads. We have uh, a report from the SEC with four topics um, and we've had some discussion. So I, I let's, let's I'd, I'd like a little more precise guidance because we've had some, there's been some consternation but I've, I, I don't know that I've heard specific guidance. Marcy Remco. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would support Kyle's recommendation that we don't need an explicit motion. Um, while there is some consternation um, expressed largely by me on um, uh, a number of these items, I'm comfortable with the approach that we heard um, based on uh, Robin's recap of the process from here, um, that there is expectation that work on these topics will go on in the summer um, and we'll hear back in the fall how ready these topics may be. And at that time, um, we will um, finalize the list that will be conducted for review over uh, the October uh, series of meetings. Um, so I'm comfortable with the initial list. Um, I would note that it's not um, exhaustive, and I expect that there will be work on um, other topics that we'll be hearing about and other agenda items that also may um, progress uh, over summer. So um, I see this list as being fine, but it's certainly not exhaustive and complete. Um, so I I guess that's all I have to say about it. Um, I think they're put on the methods review list kind of with this idea that they'd be uh, – ripe for review in October with what we know right now. And, you know, um, I'm comfortable with that. All right. And I'll look around the table to make sure others are comfortable and that there's no further direction to be provided at this time. Okay, Robin, how are we doing? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you've done your work. I appreciate the conversation. It's my understanding that we'll take the four topics from the STT report. That's the one I have in front of me. They're the same, I believe, between STT and SSC reports. So we'll take the four items listed there, plus we'll add the MU uh, recommendation to do further documentation on, on the FRAM. And so with that um, instruction, um, I think you've done your work under this agenda item. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, we'll take our morning break here. We'll be back at 945 and we'll continue with another salmon agenda item. The recording has stopped.
This meeting is being recorded.
Are there any questions on that overview and the work before you on this agenda item? And I don't see any questions. So again, thank you, Robin. And then we will move directly to our reports. We have the California Fish and Game Commission report, and I will turn to Marcy Remco for that. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I would preface uh, reading the report by um, acknowledging that the content of this report does span more than just agenda item E5. There are remarks that are appropriate for our annual management measures, uh, ongoing agenda topics for this week, but uh, the decision was made to submit the letter under this agenda item as that's the, the bulk of the content in the letter. So with that, I'll begin. Um, I'm Marcy Aramco. I'm representing the um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife here around the council table. Um, I've been asked to present this report on behalf of the California Fish and Game Commission, uh, which is its own um, agency independent of the department. Um, dear Chair Gorelnik and members of the council, I write you today on behalf of the California Fish and Game Commission and thank you for the opportunity to provide comment on the subject agenda item. Together with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the commission has been engaged in a wide portfolio of salmon issues, including species in the Sacramento and Klamath River basins about which we write today. The commission has cooperatively managed these iconic fish in the face of unprecedented complications. For decades, California salmon populations have undergone a series of challenges that have resulted in substantial declines from wildlife and chronic drought to pollutants, migration barriers, and now emergent thiamine deficiencies. Salmon management presents complex threats that require innovative management strategies. We offer some suggestions for the council to help address some of these many challenges. In season conservation measures. The commission urges the council to support the department's proposed pre-season and in-season measures for commercial and recreational salmon harvesters. As you know, the spawning success of declining in-river populations is intimately linked with ocean conditions and harvests. Commercial ocean harvests have consistently exceeded projections, complicating management efforts and limiting escapement numbers. The department's proposal to limit commercial and recreational harvest to the projections would be an important step in increasing the likelihood that escapement numbers reach levels that are sufficient to ensure adequate spawning. Sacramento River Assessments. The Commission encourages the Council to proceed with reviewing conservation objectives for Sacramento Fall Run Chinook Salmon. Candidly, the current conservation objectives do not adequately reflect today's ocean conditions. The Sacramento San Joaquin Delta System, nor the state of readily available habitat. A comprehensive evaluation, which includes an open, realistic assessment of escapement goals, will be critical to ensuring accurate and effective management decisions going forward, given today's real world conditions. Current escapement modeling and reporting, as well as using a single est index to estimate adult Sacramento fall run Chinook salmon abundance, fails to clearly identify and protect fish in individual basins within the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers watersheds that may be suffering from poor natural recruitment and low escapement, while other basins supported by hatcheries have stronger escapements. We encourage the council to evaluate if taking finer scale escapement targets would be beneficial for recruitment and escapement in the long term. Klamath River Basin Objectives. Removing four Klamath River dams is likely to further change the basin system over the long term. The effects of this change, possibly the largest river and restoration project in recent history, are as yet unknown. We suggest the council acknowledge that interim measures guided by current science and policy are needed to manage Klamath Fall Run Chinook in the face of this dramatic change until conditions settle and will require focused attention by a group of experts over the near term. Embarking on a reevaluation of the conservation objectives for the Klamath River Basin System once the effects of the dam removals come into sharper relief is realistically on an eight to 10 year timeframe. Modeling framework. 
The commission understands there has been considerable discussion regarding the models used to predict Sacramento River escapements and commercial and recreational fishery harvests and impacts. Certainly, the current models have variability in results, sometimes widely off the mark and at other times relatively close to the observed escapement and predicted ocean harvest. We encourage ongoing scrutiny of the models to best reflect how real world biological and environmental factors shape ocean fisheries and escapement numbers. Conclusion, the council's recommendations form the foundation upon which the commission's regulatory decisions are built. The commission looks forward to working with the council on the difficulties facing California's salmon populations and stands ready to engage with the council in whatever way would be most productive to promote the interests of salmon conservation. If you have any questions, contact us at the email or phone number below. Sincerely, Eric Sklar, President. Thank you, Marcy. Are there any questions for Marcy on the letter from the California Fish and Game Commission? And I see no hand, so and thank you. We will next move on, as soon as I get my list up here, to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife report. And Brett Cormos is here in person to give that. Good morning, Brett, and welcome to the table. I'll give you a minute to get back there. And make sure to push the button to turn the mic on there. Thank you. And uh, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. Uh, my name is Brett Cormos. I am an environmental program manager from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Northern Region. Uh, and uh, I'll be reading from agenda item E5A, supplemental CDFW report entitled Klamath Dam Removal Related Adjustments to Management Targets. Um, before I get started, uh, I'd also just like to offer uh, that if it pleases the council, I have some additional comments that <clears throat> I think might be helpful um, for your deliberations uh, in terms of providing context that, you know, I can add after I'm through reading this, this report that uh, you'll find in your briefing book. Okay. As the Klamath Dam Removal Project nears the reservoir drawdown and dam removal phase, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife notes the need to begin planning for active management of Klamath River Fall Chinook in terms that may go beyond those prescribed in the Pacific Coast Salmon Fishery Management Plan and the associated harvest control rule. The current expectation for volitional passage of anadromous salmonids is during the fall of 2024. Post dam removal, over 400 miles of new habitat will be available to anadromous salmonids, roughly doubling what is currently available with dams in place. Further, the states of Oregon and California are currently developing regulations to protect anadromous salmonids as they escape to and utilize this new habitat, such that repopulation and recovery is effectively and expeditiously achieved. At present time, the escapement objective or SMSY for Klamath River Fall Chinook of 40,700 natural area adults is based upon a stock recruitment analysis that is in part a function of habitat availability via the total number of successful spawners. With the expansion of habitat anticipated after dam removal, a new stock recruitment analysis will be needed. While there are other factors to consider, increasing the amount of habitat will necessitate a new analysis in the years to come. It is expected that at least eight to 10 years of data will be necessary before <clears throat> a new long-term escapement objective can be derived. However, <clears throat> there is arguably an immediate need to begin considering new management objectives that are in excess of FMP, harvest control rule prescribed targets in an effort to promote and enhance the repopulation and recovery of Chinook utilizing the new habitat. Coupled with the potential loss of productivity due to dam removal activities themselves in the near term, 
via sedimentation of gravel downstream, a more conservative approach to managing fisheries may be warranted. While annual fluctuations in stock abundance and limiting factors related to weak stock management in ocean fisheries will clearly play a role in determining annual escapement projections, explicit treatment of a Klamath River Fall Chinook escapement objective and harvest control rule parameters is warranted. CDFW recommends that the council consider formation of an ad hoc work group to inform the science and policy needs surrounding active management of Klamath River Fall Chinook populations after dams are removed. This work group may need to meet several times over the course of 2023 and early 2024 with the goal of providing management recommendations by March 2024 for implementation in fishery planning each year. The potential exists that those management actions may be a function of an adaptive management framework that can be implemented annually, or there may be a need to convene the work group in the winter or spring each year until a new SMSY can be established. <clears throat> Alternative pathways and or timelines that bring the necessary science and policy, council representatives from state and federal resource agencies, industry and tribes, and council support should be considered given the significant workload the council and its representatives are faced with at this time. However, the timeline attached to this dam removal project is inflexible and a successful restoration project is of great importance to many. This includes council planning to effectively repopulate the new habitat. Terms of reference and a clear timeline for this work group need to be developed with the help of council staff and pertinent management partners. So as I said, I, I think there are some additional factors that the council might want to consider that weren't explicitly named or, or laid out in the report that I just provided to you. Uh, and so I, I think I will uh, take a little bit more of your time and, and relate some of those things to you. Um, so, like I said, additional factors about why Klamath River Fall Chinook is particularly a high priority. Uh, the dam removal process itself was essentially initiated by a pretty historical and significant agreement called the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement. Uh, and Oregon, California, some of the tribes, PCFFA, federal government were all among the signatories for that agreement. Um, the Klamath Basin itself has a pretty important and significant pre-existing tribal and non-tribal allocation scheme for the harvestable surplus of that stock. Uh, there is, has been and will continue to be a, an extraordinary financial outlay for dam removal and the subsequent monitoring and management that will go along with that. Uh, there is historical significance for this project in terms of geographic scope and the number of, of dams being removed. Uh, there is a responsibility for the council and for National Marine Fisheries Service to address this issue under Magnuson-Stevens. Um, there's a fundamental shift in the management dynamics that make the FMP objectives essentially obsolete. Um, and maybe most importantly there is a collectively held desire for a successful restoration project that will result from the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement. Uh, the council venue itself probably provides the best and greatest certainty for a useful outcome uh, via establishing the necessary leadership, a schedule of meetings, clarity that an outcome will be reached, product deadlines, council staff support, uh, and a recommendation for the council to implement uh, in addition to uh, NIMFs and tribal engagement as opposed to some other type of forum that might happen outside of the council process. And it provides the appropriate space that, we, that we're going to need to get the agencies and tribes to work together to develop an interim measures. Um, I think what you're also going to hear today uh, and some of the other advisory body reports that is that significant data uh, already exist on the productivity of this stock. There is a, an existing stock recruitment analysis uh, and that some extrapolation of that existing data is likely possible. 
Um, there is existing literature or publications out there with various estimates of the spawner capacity of habitat above Iron Gate Dam. Um, and uh, the SSC report seems to, you're going to hear later, I've taken a look, seems to agree with, with that statement to some extent. Um, the SSC is right that uh, interim management objectives could be derived via methodology review and within that timeline. <clears throat> However, there are additional policy and legal, legal considerations that should be tackled simultaneously that those scientific uh, advisory body, bodies don't necessarily uh, have the acumen for. Um, the work group itself could uh, include representatives for the agencies uh, that are equipped to make policy decisions, um, staff with uh, science acumen. Uh, I, I definitely think that a uh, work group of this ilk would need to have National Marine Fisheries Service policy representation. We'll probably need federal counsel advice given the legal, legal ramifications of departing from the FMP. There'll need to be state policy representatives uh, and then scientific representation probably from the ST, STT, uh, SSC or others of, of uh, agency choosing. Um, and then we'll obviously need representation from the tribes and perhaps even industry. Uh, so I will stop there um, and thank you for your time and, and listening to what was a pretty lengthy report uh, given all the additional comments I decided to make. Thank you, Brett. Are there any questions for Mr. Cormos on the California Department of Fish and Wildlife report? Chair Gorelnik. Thank you, Vice Chair Hasmer, and thanks, Brett, for the report. Um, your, the report makes reference to sedimentation, sedimentation following the taking down of the dams. Do, do you expect that to result in a short-term loss of habitat? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, the, the projections are for uh, some unknown but temporary uh, loss of productivity due to that sedimentation downstream. Uh, right now, uh, projections um, sort of consolidate uh, that loss of productivity uh, primarily to the area above the, the Highway 5 uh, bridge, um, which isn't terribly far downstream from Iron Gate Dam. Uh, but that's, that's the short answer to your question, sir. Thank you. Further questions, Marcy Uremko. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Brett, for being here today and presenting our CDFW report. It's great to have someone with intimate expertise in this area here with us today. Um, I'm thinking about the department's recommendation for a work group. Um, and I guess I'm hoping you can elaborate on why a council sponsored work group um, is the best vehicle to accomplish the objectives in a timely way uh, versus, say, um, an offline or, or another forum of co-managers, for example, um, that might be created outside of, of the council process. Maybe you can elaborate on the benefits of a council-sponsored work group over some other form. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Yaremko. Um, I'll kind of go back to some of the comments I made uh, uh, in addition to our report um, and, and point out that the council venue, uh, I think, provides the best and greatest certainty for a useful outcome because it establishes the, the necessary leadership, a schedule of meetings, clarity that an outcome will be reached. There's product deadlines. There's council staff support. And then there'll be a resulting recommendation for the council to implement. Um, it also ensures that all of the, the necessary representatives from agencies, tribes, and, and perhaps even industry are present and participating. Um, and uh, I, I can't um, underscore enough, I think, the, the need for uh, expectations around leadership and um, and participation, and and I think that the council venue really provides the appropriate space that we're going to need to get everyone to engage and and stick to a timeline. Uh, Co-manager forum 
uh, of sorts has been considered by CDFW already. Um, and we deliberately chose this path um, of bringing this to the council because uh, it was our thinking that this would be the most effective, efficient way to get to the solutions that we're ultimately going to need. And in addition to that, the council has responsibility around this and is, is, is really the appropriate place uh, with all the right people to take care of this work. Marcy, follow up. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, you, you spoke about urgency and about the timeline and the days here that the dam removal process is beginning. Um, there's a need to uh, bring about recommendations uh, in advance of our next preseason process that's just around the corner in March of 2024. Um, maybe you can elaborate on why um, the council should be soliciting advice uh, from a group um, on needed um, deviations from the FMP um, and why why do something versus do nothing um, thinking ahead to March? Um, what would be the ramifications of not um, considering recommendations on fishery management and deviations from the FMP? Thank you, Mr. Yeremko, for the question. Uh, well, that's kind of a big question. There's a lot to, to unpack there. Um, uh, why why do we need to do something as opposed to nothing? I think I'll start there. Um, uh, like uh, I alluded to earlier, the geographic scope and the historical significance of this project and all of the investments that have been made to this point to ensure repopulation of this new habitat and recovery of this new habitat, it can cannot be uh, emphasized enough. It's, it's incredibly important uh, to our tribal partners, uh, uh, maybe most importantly, but also to the to our public trust responsibilities as a state agency to ensure a successful restoration project and ultimately a sustainable fishery. Um, we're essentially taking the available habitat that exists now about 200 miles and tripling it with an addition of 400 new miles. Um, and uh, to think that no active uh, and adaptive management is necessary would be naive in my estimation. Um, it's really important that we take an active role in trying to facilitate the success of this restoration project as opposed to uh, taking a hands-off approach that would ultimately equate to us hoping for Mother Nature and, um, and the climate and the ocean conditions to facilitate all of the fish needed to repopulate the new habitat. Um, why a work group? Uh, I've already touched on that in a number of ways, but I think uh, maybe to say it a different way, uh, you could ultimately um, trust your advisory bodies in the existing council process to tackle this uh, in the spring uh, over the March and April council meetings. Uh, there is a significant amount of work that I think that needs to be done here to bring the best available science to the fore, to bring the most uh, intelligent and considerate policy decisions to the fore. Uh, and uh, the advisory bodies do not each independently have the appropriate skill sets to derive a recommendation. Uh, there would at a minimum need to be a coalition of those advisors, advisory bodies all meeting together. Um, but unfortunately, none of those advisory bodies have the policy acumen to deal with the harvest and, and allocation implications that are going to come along with this issue. Um, and perhaps probably most importantly, that model uh, would not allow the time needed to navigate those difficult policy issues and de develop a recommendation in council to council. So you really just don't have enough time and you don't have all the skill sets necessary uh, coalesced into one um, functional and really pointed uh, group. With, with the deadlines needed to, to make this stuff happen. Sorry, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> Thanks, Brett, for the report, and good to see you here. Um, <clears throat> last meeting, we heard a snippet about 
there might not be funding to restore the habitat behind the dam yet. And um, it seems to me, it, you know, that's not going to you drain the dam necessarily. The habitat that is that will be exposed probably is not conducive to spawning and all of those things. And but I, I heard that last time. I think I did that there was no directed funding for that, and that would have to be identified. How does that change uh, the process and interfere with the process, particularly when when the dam is is breached and the the downriver stuff is is compromised. Uh, the habitat is compromised, and if the other work isn't done, do we do we end up in a worse shape over time than we than we were if we didn't do it at all? Or and you know, how how are we going to deal with this if there is not funding? So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dooley, for the question. Um, well, that some of what you're saying to me is is news to me. Uh, it's my understanding that there is. Uh, funding to at least begin in earnest and make meaningful progress on habitat restoration, in particular in the reservoir footprints themselves, um, where the, there will be almost a, a veritable moonscape that needs to be planted and, and dealt with. Um, there's a great deal of uncertainty uh, attached to this, this restoration project with, in terms of timeline, how long is it going to take for the river habitat itself to recover? Uh, how long will it take for the sediment um, plumes to, to move through the system and, and essentially dissipate such that spawning success is going to be uh, ensured? Um, there's no way to answer that uh, ahead of time. We're going to have to take the dams out and see what happens. Um, but I'll remind folks that there is a significant amount of high quality habitat above these dams um, now. Some of it is even wild trout water. Uh, so it's it's ready to accept fish. There's a number of springs and cold water refugia up there that are going to be particularly conducive for species like coho and Klamath, uh, upper Klamath Trinity spring chinook. Um, and we expect fall chinook to benefit from those habitat advantages as well um, in the near term. So uh, we need to ha make plans for putting fish on this new habitat to ensure the success of this restoration project immediately. I mean, there's no time to waste. As soon as we can get fish up there and, and getting some success, the, the better. Um, and I should note that CDFW is in the process of, of uh, working through the regulatory process for new fishing regulations for all of that new habitat up there as well that are gonna be aimed at ensuring the success of anadromous salmonids um, when they begin uh, occupying that new habitat. So steelhead, coho, chinook, all of the above, um, and trout as well, existing native trout populations. Um, there's a significant amount of work and planning going on around this process uh, related to the restoration question that you've asked me here as well. Um, monitoring plans, uh, BCPs in the department to fund brand new programs and, and with brand new equipment, all aimed at uh, taking a look at how the river's recovering, how the fish are responding, um, and, and trying to make adaptive management decisions as we move forward. And restoration is a part of that. You know, what did, what did we plan to do? Uh, what have we learned from dams coming out that would change the way we want to continue to do this restoration work going forward? I mean, the restoration component of this project is a decades long component. It's not something that you'll see happen over a, a relatively short period of time. Thank you, Brett. Appreciate it. Further questions, Chair Gorelnik. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Um, so, Brett, one thing we've learned, uh, in particular on the Sacramento, that uh, habitat does not equal spawning success because habitat without water is a beach. So, you've talked, you've mentioned a lot of uh, you, you mentioned a lot of different things are going to be done to try to ensure success. One thing that hasn't been mentioned are steps to ensure unimpaired flows, uh, and I'm referring specifically to diversions. So can you touch on efforts that the state of California is making or not making to uh, ensure uh, maximum flows and minimum diversions? Yeah, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. That's that's also quite a, 
a detailed sort of <laughs> long-winded question and uh, well answer to that question I should say um, there are a number of considerations uh, there's the upper Klamath Lake and the agriculture and the diversions that exist around the the headwaters of the Klamath system that ultimately aren't uh, going to be resolved by dam removal um, there is uh, a, a, almost a competition if you will I think that's the wrong way to put it but conflicting needs with respect to ESA listed suckers in Upper Klamath Lake and Salmonids downstream um, that would that may and can necessitate different uh, water policy decisions or actions um, to for the benefit of those species, and that's that's putting agriculture uh, aside uh, for the moment. Um, however, all of the modeling that's been done. Uh, relative to this restoration project and a post dam world with no changes to that upper uh, water project issue that I think we're alluding to or we're, we're looking at here, um, they all line up in, in agreement that the unimpaired flow from that point all the way down to the ocean is going to provide uh, substantial benefits to salmonids and ultimately lead to greater abundances than what we see now uh, with dams in place. And as I've mentioned already uh, a couple of times, there are a significant uh, number of tributaries uh, and cold water springs between Iron Gate Dam and that uppermost reach where diversions will still occur that are going to provide a significant amount of benefit to salmonids in terms of habitat. And removal of the dams will further improve habitat by uh, eliminating the pooling or stagnation of water where disease takes a uh, root, uh, where you get toxic algal, algal blooms, um, and it will allow a greater unimpaired flow for the overall square mileage of the watershed to help flush out uh, uh, some of the parasitic um, uh, C. Shasta disease related issues that we get without scouring um, like you would see in a natural habitat regime. So uh, I think that's a long winded way of me saying it's still going to be better um, in terms of habitat than what we have now and significantly so. Thank you. Joe Altman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Comros, for your um, report as well as the contact that you provided. Um, so relative to the recommendation to have the council consider forming this ad hoc work group, uh, you mentioned on, on a number of occasions, um, you know, uh, having tribes be part of that. Um, can you perhaps elaborate on um, whether there's been any initial discussion with the tribes on this sort of an approach? Um, I'd be interested in knowing that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, Mr. Oman. Uh, I'd have to say really only in passing while discussing other, you know, uh, issues that are pertinent to the Klamath Trinity Basin and habitat quality needs and sort of future, uh, uh, sort of looking to the future of the processes and stuff like that. Um, Nothing specific, nothing explicit about, you know, we need to have a work group. Do you guys agree or disagree that that's something we would want to do? That that has not happened yet. Um, beyond the, the, the basic premise that uh, at least Hoopa Valley Tribe has long called for uh, sort of a global board that is going to look at and evaluate how we manage fisheries and habitat in that basin sort of on a grand scale, not just in the microcosm of the Trinity side or, or the Klamath side, but in a holistic um, fashion. So I think that, you know, we've had a lot of conversations that, that, uh, that suggest we're in agreement about the, the need for a holistic approach and for a co-manager type of approach where we're all pulling in the same direction and working uh, with, with sort of a common objective in mind, but nothing specific about, okay, dams are coming out. We need to have an ad hoc work group at the Pacific Fishery Management Council to, to accomplish this. Um, however, I, as you mentioned, I've, I've, I've brought up the tribes, the co-managers on numerous occasions because it's obvious and 
necessary that they're an integral part of this process. And uh, in my role with CDFW now, uh, I have a lot of interaction with the Hoopa Valley tribe and the Yurok tribe with respect to fishery management issues. And uh, we are dependent upon one another um, to manage the resource appropriately and uh, look to the future for, you know, what that looks like long term. All right, further questions? Sorry, Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Brett and CDFW, thank you for bringing this report forward. This has all been really helpful. Um, Brett, you mentioned um, when in addition to the report that the FMP conservation objectives are likely to become obsolete. And then you went on to note the need for policy and legal needs and the, the need for policy issues to be able to address that kind of in the short term, sounds like the next year to two years and get to get that in place. Um, I think I have an idea of what you're talking about, but if you have any specifics you'd like to add about what those needs are going to be, um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, with respect to policy, um, what we're ultimately talking about here is interim management measures. So not a long-term final uh, installment, if you will, uh, with a new SMSY and conservation objective and a brand new harvest control rule with all of its respective reference points being plugged into the fishery management plan. Uh, that itself is a, has, a, has a number of policy implications that need to be uh, reconciled. Um, and in addition to that, as uh, I discussed just a, a minute ago with Mr. Oatman, there are also tribal, non-tribal harvestable surplus allocation uh, issues that need to be navigated as well. And I, while, while we've been operating all along uh, with, with respect to Klamath River Fall Chinook, uh, under a 50-50 tribal non-tribal split. Um, I won't be surprised if uh, some of the tribes or all of the tribes call in that into question when we're talking about, um, uh, or even the state for that matter, when we're talking about uh, how we share equitably or not um, the sacrifices that will be need you know, will be needed in terms of harvestable surplus going forward in order to ensure the success of this restoration project. So uh, I'm being very candid here and answering your question uh, when I say that, but I think that those are, are those are serious issues that need to be grappled with. Um, and in addition to that, uh, I am not a, a lawyer. Um, I would look to the lawyers to help with this particular aspect of it but it, it occurs to me that deviation from the FMP um, over an eight to 10 year period or any number of years for that matter uh, might need a look from legal. Is that something that we can and should be doing? Uh, and how does that look in terms of framing that from a regulatory standpoint? Um, so uh, the FMP allows for taking more conservative measures in terms of departing from the FMP. That's certainly something that we have done in the past and we can do going forward, but uh, it, this seems like a somewhat different animal to me. Um, so I would look for some advice on that. All right, thank you. Oh, Susan Bishop. I thought it was gonna be hard not to see wearing the sweater today. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I actually have a list of questions, so if you just bear with me. Um, thank you, Mr. Cormos, for coming today. Um, it, I appreciate your report. It was very thorough and very thoughtful in terms of the additional comments that you offered. Um, I think I'm just I'm going to dial it back a little bit. Um, you know, I am. I, I, uh, I noticed that you invoked my agency's name multiple times in your comments. Um, I, like many other natural resources agencies, are really struggling with limited staffing and resources and a lot of big projects ac across which to allocate that staff and resources, not to mention the challenges require the right tool for the job. So being really clear about what the skills are that are necessary for the work and the sequence in which the work is, is done. Um, so just, just a few questions about 
um, so that I understand the lay of the land. My understanding is that the last dams will come out uh, towards the end of next year and that volitional access is anticipated toward in the October to November timeframe. Is that, is that true? Thank you for the question, Ms. Bishop. Yes, that's correct. Um, and that the expectation is that there will be some level of sedimentation um, once all four dams are out, some level of sedimentation that will start moving through that system and could have a substantial effect, at least in certain areas, on productivity. But we don't know exactly what that effect is going to be. There's a lot of modeling, but we won't know that probably, as I understand it, for the first year or two. Is that, do I have that correct or am I overstating? Uh, Thank you for the question again, Ms. Bishop. Um, in general terms, that is correct. Uh, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly where that sedimentation will occur. There are varying dis distances uh, between the various dams um, and different types of habitat or habitat quality uh, in those um, areas in between. Um, and also, uh, without a crystal ball to predict uh, precipitation and subsequent flow in the watershed is really difficult to pinpoint exactly how long the sedimentation will be uh, issue will be prevalent um, such that it limits to any extent uh, spawning success. Um, it's certainly something we expect to happen in some places, maybe not all places, um, and I don't think it precludes in any way, shape, or form uh, the ability for Chinook to have some success in the first year after the dams are out. Uh, it's just difficult to say exactly what that looks like and how much success they will or will not have. Okay. Um, so we will learn from what I understand, the SAS also had a presentation from Mr. Simonday yesterday um, that talked a little bit about elaborated a little bit more on those expectations of sort of feeling like by, I think it was year three, most of the sedimentation effects probably would be complete or at least well known in terms of how that is better known, how that's moving through the system and what the survivals might be um, in resulting from that. Um, so my, I guess my question that I'm a little bit unclear about, and maybe this also has to do with specifically, you've talked about policy, you've talked about uh, technical expertise, kind of when we are next year, given all of that happening and all of the uncertainty in that, sort of what more will we know substantially at a technical level that we don't know now um, or couldn't work with now? Um, or is it required that um, we could potentially work within the FMP? So I'm not, I'm not as convinced that the FMP, uh, I think your characterization that would be that it would be obsolete that we couldn't work within the provisions of the FMP and the control rule, particularly with regard to the outlook um, that we're hearing from the Habitat Committee and others for what we're likely to see coming back on Klamath next year. The um, outlook is poor. The expectation is that that will require constraints in the fishery, likely even under the existing um, uh, control rule, and whether it would be possible to um, so maybe work under those conditions um, for a couple of years while, we're, while we are able to potentially uh, work on the SAC fall um, project at the same time that we're learning more about the Klamath um, uh, conditions as they play out. Thank you for the question, Ms. Bishop. I'm sitting here thinking about how, where, where to start. Um, so uh, to, I, maybe I'll go in reverse order. Um, following the FMP as, as an alternative management approach uh, as compared to uh, what has been suggested in the CDFW report. Um, that's certainly within the council's uh, purview. If that's what the council thinks is the right way to allocate staff time um, and prioritize. <clears throat> um, I haven't been invited up here to comment on uh, Sacramento River Falls Chinook objectives and how that should be prioritized. Uh, but CDFW certainly has given that some consideration um, and finds that uh, if necessary, Klamath River Falls Chinook uh, management objectives of, are of a higher priority at this point in time. Um, 
what will we learn? Oh, oh, and the last thing I wanted to say is that I think a better way of considering uh, the the FMP quote unquote approach would be to con- include that in a range of alternatives considered by an ad hoc work group that CDFW is recommending um, as one of the ways uh, by which we might uh, manage the stock going into the future and in the, and in this interim period. Uh, I don't think that that gives enough consideration to uh, some of the other alternative um, methods uh, or approaches by which we might manage this stock uh, in the near term and and between now between now and when we could get a, a new uh, SMSY. Uh, so I would recommend against that. Um, what will we know uh, three years from now that we don't know now? Am I capturing that question correctly? Go ahead, Susan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cormos. Um, no, uh, um, my question had to do with so the 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 report that you have given outlines a fairly aggressive time frame. So essentially, if I understand it correctly, is asking that that there are alternative or interim management um, uh, objectives that would be in place before next year's preseason planning process started, which is pretty aggressive. I think, uh, I mean, just in my own mind about to address all the challenges that you've laid out and all the different parties that are, might be involved in developing something like that. So wh- what I'm thinking about is what is it that we would know and be more certain about, say, between now and the end of the year when we would need to begin to coalesce around a, a set of interim objectives that we wouldn't know, say, at the end of next year or or the beginning of the following season when we had a better sense of um, the schedule for the dam removal uh, completion, the uh, what if the sediment, some of the parameters that are fairly uncertain now, that we begin to see those actually happen that could inform our thinking. Okay, thank you for the question, Ms. Bishop. Um, there's too much uncertainty around the the what will happen after the dams are out for me to answer that question directly. Uh, three years from now, we might uh, know exactly the same amount that we know now about the productivity of, sto- of the stock and, and their capac- the, the capacity of the stock to occupy and make good on the new habitat. Or we might, we might know a significant, uh, there might be significantly more information available. Um, I think what uh, <clears throat> we need to keep in mind here is, is that this is <clears throat> a very unique uh, and, and like I said before, in geographic scope, a historically significant project with a great deal of uncertainty. And we should be planning in earnest to make good on this in the near term and have an adaptive management approach as we move through time. So as data accrue, as information becomes available, we should be poised to shift and make adjustments in how we're ultimately managing the stock. But there is by no means any reason whatsoever to delay taking some proactive uh, uh, measures to change the way we're managing the stock now. We should be planning for these fish to be on the habitat in the fall of 2024 and planning management measures to ensure their success as a result. And, uh, Unfortunately, regulatory timelines, both federal and state, require that we anticipate these things early on and plan for them early on because of how long it takes to put those regulations in place and have them be effective by the time we expect something like this dam removal project to be complete. So we we don't have the luxury, uh, in my estimation, because of regulatory timelines and in addition to that, the, the policy and science needs around this particular issue to wait uh, or else we will just be um, left with only the option of following the FMP and hoping Mother Nature takes care of the rest. And um, that is in essence uh, why CDFW is recommending an ad hoc work group now as opposed to waiting. 
follow up, Susan. Just one last. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cormos. And just to be clear, um, my focus is on the next year, year and a half period. So I'm not suggesting that we do nothing or we let nature take its course for a long period of time. This is just in the interest of trying to figure out how to uh, uh, staff very various requests of, of complex nature. Um, so my, my um, last question has to do with uh, something that you mentioned in your report. Um, so there's a sentence in the report that says alternative pathways and or timelines that bring the necessary science and policy council representatives from the state and federal resource agencies, industry and tribes and council support should be considered given the significant workload the council and its representatives are faced with at this time. Um, can you provide a little bit more context on what you think those, what you think reasonable alternatives might be? Yeah, thank you for the question, Ms. Bishop. Um, I don't have anything specific to offer in that regard. Uh, I, you know, as I have had some offline conversations with yourself and others leading up to this agenda item, it's occurred to me that uh, there is, there's the potential for a need to prioritize uh, what we're going to do. Uh, there's a whole bunch of Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook uh, management tools, management objectives that are in serious need of, of, of revision. Um, and what has been prescribed in this report in terms of a CDFW recommendation via a work group uh, is the ideal scenario. However, uh, being someone who's been around this council for a long time, uh, I am very much aware that there's a lot of really smart, innovative people uh, around this table and in this room today uh, that may uh, be able to help us conceive of alternative pathways that don't include the kind of, that don't constitute the kind of work groups that we've seen in the past for things like winter Chinook or Southern resident killer whales or, or, or others of that nature. Uh, and uh, maybe more useful is the consideration that while Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook are similar in that there is some concern or, or need to revisit the conservation objectives and the harvest control rules and their various reference points, uh, there are also different policy considerations and science considerations around those problems, such that uh, you may need different representation and different levels of staff commitment to accomplish those two uh, goals. Uh, and they could be, uh, I don't know if complementary is the right word, but they may be able to coexist. And uh, I do think that um, while CDFW has come with a recommendation for a work group, uh, we haven't had the requisite time to meet with the tribes as Mr. Oatman asked about earlier, uh, or, or NIMFs or members of the SST and or SSC and STT uh, and others to talk about uh, sort of the greater universe of problem solving that we have in front of us uh, for Sacramento and Klamath River Falls Chinook um, and, and to discuss um, how these things can coexist and what that process looks like uh, so that we're making meaningful progress on each one of them in time for uh, the management needs that are attached to those issues. Um, and as I've pointed out in the report, and what's different about Klamath River Falls Chinook is that the timeline is not flexible. There is a point in time where those dams are coming out, ground has been broken, the hatchery is being built, the process is underway. There is going to be a point in time in the fall when those fish have access to the new habitat. On the Sacramento side, Nothing has changed uh, with respect to habitat um, and nothing is anticipated to change with respect to habitat for the foreseeable future. So um, there are a lot of things to consider about uh, what the pathway looks like, what prioritization look like, looks like, what the timelines look like for these various products that, that I can't answer alone um, and nor can CDFW answer alone. These are bigger conversations that are going to take a, a lot of great minds. 
All right, thank you. Uh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks uh, very much, Brett, for being here. Good to see you. Um, I've been trying to figure out a way to ask this question so it's not unfair. Uh, we um, There's been some dam removals um, in other places, and I'm been specifically thinking about the Elwha. And I'm just wondering if you've um, had a chance to look at um, how fish were uh, re reintroduce themselves to the new habitat that was made available, the timing and how long it took that is helping inform what you think might happen in this case. Yes, I, I have. Thank you for the question, Mr. Anderson. I've certainly been a student of that uh, restoration project, given the similarities here. Um, however, there are some some pretty uh, significant differences, too, that uh, sort of steal from the uh, utility of those lessons on the Elwha. Um, so uh, it's without knowing more about really what it is you're after there with that question, it's difficult for me to to know what to say. Um, but uh, I will also offer that there was a, uh, some pretty significant differences in terms of the planning for the Elwha that led up to the dam removal and what has occurred on uh, the Klamath side of things at this point. And I think maybe most notably is uh, the planning uh, ahead of dam removal on the Klamath included the development of monitoring and reintroduction plans. However, it did not include uh, the development of new fishing regulations. It did not include the consideration of, of, uh, of so when I say new fishing regulations, I mean it, it did not include the consideration of developing new freshwater fishing regulations in the new habitat, nor did it contemplate uh, the needs of um, new management regimes or fishing regulations for the ocean and for the lower river below the dam, um, which uh, I know were probably better anticipated on the Elwha uh, side of things. So um, that is why we're here today at this late hour uh, asking for this much commitment. So just a quick follow-up. No, thanks, Brett. That helps. I, I, I just, uh, I guess what I was thinking is what what we found out was the the fish are quick to find that new habitat, and you need to be prepared uh, for that and uh, respond accordingly from a management perspective uh, as as appropriate. So, well, thank you for making that point for me, Mr. Anderson. That's helpful. Yes. No. I mean, uh, as I've maybe just alluded to and not flat out said, uh, we need to hope for the best and plan for the worst here. And when I say hope for the best, I mean these fish are going to be on that habitat right away and having some success. Um, and to the extent we can facilitate uh, greater success and more fish on that new habitat, I think that we should make every effort. Okay, thank you. Uh, Executive Director Burden. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and uh, thank you, Brett. Um, very interesting discussion so far. I'm trying to crystallize in my head a bit more uh, this idea of the work group that you proposed. And so a couple of questions related to that. One is question of your vision of how long this work group might exist. And I think what may be underpinning that are thoughts as to what the charge of that work group would be. And so what comes to mind for me is a relatively short duration work group could be one that comes together and creates this adaptive management framework that you've alluded to and then hands that to somebody else and is disbanded. And that framework is used to annually change Klamath management in some way. Or alternatively, you have a work group that acts like an advisory body to the council and annually meets once or twice a year looks at data and annually makes a new recommendation to the council until such time as we determine the Klamath has recovered. Those are two bookends I see in my mind. And of course that comes with a lot of different resource and staff planning and different considerations. So uh, if you have any clarity about that in your head, uh, I would certainly welcome, uh, I would love to hear what you have in mind. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you for the question, Mr. Bird, uh, Burden. Um, well, as I as I said in my answer to an earlier question from Miss Bishop, uh, the answer to your question will ultimately result from uh, some greater uh, consideration and or deliberation among the partners here, the co-managers and the various agencies. So uh, I think that uh, the formation of a work group or even the conversations that we have between now and the formation of that work group will better inform what the long-term prognosis is or, or needs are around management of this stock. I think we just have to really uh, try to um, hold close to our hearts the fact that this is a very um, uncertain process in terms of what will happen after the dams come out, how will the fish respond, and what will the management needs as a, be as a result uh, of those responses. Um, and so, yeah, I think you're right to have a bookend in your mind that consists of some sort of ongoing process. Um, because the habitat's going to be changing, the, the fish response is going to be changing, uh, the, the data availability is going to be evolving uh, such that we should be poised to react to that as opposed to a set it and forget it kind of management approach, which is essentially what we have um, with our FMP objectives. And, and that's a coarse way of saying, you know, you know, describing what we do under the FMP and certainly not set it and forget it, but those objectives don't change over time. Um, and on the Sacramento side, I, I would imagine you could have a work group that created a new product for implementation on an annual basis. And that work group was, was essentially disbanded, but disbanded permanently. Um, that's not the problem we're trying to solve on the Klamath side. Uh, so, uh, I, I think that, um, what you'll find and what I've seen in other uh, work groups I've participated in the past uh, in in the past is that uh, among the alternatives considered uh, for recommendation to the council is an adaptive management framework that you can use to guide management on an annual basis year in and year out until we have a new SMSY established. Uh, there could also be a recommendation um, uh, sort of in that suite or menu of options that includes um, a prescribed objective, interim objective that won't change from one year to the next. Uh, and I think when, when at long last other people get to come up here and sit and t give your reports and answer questions about this, um, you'll find that, that uh, the scientific community probably thinks that that's possible also uh, in an interim uh, way. Um, and you could also have among that uh, sort of the suite of recommendations, uh, leave the FMP in place. We, there could be some sort of a, a relatively arbitrary uh, buffer or de minimis rule set in place that doesn't change over time. I mean, at this point, I'm just brainstorming for, for the benefit of the council, but there are a multitude of ways that this could go forward, uh, and it really depends on... Uh, what the science can provide us, and then what policy considerations there are in the near term and in the long term on an annual basis. So uh, if there are needs to look at tribal, non-tribal allocation on an annual basis, then we might need to have some sort of a forum to address that specifically for uh, south of falcon fisheries, uh, which is uh, not something we've, we've seen here at, at the council uh, in my time, at least, um, not on an annual basis. Uh, so uh, I hope that's helpful. All right, thank you. Uh, look around and see if there are any last questions here. I think we've uh, pretty thoroughly discussed that. So appreciate you taking time to be here today, Brett. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you again for having me. We will next move to the SSC report. 
Dr. Jason Schaffler. I, as uh, Dr. Schaffler comes up, I will just note uh, the SSC report will be followed by the Salmon Technical Team report. Again, good morning, Dr. Schaffler, and I see you're joined by Dr. Satterthwaite. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, I am Jason Schaffler, and I'm joined with uh, Dr. Will Satterthwaite. Representing the SSC, I am here to read agenda item E5A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, April 2023, Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Sacramento and Klamath River Falls Chinook Conservation Objective Scoping. The Scientific and Statistical Committee considered the potential process, timeline, workload, and content needed to develop new conservation objectives for Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook stocks. Evaluating and updating conservation objectives for Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook should not require a lengthy process nor a long period of time to complete. A report prepared for the SSC Salmon Subcommittee in October 2022, linked in your briefing book material, indicates that sufficient information to evaluate the Sacramento River Falls Chinook conservation objective likely exists. An update could be accomplished fairly quickly by a small group of analysts with scientific expertise in salmon biology. For Klamath River Falls Chinook, there are data to establish conservation objectives for the lower Klamath under current conditions, and there may be information available on the productivity, productivity, productive capacity of habitat above Iron Gate Dam that could be used to establish a conservation objective, noting that conservation objectives can include data gathering strategies. Council Operating Procedure 15 and the FMP indicate that changes to conservation objectives should occur periodically and take place within the salmon methodology review process. Updating conservation objectives for the Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook stocks may have unusual challenges that would benefit from a special process, but this need not be the case in general. The conservation objectives for both stocks are linked to reference points such that updating only the conservation objective could lead to incon inconsistency. The lower bound of the conservation objective for Sacramento River Fall Chinook is the SMSY. The Klamath River Falls Chinook Conservation Objective is the SMSY. Since SMSY is an input into the control rule for both stocks, the conservation objective is an implicit input as well. In each case, if only the conservation objective is changed, it will no longer be linked to the control rule. The SSC recommends that the council differentiate between natural and hatchery origin spawners when setting conservation objectives for these stocks. And that concludes the SSC statement. Thank you for that. Are there questions for the SSC on their report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, second paragraph, uh, you suggest that updating the conservation objectives for Klamath Fall and Stackfall should not require a lengthy process, nor a long period of time to complete. Are you making that statement with regard to Klamath Fall um, independent of the dam removal situation? Or did you consider that in this assessment? That is one of these extenuating circumstances. The actual conservation objective might be more easily updated, although there are certainly other considerations that may make that process much more lengthy. Thank you. All right, thank you. Further questions? And I don't see any hands, so again, thank you for that report. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. We'll move to the Salmon Technical Team report. Dr. O'Farrell, um, that report will be followed by the Salmon Advisory Subpanel report. And good morning, Dr. O'Farrell. Council members, um, 
I'll be referring to agenda uh, agenda item E five A, salmon technical team report on Sacramento and Klamath River Fall Chinook conservation objective scoping. The STT discussed the potential for developing a new cons new conservation objectives for Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook salmon. With regard to Sacramento Fall Chinook, the STT continues to support development of a new conservation objective given the conservation concerns and importance of the stock to salmon fisheries south of Cape Falcon, Oregon. The STT is supportive of an ad hoc work group process with a diverse team of, uh, with a diverse team composed of participants with relevant SRFC expertise, but who may not be regularly involved with council process. A work group of this magnitude would likely require a two-year process. The STT is also supportive of an ad hoc work group to develop a new conservation objective for Klamath River Fall Chinook given conservation concerns, importance to salmon fisheries, and impending dam removal. The STT has previously stated that a Sacramento uh, Fall Chinook work group would be of higher priority in the near term, given that several years of data following dam removal would be desirable before such an effect should be pursued for Klamath River Fall Chinook. However, there may be a need for more for development of interim management objectives for the years immediately following dam removal. The timeline for a technical work group more narrowly focused on developing an interim conservation objective should be linked to dam removal. To have work group recommendations ready for implementation in, ocean fishery in the ocean fishery season prior to the first volitional passage above Iron Gate Dam, such recommendations would likely need to be adopted prior to the winter spring 2024 fishery planning process. The STT makes no recommendation on the relative prioritization of a Sacramento or Klamath River Fall Chinook work group at this time. However, if the work groups were to be held simultaneously, it is likely that availability and workload issues for the STT and other contributing entities would be a factor. That concludes our statement. Thank you. Are there questions for Dr. O'Farrell on the salmon technical team report? Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Dr. O'Farrell, um, in your in the STT report, you comment um, your support of an ad hoc work group process for the Sacramento Falls Chinook um, conservation objective with a diverse team composed of participants with relevant ex expertise, but who may not be regularly engaged with the council process. Do you, can you provide examples or sort of in the course of your conversation um, ideas you might have had to illustrate that language? Thank you, Ms. Bishop. Um, trying to recall the exact STT um, conversations we've had on this. Um, um, and there's there's been acknowledgement that there's a lot of expertise that's not in these halls of the, um, when we have council meetings uh, when it comes to Sacramento River Fall Chinook or pretty much any other um, stock that we are concerned with. Um, in particular, I think of um, people who work in the Central Valley on um, salmon um, uh, assessment management and other sorts of things. Uh, that uh, are, are not who do not come to these meetings, but um, their the work that they do is directly relevant to this, including estimation of river harvest, escapement, and so forth. Um, we've experienced this uh, with the um, rebuilding plans, where we assembled working groups that had representatives from um, both the Klamath and Sacramento basins that um, were new to this process and were um, instrumental in helping us uh, make those uh, build those rebuilding plans. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Further questions? And I don't see any, so thanks. Thank you. We'll move on to the Salmon Advisory Subpanel Report and George Bradshaw, I believe, will be giving that. Good morning, George. <coughs> Good morning, Vice Chair and Council. Uh, my name is George Bradshaw. And I'll be reading agenda item E5A supplemental SAS report one um, salmon advisory sub panel report on scoping for Sacramento and Klamath River Fall Chinook conservation objectives. The salmon advisory sub panel supports reviewing and developing updated conservation objectives for both the Sacramento River and Klamath River. Updates for both these standards are important 
and the SAS supports an approach that prioritizes or that pri prioritizes addressing both of these systems. The SAS supports review of the Sacramento Conservation Objective, which has not been revised since 1984. The science, so the scientific and st statistical committee and salmon technical team have recently completed work on the Sacramento supporting reevaluation of the conservation objective, which should allow for a faster completion with a lighter workload. This also aligns with the recommendation from the Sacramento River Fall Chinook Rebuilding Plan to reconsider the current conservation objective, develop, a, develop an age-structured stock assessment, develop age-structured forecasts, and develop an age-structured harvest model. While this conservation objective is ready for review, the SAS believes stakeholder input is essential to the process and should not be sacrificed to achieve completion in a more expeditious time frame, the SAS supports a work group style approach in which we can actively participate. While the Klamath Conservation Objective was more recently revised in 2007 and includes more accurate age based co cohort reconstruction, this system is about to undergo significant change with Klamath Dam removal starting in the summer slash fall in 2023. Analysis and the evaluation of the available fish passage and suitable habitat must be analyzed and evaluated to find appropriate escapement goals during the transitional period. The SAS recommends a work group be established as soon as possible to navigate the transitional or the transition of this system for the next three to six years. In summary, the SAS recommends the council move forward and prioritize both watersheds co or concurrently. We recommend the council form work groups as soon as possible and ask that members of the SAS be part of the work groups. The SAS plans to engage with these, engage with these conservation objectives and participate in the process for both watersheds. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the SAS on their report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, George and James. Um, Regarding the Sacramento, um, you indicate you support a work group style approach in which we can actively participate. And I'm assuming that you're talking all members of the SAS or are you suggesting a singular SAS representative to a, a work group? In other words, would there be one SAS member that is representing all of the SAS on this work group or are you looking for the work group to contain multiple SAS members? Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Yeramko. Um, I would assume that we would probably choose a delegate. I don't suspect you know, the whole SAS would want to be involved. Um, there's individuals that are more intimately involved um, with you know, this region that we're talking about than others. Um, you know, and it might be one or two of us. Thank you. All right, thank you. Further questions? Butch Smith. Thanks, George and James, for your testimony. Sitting here thinking back in history, and probably you'd have to go around the table, maybe Mr. Anderson might be the only one to answer this, but I, I'm, I'm just wondering a process like the KMZ work group that was here in the early 90s to would uh, be a kind of a model to, although it was multiple times, but I mean, uh, a little different, little different uh, subject now, but I'm, I'm wondering if like the KMZ work group model-ish would be what we're trying to do, af go after here. Um, and it had, you know, different, different members, user groups on that, that uh, actually, I, if I remember right, met separately sometimes than, than the meeting process also so you know, that's just a suggestion to kind of look if you're looking for a model to to look at and, and um, anyway that's I guess the problem you have when you're around this place so long you kind of remember some of those those things thank you mr. chair all right thank you butch I think that could we could come back to that in discussion here unless the SAS wants to respond to that um, I one of mine, thank you for the chance, Vice Chair and uh, Mr. Smith. You know, I, I think the the conversation that we had in the SAS and you know subsequently in our state delegation in California was that, 
it kind of goes along the course of the testimony given by Mr. Uh, Brett Cormos that, you know, we feel that we need to obviously address both of these systems. There's definite need um, for various reasons. And we feel that, you know, we just need to get the right minds together and start talking about it. And once we get the proverbial ball rolling, um, I think that there's, you know, a lot of great minds like Mr. Cormos mentioned that, you know, could handle these issues. I understand the uh, staffing constraints that uh, Ms. Bishop brings up, um, you know, but frankly, we, our jobs are to take the, the time needed to address these situations. Um, you know, we're sitting here and from the seat that I'm in right now, representing the California commercial troll, we are looking at closed seasons. Um, and I think we need to go above and beyond to address these issues so that we could not be in this seat. It's not a good spot to be in. And, you know, for those reasons, I, I, we recommend getting, you know, these groups assigned and, and moving sooner than later. Um, and we're willing to volunteer our time to help in any way that we can, boots on the ground, observations that we could, uh, you know, give advice to in any way possible through the process. All right. Thank you. Further questions for the SAS? And I don't see any, so... Thank you. Thanks for your time here. Our last report is the Habitat Committee report. We have Dr. Corey Green online to present that. Dr. Green, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. I'm reading agenda item E5A, supplemental HC report one. Habitat Re Committee report on Sacramento and Klamath River Fall Chinook Conservation Objectives Scoping. The Habitat Committee considered the habitat aspects of conservation objectives for Sacramento and Klamath Fall Chinook Salmon. In both systems, there are grounds for a higher conservation objective associated with full seeding of available spawning and rearing habitat. In the case of Klamath River Fall Chinook, new conservation objectives are clearly needed due to reconnection of spawning and rearing habitat through dam removal. While data on escapement will require multiple years, as noted in the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's supplemental report, to establish any new objective via standard stock recruit analysis, interim objectives could be informed based on analysis of newly connected spawning habitat. In the case of Sacramento Fall Chinook, improved conservation objectives could arise from inclusion of the full distribution of spawning and rearing habitat as defined by the essential fish habitat distribution, as well as by analyses like Munch et al. 2020 that address spawning levels that maximize outmigrations for the entire basin. Both approaches would also better integrate the role of the San Joaquin tributaries to contribute to the fishery and better align multiple fishery management plan policy issues within the Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Dr. Green on the Habitat Committee report? And there are no hands here, Dr. Green, so thanks for that report. Uh, that completes the reports. I believe we have one public, two public comments. We'll pause. The screen is up before us now. We will have James Stone followed by Joel Kawahara. Uh, James Stone, welcome. Thank you, Vice Chair. Council, my name is James Stone. I'm representing NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association. Uh, we fish in the sector east of the Carquinas Bridge in the Anadromous Waters for Chinook salmon. We're facing full closure for my fleet and recreational anglers this year as well. We've been asking the council for a number of years to look at this Sacramento conservation objective. Um, I've been on the SAS for five years, and I know that I've mentioned it multiple times under public comment. Uh, in March, I presented to you all about the needs of the Sacramento River. Uh, this Sacramento conservation objective should have been revised in 2011 when the Red Bluff Diversion Dam was removed. For those of you that don't know what that is, is in Red Bluff, there was a very large barrier that blocked Chinook salmon from the upper Sacramento reaches below Keswick Dam and the, the Diversion Dam. It was opened 
with accounting weir on August 1st in the past, but there was never significant passage. And that barrier has been removed, which has opened up all of this suitable habitat, kind of as Mr. Cormos was representing for the Klamath, that there's going to be all this habitat that's available and we have to do a new stock assessment. But we kicked that can down the road. Here we are 12 years later, and we're finally getting more comment and more engagement on this topic, and I'm very appreciative that it's finally coming to light. We cannot afford to kick the Sacramento Conservation Objective down the road because of Klamath Dam removal or anything else. On behalf of my organization, I can't tell you how imperative it is that we get this conservation objective done and achieved, and we're willing to work side by side with the council and provide any input that we can to make sure that this gets done once and for all. It is needed, uh, not for just the species, but it's also needed to provide the recreational fishery that we need. When we look back at all the historic numbers, the only years that good fishing is considered actually good where angler enthusiasm come out and the launch ramps are full and families are taking their kids fishing is when we have upwards north of 250,000 fish in the river. So when there's 250,000 fish actually swimming in the Sacramento Feather and American Rivers, fishing is great. And we know that by going back and looking at the escapement numbers of the past and highlighting, oh, that was a good fishing year. This was a good fishing year. And we see the symbolism that you've got to have 250,000 fish in the river. Otherwise, opportunity isn't there. Opportunity isn't there to run a business. Opportunity isn't there to take kids fishing and go have a chance to catch a Chinook salmon. The things that are interesting for the, those of you that don't fish inland is that Chinook salmon don't eat when they're inland. They're much harder to catch. You have to know what you're doing in order to catch them. It's not just, oh, there's a thousand fish in that hole, there's opportunity. Many times, a lot of those fish, 60, 70, 80% to give you an estimate on my personal experience of being a full-time fishing guide, of those fish are not biters, they're moving through. And so having that elevated escapement is not only gonna provide better species management for spawning and for the future, for our future generations, but it's going to provide better fishing opportunity for all anglers and access to the resource. As I've testified to you in the past, uh, my sector is the last user group to access this resource every single year. Um, six out of the last eight years, we have failed to even achieve the minimum floor escapement currently of 122,000. We can't even get to 122,000 75% of the time. So we have a, a lot of work I've read all the peer-reviewed uh, documentation that's out there. I've read the work from Dr. Satterwith. I've read the work from the SSC. And it's a substantial amount of information and work has already been done by some great minds in this room and others that provides a clear path in my mind forward that we can achieve this and get this done. And I urge the council to make sure that we push forward. We cannot afford to keep kicking this can down the road. If we do, it's on our heads. And we should be ashamed that we're not willing to get this done finally. And that concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Stone on his testimony? I don't see any hands, so... Appreciate you coming forward. And Joel Kawahara. Good morning, Joel. Uh, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, while it's still morning, and members of the council. Uh, I can't believe that I'm the only person in the salmon community old enough to remember the Klamath Fishery Management Council. Thank you, Mr. Smith. <clears throat> for indicating that Mr. Anderson may be a peer. Um, so there are bones for 
uh, such a forum that Mr. Cormos was talking about and other people have batted around. I will just simply say the name again, the Klamath Fishery Management Council, and it was established by uh, uh, 16 U.S. Code uh, Chapter 460 SS-2, uh, in case anyone wants to go to the Federal Register and look it up or uh, uh, Google it. Not advertising Google by any means. Um, and it it exists, that, uh, that forum in law, the membership, um, scrolling really quickly here, uh, Don Hoopa Indians, Hoopa Business Council, Department of the Interior, Department of Commerce, including NIMPS and PFMC, uh, Oregon and California commercial fishing industries and recreational fishing industries. So there's bones for this thing. You wouldn't have to spend two months re, uh, reinventing the bones. You'd have to spend that much time putting people on it, I suppose. If you chose to do that, it doesn't indicate the current law, as far as I know, doesn't indicate how it integrates with the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. Should you choose to uh, do something like this, maybe you could figure out what they did in the past, perhaps, should you, uh, again, should you choose. And I will add that this came out of uh, federal legislation that I found just sitting here scrolling, the Klamath Restoration Act, I believe it was passed in uh, 1986. It only had a 20 year funding horizon. So uh, the Klamath Fishery Management Council apparently went extinct in 2006. So it would take federal legislation to resurrect this exact thing. Um, and that, that of course is a burden too. I just wanted to point that out in case the council was so inclined to uh, take the recommendation to start a new process. And that's everything I know. I'll be glad to take questions, but uh, good luck on getting an answer. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Kawahara. And I don't see any. So thank you, Joel. That completes or concludes our public testimony. Before we start our council discussion on this, we're going to take a short break. We've been at it quite a while. Uh, please be back here at 1135. Thank you. <clears throat>
Make our way back to your chairs, please, so we can get started. All right, we've completed all our reports. Uh, have some good questions during those. Uh, I want to take the give Robin Elke the opportunity to just review with us uh, because there was a broad range of topics that came up. What our tasks are before us here to to shape this discussion. So, Robin, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, just just recapping, we certainly have had a lot of conversation. Um, we've heard from the California Commission, the SSC, the STT, the SAS, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, and uh, the Habitat Committee. And there's a, a lot of uh, different ideas out there. There's a lot of um, uh, issues that are surrounded with that. But the um, the conversation here today from the council perspective, the agenda item is a scoping exercise. And so we want to, you know, have an understanding of certainly what the issues are, how we might go about addressing those, and then identify the process and timeline to do that. So um, both of these items, both the Sacramento and Klamath uh, Fall Chinook conservation objectives are certainly different with uh, different issues uh, surrounding them that um, are going to uh, require uh, some of the same, but but also uh, different uh, staffing and uh, needs to achieve the the goals of these topics. So, um, I think um, uh, having the council focus the discussion, you know, essentially remembering that it's a scoping exercise and uh, learning what we can on how or what the best process would be and then what the time frame to start and finish uh, the uh, process uh, would be beneficial. All right, thank you, Robin. So with that, I will look for anyone's hand to start the discussion here. It's all very straightforward, I guess. Marcy Aremko. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, looking at the council action, I guess I would offer my thoughts in the order that they're shown on the screen. Um, with regard to prioritization of the evaluation of SAC fall and Klamath fall, um, I think you've heard from the department that our priority, um, if pressed, is Klamath Falls Chinook. However, they are both priorities and both important, um, but they're important in different ways and potentially on different timelines. Um, the situation with Klamath Falls Chinook and the need to address interim policy needs um, is clearly tied to dam removal. And as we've heard from Brett, that timeline's just not negotiable. Um, I agree with Brett in his characterization that it would be irresponsible for the council to not deliberately consider the dam removal process and how it affects our FMP uh, established um, harvest control rules and other um, FMP criteria. So um, I think the, the time is now, the urgency um, is clear. 
Um, I just want to, I guess, make very clear that when we talk about the needs and what is in our immediate horizon, um, it's not so much about revising the conservation objective for Klamath Fall. It's about interim management um, in light of the fact that the situation in the um, upper reaches of the dam is um, has been is unsettled, and we're really unable to um, follow our FMP constraints without um, considering the the current state of nature. So, um, as we've expressed, we feel very strongly that we need some advice to inform us uh, during the interim period whether that means developing an interim framework or providing interim annual guidance in advance of the preseason process, I think is something that um, is worthy of additional consideration. Um, and, and it may be one or the other, we may wind up with annual recommendations or a framework, but um, I think we need appropriate policy um, guidance from a work group that um, can help shape that. Um, thinking about Joel's comment on a Klamath council, um, I think that's not what we're talking about with an, a work group that presumably would be an ad hoc, um, council appointed, um, group that is for a particular task and a finite duration. Um, the Klamath Council process, I, I was not involved then, but um, I understand that it was a much bigger um, scope, um, had a number of advisory committees created by federal legislation. Um, I don't think that's what we're envisioning with a work group, um, just to make that clear. <laughs> um, turning to the Sacramento conservation objective, Again, this too is a priority, and I think the council has indicated such on an ongoing basis, and most recently, um, as the SSC notes, we tasked them last year with the first step in the reevaluation of the conservation objective for SAC fall. We asked them to, to undertake a comprehensive literature review and give us... Um, a starting point um, with which to continue on to the next step, um, which presumably will be um, sometime soon. Um, but I think we had embarked when we when we did that last year under the methods review item, we sort of had embarked on a series of um, stepwise progression um, activities that is intended to lead to a revision of the Sacramento um, conservation objective. Um, <clears throat> I think with regard to the appropriate time frame, um, we've discussed the Klamath Dam removal item um, and the time that being the, the driver on the timeline um, and the urgency. Um, with regard to Sacramento, um, I am sensitive to James's comment that we can't keep kicking the can down the road. Um, but when we took up our preliminary methods review topics, uh, we had some exchange about whether or not th there might be uh, appropriate additions that get added to the list in light of discussions and agenda items that were yet to come at this meeting. So I certainly, um, thinking back to the last methods review and the item um, that we tasked the SSC and STT with, with regard to the literature review, I think there's a very logical next step that um, can be added to the methods review list for this particular cycle. Um, and this leads into number three as well, but um, one thing that we had considered um, back in California that um, didn't make it into a report or any of the testimony from Brett, but um, the value that um, might be gained from a workshop that explores the latest developments and the science that has um, been in progress on the Sacramento conservation objective. We've heard about that in various circles and there's been um, references to work that's been done, whether it's uh, independent work um, 
uh, by uh, university uh, expertise. And of course, the Southwest Center has been engaged um, in a number of uh, activities that we just haven't heard a whole lot about. Um, folks have been looking at things like um, basin by basin approaches to examining the conservation objective. Um, and what about the situation with um, with flows and temperature? Can we possibly integrate those in the future uh, into the conservation objective, recognizing how critical they are to actually determining the available habitat? So I think there's a lot on the scientific front that we just haven't been um, hearing a whole lot about. Um, and I feel like our stakeholders would benefit from maybe a deeper dive look at some of the work that's in progress in a format that's like a, a workshop um, that might happen sometime this summer or fall in advance of the methods review uh, activities in October. So that's, that's just one idea that um, we've kind of considered back um, within our own agency that might help bring people to the table and at least update uh, folks on the current state of the science and how far we might get with our next step on Sacramento fall. Um, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Further discussion. Chair Gorelnik. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hossamer. Um, I agree with the need to prioritize uh, the Klamath um, but it, mostly because we have finite resources. Otherwise, it'd be great to pursue them in parallel, but we have finite resources. And it's the Klamath that is undergoing, um, will be undergoing some rapid changes that we need to be nimble enough uh, to address. Um, on the Sacramento, uh, I, I would love to see a study done um, on to what extent uh, our uh, escapement The recording has stopped. Um, on the smaller side rather than the over-inclusive side, mostly because it's going to have to operate quickly and efficiently and um, as, as we learn new information, as we see how the river uh, redevelops itself. But um, this I, I meeting is being words. recorded. Thank you. Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, in terms of prior, um, I have to confess, I'm not necessarily seeing the need at this point to prioritize. Um, and part of that, I think, is I'm a little confused about the resource we have available and what's actually needed. Uh, the SSC said uh, that would not require a lengthy process nor a long period of time to complete updating the conservation objective um, for the Sacramento. Uh, the STT noted a possible, I think, ad hoc working group and the SAS noted previous work that had already been done. So um, I'm not sure if there's a point of clarification or something that someone can add here or just putting it out for discussion. Um, I don't feel like I quite have a handle on what um, we have available to the moment that is in regards to updating the Sacramento conservation objective. Thank you. Phil Anderson, followed by Joe Oatman. Phil. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Just some, um, I guess, observations. Um, 
The first is we ought to be really excited about this opportunity um, that's presented itself with the dam removal and the Klamath. Um, um, it's, uh, it, it represents a light at the end of the tunnel in my, from my vantage point. And we ought to be excited that we have this challenge in front of us and not be bemoaning, uh, trying to figure out how to deal with it. So, um, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and, um, both these systems, um, have been, been the pillars of the, of the fishery. Um, and, um, devoting resources to try to get them back where we want them to be is, uh, is, is absolutely appropriate and should be a priority. Um, so, um, I'm excited for, for California and, and Oregon and the interest, all the people that have an interest in these two systems. Um, I um, find myself in agreement with with both Marcy and and Mark. Um, I think um, it's pretty clear why uh, Klamath needs to be a priority. It is here and now, and it it needs to be addressed. Uh, and I share Mark's perspective that it, that if we could, and I think Marcy expressed some similar sentiments about, about trying to do these in parallel would be great, um, uh, but we, we're going to have to, obviously we have to look at what our capacity is. Um, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be advocating that we put one on the back burner to the, you know, suggesting that we're for, that we're, it's, that we're not going to try to, to, uh, work on it. Um, I, I, um, I like the idea of the um, workshop that that uh, I, that idea, and should, I think we that should be further explored, and I'm sure they will. Um, relative to the to the work group for the on the Klamath side, um, yeah, those I, I think um, the Klamath Council is not not the model that that uh, we need here. Um, I'm not sure it's the model we need anywhere, but it's not the model we need here. Um, and I think it, ideally something that had a SRKW work group look to it in terms of the expertise that uh, was assembled at that table is probably more in line with what I'm thinking um, would um, would would be the best uh, kind of model. Um, obviously, different uh, um, seats and and representatives there at that table, uh, but it it is the kind of um, a model I'm I'm thinking about, and I I agree with Mark that um, keeping it uh, small. Um, recognizing that it's not a decision-making group, that their, their recommendations are going to be fully vetted publicly and, and, and at the council when the, when the time comes. Um, but at the same time, they've got some work to do, a lot of work to do in a relatively short period of time, and probably smaller is better um, uh, within reason. Um, so... Um, in terms of timing, um, I don't know if we're thinking about bringing this back in front of the council in June in terms of after we've had some further, the appropriate folks have had some further time to, to evaluate um, the wishes of the council in terms of priority, responding to the recommendations from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, maybe bringing some more uh, specifics um, to the table in terms of what this work group would look like. Uh, but time is of the essence, I think. So, um, we need to, we will need to make some decisions here, uh, in the not too distant future. But again, just going back to the beginning, I'm, I'm, uh, this is pretty exciting stuff 
and um, uh, I'm um, I'm very very hopeful that um, the uh, reopening of all those uh, miles of spawning habitat uh, and appropriate management um, by the co-managers is is going to lead us to a, a better place. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Um, Joe Oakman will be next before uh, you go, Joe. I just want to mention, uh, I may ask uh, Executive Director Burden to be prepared to talk about some of these timing issues and, and decisions and how that all might fit together since it keeps coming up and give his sense of when we might make some of those decisions and timing. But first, uh, I'll turn to Joe. Uh, and let you go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, and maybe before I go into the comments um, that I'll be making here in a moment, I, I do want to uh, acknowledge um, to the council that I, I haven't had any direct um, conversations with either the uh, Yurok or the, the Valley uh, tribes. Um, we didn't have a um, you know tribal reports under this item. Uh, um, that said, sort of in some place that fills at, you know, this is a pretty exciting uh, change that will be happening here soon. Um, so recognizing that timeline and understanding how critically important it will be for us to, to have a, a work group of this type um, uh, help us go through this transition period, you know, once the dams start to come and, uh, no management framework, you know, might look like, um, you know, I think, you know, how, you know, when you repopulate these areas and you revitalize, you know, the tribal communities that have long depended upon these resources, you know, this is indeed, you know, pretty exciting uh, times. And I think the anticipation you know, of seeing the changes that we think will happen, you know, to the fish and to the fisheries um, is something that, you know, probably has been a long time coming. Um, so I, I do think with this timeline, um, you know, seems appropriate to um, uh, prioritize uh, Clam River Fall Chinook, um, you know, create a work group and, um, and thinking about you know, there's going to be, you know, a couple aspects that we talked about, you know, one sort of the technical and the scientific type information that is available or will be developed um, that will help inform, you know, some of these, you know, co-manager and policy level type discussions. Um, I think that that will be a way to um, uh, move forward uh, from my perspective. Um, and uh, having the tribes be part of that, of course, and I, I know the council and the folks who's presented, you know, have, have uh, acknowledged um, that, you know, they will be indispensable, I think, you know, to this process and uh, and having some, you know, communication with them, I think will be pretty, pretty important so that they're aware of, uh, you know, what what could be uh, created here with respect to that work group and what that might all uh, encompass. And so I think, um, again, I think it's Hopefully, you know, we're going to see some better days, you know, with these fish and uh, and uh, look forward to seeing how this thing develops. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Um, so Executive Director Burden, sorry for putting you on the spot, but there's timelines for getting work done and then there's timelines for the council making decisions about that. And uh, I was hoping you could just provide some insights on the council process and what we need to do related to that and when that might happen. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I seem to recall that being put on the spot was part of the job posting. <laughs> so that's, you're forgiven. Uh, as this discussion has been unfolding, um, I have been sitting here wrestling with uh, how we might pin down more specifically what it is a workshop or a work group might look like, what it might do, who might do it. And I don't think we would resolve that here. I think we need some more specifics. And so as I look at our year at a glance, um, this is scheduled to come back up in June. 
And so as I was chatting with uh, Robin during our break, um, and I'm going to put Susan on the spot now and maybe Marcy on the spot too, um, I think it would benefit from some discussion among all of us putting that into a paper for you all that would come back in June saying, here are some possible ways forward. Here's what we think we're capable of doing. Um, here's what it might mean in terms of removing other things off the council agenda, those sorts of things so we can have a more clear-eyed discussion. Um, and then from there, uh, I think you'd be in a better place to make a decision. So as you ask about the process, Mr. Vice, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, that's what's coming to my mind. Let me know if that did not answer your question. That answered my question, but I just want to make sure we keep that in mind as we go forward addressing these issues and, and figuring out how to address them. So I'll still you know, look for further hands ideas on what some of the issues are that need to be addressed and how we would do that on the timelines. Any further thoughts? Virgil Moore. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I guess listening to the discussion, certainly what's me is uh, to the plan. And not only uh, to me, we have an absolute obligation to move quickly and efficiently to get the work necessary done so that we can make the decisions in a science and social basis that we always have. And certainly it takes time to do that stuff. I like what the executive director is outlining, a white paper, get it to Jim, make a decision, and let's get this started. Um, um, any further discussion on it puts us so far down the road that the useful tools that our fish managers and other people need are just not going to be there. We've got the skill, we've got the knowledge, we've got the ability. It's just a matter of us making the decision now to move that forward so we don't waste any more valuable time in getting the final product available. Getting to this point, taking these dams out. We should have probably anticipated this years ago and been working on it, but we didn't. We're there, we're here, and it's time for us to get on and, and move it forward. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Bob Dooley. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, in thinking about this, you know, I listened to Brett Cormos give us a prediction of how we may have down, downstream effects that might hamper the our process and we have to deal with those in the short term but I also listen very intently to, to Phil Anderson speak about the fish are a little more adaptive when this happens and there's been past cases where they come back a lot faster so we need to be pretty nimble to deal with this and I think it could happen a lot faster than we're prepared for it to happen these changes either up or down so I think we really need to to expedite this the best we can and i don't want to beat a dead horse bear but but i think that we need to we need to have a path to get us there as quickly as possible and uh and and make this work because the one thing i see in this is uncertainty and it could be very very quick if the, when these dams are breached we don't know uh we don't know what's going to happen we have past experience that says it could be pretty quick we have positive but we also have mr carmos showing us what his estimates are, and I don't doubt those. I know way, way, way more expertise than I have. And so we, we need to be prepared to do both. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, look for hands, and while you're thinking about that, I, not seeing any fly up right now, so I might ask Robin if she can summarize what she've heard. I've heard ideas about priorities and workshops and a paper and 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 how when it might come back before us. So, what have you heard, Robin? 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, definitely have heard uh, the the same types of things as well. Um, it's that it's difficult to prioritize, but understanding and acknowledging the immediate need of the Klamath River Falls Chinook, given the the changes that are uh, upon that uh, basin in uh, the, as early as this summer, um, but also understanding that the Sacramento Falls Chinook um, are also a very important and um, uh, stock to uh, the Central Valley and also contributes um, significantly to the ocean salmon fisheries as well. Um, so really uh, big rocks to lift, if you will, but it sounds like we're uh, getting to the point where we can uh, work, we council staff can work with NEMPS and California Department of Fish and Wildlife staff and come up with some more succinct, detailed ideas on the best way to approach this in June in the form of a white paper. Um, it sounds like the council is uh, in agreement that, uh, uh, or like the idea of, like, of a work group for uh, the Klamath River Falls Chinook um, so that we can adaptively um, respond to uh, that stock as it uh, goes into uh, some areas of habitat uh, that it hasn't seen before, or at least in many years. And for the SAC fall, um, consider a, a workshop um, a little bit, I don't want to say narrow in scope, but uh, small enough to where it would be productive and start uh, uh, getting the information that we would need so we could also work on that conservation objective. Um, Staffing and budgeting and workload is is everyone's concern and probably constraint, but I do hear the council saying that um, it's very important and a priority. Um, so all in all, I think that you will hear from us again on this topic in June uh, with a white paper and hopefully have something a little bit more detailed for uh, each one of these two stocks that the council could then uh, better formulate the path forward. Okay, thank you, Robin. I'll look around and see um, if there's general agreement. We don't need a motion on this at this time. It'll come back to us. This is the scoping, and is that, uh, does everybody agree at this point that that's the direction we'll move forward? And seeing some general agreement there. Um, anything else anyone wants to say while you're Otherwise, I'm going to ask Robin if we've completed everything. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, I think you've completed your work. The only thing that I would encourage the council members to do, knowing that this is coming in June, is to help um, prepare and maybe blaze the trail. Um, you know, if indeed uh, we are going to be uh, setting a work group for Klamath Fall, internally uh, start identifying who those members are, think about, you know, uh, the, the level of participation, just making sure that uh, we have all the right people at the table uh, once we get there. And uh, same with SAC Fall, um, if there is a workshop, um, just, uh, you know, keep that in your mind, you know, between now and June so that um, we can uh, get moving as quick as possible, like uh, everyone seems to think is, is the priority and, and agrees with that. So with those final words, yes, you've completed your work under E5, and thank you for the uh, good, healthy conversation on that. All right, thank you, and I thank everyone for that conversation. We're going to take our lunch break. Uh, since I will have the gavel when we come back, let's come back at 1.10. So we'll give you an hour, and before we break, I am going to ask uh, Executive Director Burden for any announcements. Uh, no announcements from me, Mr. Vice Chairman. All right, thank you. and. Uh, and I'll remind everyone, though, we do have agenda item E3 is open. That sometime this afternoon we anticipate coming back to that. Uh, we'll let you know whenever that is. Uh, have a good lunch.
All right, I'd like to welcome everyone back. Apologize for my tardiness, there's too many meetings here. But um, before we get into our next agenda item, I think we have an announcement from Ryan Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Afternoon, council members. Um, it is my pleasure to let you know that um, NOAA has officially selected Jennifer Kwan to be the regional administrator for NOAA Fisheries West Coast Region. Um, she will begin in her new role on April 23rd, uh, so just a couple weeks. Uh, Jennifer brings more than 27 years of experience working on Pacific Northwest natural resource conservation issues. She assisted in the development of federal legislation and policy on climate, weather, and marine natural resources uh, for, the, for the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, the Subcommittee on Oceans, Fisheries, and Climate. Uh, she's also no stranger to NOAA. Uh, and to NIMPS. She spent more than four years in the West Coast region previously as a supervisory fish biologist where she managed the conservation and protection of marine resources in the Puget Sound uh, and lower Columbia River areas. Uh, and prior to her time with NOAA, uh, Jennifer was at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife for more than 10 years, which culminated with her position as their government affairs director. <clears throat> so I just wanted to notify the council of, of this uh, announcement. Um, later this spring, Jennifer will be meeting uh, with a wide variety of partners and stakeholders across the region to listen, learn, and identify ways to advance no emissions. Uh, I'm sure you will see her um, possibly at the next council meeting. Um, I also believe she will be at the CCC uh, with me and with uh, your representatives here in Key West in May. Uh, and so that's, I won't take up any more of your time. I just wanted to announce that, but I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. All right, thank you, Ryan, for that. Uh, any questions for Ryan or anybody want to make a comment? Phil Anderson. Uh, I don't have a question, I do have a comment. Uh, great choice. Um, uh, she was the Government Affairs Director for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife when I was director there. And uh, she did a fabulous job. And um, she's a no nonsense uh, kind of a person, a personable, but no nonsense. Uh, and I think she'll do a great job. All right, thank you. Well, we look forward to meeting her, seeing her at a, one of our council meetings here, or all of them, not restricting it. All right, with that, we'll move on to E6, and I will look to Robin Elke for an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, agenda item E6. This agenda item focuses on improvements to the Southern Oregon, Northern California Coast Coho Ocean Fishery Exploitation Rate Forecasts. So the situation summary kind of just walks you through a, a little bit of history again on uh, why we're talking about this today. But uh, back in January of 2022, the council tasked the STT and the MU to provide a report to the council that uh, outlined how much work and time it would need to explore the potential improvements on forecast to these exploitation rates for the Sunk Coho. Uh, this came about as the recommendation was part of the ad hoc sunk coho work group in their uh, risk assessment. And that was provided in November of 2021. And uh, so following that in September of 2022, the STT and the MU provided this uh, report to the council and uh, it included a workload and timeline estimated to uh, conduct this work. Um, it suggested that the work be done in a two-part fashion uh, by looking at some initial analysis and then the information from that uh, first part would uh, help inform how to prioritize work, uh, further work, uh, so part two of that. Uh, the council, or excuse me, the, the work groups um, also provided an estimated time frame to conduct the analysis and the list of agencies that would be needed to contribute uh, to complete the tasks. Uh, so the council discussed the report and expressed interest in it. Um, 
but acknowledge that the SDT workload and with other projects was was currently high and that the pre-season salmon process was uh, getting ready to start. Again, that was back in September 2022, uh, y'all uh, last look at, looked at this. So the council agreed to revisit the topic here at the April council meeting when the STT and MU, uh, their workload is uh, shifting more towards uh, salmon methodology reviews and away from the preseason salmon process. Uh, during their discussion uh, back in September, the council also talked about the idea of exploring some of the part two tasks earlier or consecutively with part one as some of the part two tasks appeared to be not so difficult or entail much more work and the suggestion that some reorganization of how this series of items is tackled and presented in the report could be discussed within the context of current and pending workloads of both the STT and MU. So the STT and MU have resubmitted the same report from the September 2022 agenda item and so it is attached as attachment one and if the council does decide to pursue investigation then the council should provide the stt and mu with clear guidance on the order of the prior prioritization of the tasks along with the timeline for a completion the council should also confer with the agencies listed under each task prior to making it an assignment to ensure that proper staffing is available to complete the tasks within the expected time frame. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, the council task is determine if the council should instruct the STT and MU to conduct the analysis as outlined in attachment one, identify specific tasks and the order in which they're to be conducted, confer with the agencies listed under each task to ensure staff is available to contribute to the assignments and provide a general timeline for a completion of the tasks. Uh, you do have some reference uh, material. Again, I noted that uh, the report submitted in September 2022 is provided as attachment one. I believe we also have a SAS report under this agenda item. And again, we're just looking for improvements to the um, Sunk coho forecast for ocean fishery exploitation rates and asking the council to consider improvements and provide guidance on process and timeline. If the council would like, I can go on and just kind of recap what is in attachment one, which was the STT report. And um, if, if you have questions from that, then um, we can ask some of the STT members to uh, come forward and answer those if that's is appropriate. Is that desirable just to have Robin recap attachment one since that is a previous report presented to us? And please go ahead, Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, this is a, you know pretty much a three page report. Uh, the first half of the page just kind of reiterate, re reiterates what I went through, um, but I'm gonna start on the bottom of page one where it starts outlining uh, the uh, scope and tasks. Um, and again, being characterized as a two part assignment. Uh, the first part would be uh, two items. Uh, the first would be an evaluation of the performance of the preseason ocean exploitation rate projections relative to the postseason estimates. So just uh, looking at pre post uh, ER projections and see how they relate. The uh, STT and MU categorize this as a high category. It identifies uh, WDFW, Northwest Indian Fish Commission, and NIMPS, and perhaps other groups. Um, they thought, you know, it would probably take a couple of weeks if, if there were no other or workload constraints. Um, the second item in part one uh, would be a sensitivity analysis. And that would be just to determine the extent of uh, which model, which various model inputs affect FRAM estimates of the exploitation rates. Um, that would take probably a little bit more time and thought, but nonetheless, it was described as a high priority and would inform uh, further work and identified Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Northwest Indian Fish Commission and NIMPS. Uh, to be involved in that work and thought it would take two to four weeks to conduct that analysis 
without any other workload uh, considerations. And then the results of those two items could be used to inform um, stage two, if you will. And um, starting on uh, page two of this document, there are uh, three items uh, that could be considered uh, doing further work on, and those are items that uh, use existing data. And again, this format what is what uh, was recommended by the SONC work group that you first looked at, um, that you looked at data that you had, and then you also looked at data that you could maybe collect that you don't have right now. So um, the second part of this is uh, three items that you could look at that has uh, using existing data, um, and then the, the last part of this uh, report on page three um, has four different items that could be uh, potential improvements if additional data became available. And they list what some of those things uh, could be. Um, they also uh, mention in some of these uh, what the availability or likelihood of actually gathering that data might be as well. Um, but nonetheless, um, that kind of wraps up what uh, the STT and the MU put together for council uh, consideration, uh, the stepwise approach, uh, doing the, the, the two uh, items first, and then um, seeing what those answers reveal and look for further uh, direction after that on where to focus uh, more time on the topic. Thank you, Robin. And, and so with that overview, just to remind you, this uh, report was presented to us uh, last September. Uh, Mr. John Kerry was trying to uh, give us the report online. His microphone didn't work. Uh, Dr. O'Farrell did. We have both of them in the audience today. So if you want to, if there are any questions for them, on the report, or if they want to provide any further clarification or insights, they are here. I'll look around right now to make sure there aren't any questions on that. And I'm not seeing any, so uh, that would next take us into the SAS report then. And we have Mark Newell here to deliver that. Good afternoon, Mark. Here we go. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Mark Newell. I'm an Oregon member on the SAS. I'm here to read the... Uh, your microphone turned off there. There we go. <clears throat> I'm here to read the uh, SAS Salmon Advisory Subpanel Report on Improvements to Oregon to forecast ocean fishery exploration rates on Southern Oregon, Northern California coast coho. The Salmon Advisory Subpanel was briefed at our April meeting by Dr. O'Farrell on the Salmon Technical Team and the Model Evaluation Workgroup MU, <coughs> excuse me, report on scoping potential improvements to forecast ocean fishery exploration rates on Southern Oregon, Northern California Coho. The SAS appreciates the continuing effort to improve the forecast methodologies used to forecast Southern Oregon, Northern California Coho salmon ocean exploration rates and better informed management decisions. The SAS supports the step-wide approach outlined in the STT MU report would su suggest a two-part assignment with the outcome of part one informing the focus of future work to be done under part two. The SAS continues to be interested in tasks described in part two of the STT and MU report, which includes methods to provide a more com contemporary picture of coho salmon encounters in non-retention fisheries. While the collection and analysis of genetic stock identification, GSI, samples is challenging and expensive, this appears to be the most informative method available absent coded wire tagging of hatchery fish. To help determine stock origin 
and Ocean Coho Salmon Stock Composition. The SAS is also supportive of improved dockside sampling inquiries to better determine contract rates with coho salmon and non-retention ocean fisheries. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Newell on the Salmon Advisory Subpanel report? Doesn't look like there's any questions, so. Thank you. Thanks again. That, I believe, completes our reports, and I will confirm that there is no public comment on this. There is no public comment, so that will take us into our council discussion and action then. And that's on the screen before us here. thinking about further steps forward on that. So I will, uh, while you think about it, look for a hand to initiate discussion. Marcy Remco. Thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, as I read attachment one and the two step process, it appears to me that the two items on the list that would be done first that could inform future work. Um, both of those activities appear to involve WDFW, the Northwest Indian Fish Commission and NIMFS. Um, and acknowledging that previously, um, you know, the council had uh, given this high priority, um, I guess I'm just, again, struggling with how we integrate this agenda item with the general methods review schedule of events. Um, because I, I feel like I, I really, you know, have no ability to weigh in on what other agencies are capable of doing here. I, I would note that, you know, I mean, this topic is of interest to us. Um, there's certainly, um, I think, from the state of California's perspective and our fisheries perspective, we're, we're just starting to learn how um, the sunk coho exploitation rates uh, affect our fisheries shaping preseason. Um, so I would just acknowledge that, you know, the outcomes of this analysis are, I think, very much of interest to us, but I'm certainly not intending to weigh in on ability of the agencies that are listed here to complete those tasks. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Further discussion? Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I think I, I may have a question for Mr. Oatman. Um, a lot of this information was at the urging of the Hoopa Valley and Yurok tribes during, can, came out of just work group discussions and in particular were requests from the tribes. Um, I noticed we don't have a tribal report on this issue and so I was just curious if Mr. Oatman may have had discussions with the tribes and might have um, anything to help the conversation. Thank you. Joe, would you like to respond to that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, apologize for missing that uh, question, um, but I haven't received any uh, input or uh, feedback from the tribes uh, on this, um, so I wouldn't have anything to offer for council consideration at this time. See if there's any further hands, if there's no discussion, I guess that could be a determination that we're not going to instruct the STT to move forward on it, which is possible. Susan. 
I could stand uh, corrected from either Dr. O'Farrell um, or Mr. Carey, but my understanding in talking with them is that this work would be somewhat long lasting. And so the recommendations, the data that's available on which the recommendations were, were based um, and the resiliency of the recommendations would stand if this was something that we might wanna take up in the next several years, for example. Um, we would have more information for some of the, the recommended analyses that could better inform us at that point if it became an urgent issue or one that was emerging. Um, it would also give us the opportunity, should the tribes bring forward um, um, a stronger request for the information, we would the, the report would still and recommendations would still be relevant for the council is how I understand it. So I guess I would just um, uh, introduce that into the conversation. Okay, thank you. Marcy Aramco. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm not sure like if our experts are available to respond to a couple of questions, maybe now that are teed up in attachment one, but my challenge here is there's no STT report and there's no MU report. And yet we did receive reports from those entities under the methods re review agenda item. But I would just be interested in hearing. Um, I mean, the, the items one and two identified in attachment one, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's correct to characterize them as low-hanging fruit, um, but I'm noting that task one is estimated to take two weeks and task two is two to four weeks. So I'm just wondering why um, we the, there was not a recommendation to potentially accommodate that work in the methods review preliminary list that was presented earlier. And maybe there's just more to this than I'm just not aware of, but I guess that would be my question. Robin, I'll turn to you first for a response. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I think it was not included in the list of methodology review topics because it's not a methodology review. And although it um, might be a topic that could follow the path of the methodology review in a three council process, but it is separate from a methodology review. Um, the uh, report that was provided under attachment one uh, was th there really wasn't much more for the STT to um, provide in the sense the council asked for a report on what it would take. The STT provided that and the council said that they wanted to revisit this uh, in April. Um, so there really wasn't much for the MU or the STT. The STT, there wasn't much more to say, <clears throat> excuse me, on that topic is why you're not seeing individual statements. <clears throat> okay. Further discussion or direction on this? I'm not seeing any hands. Robin, what's your sense? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm getting the sense that the council understands that this is important, but is also understanding that uh, there are a lot of matters uh, in front of it that are going to take some time with the um, expertise of the salmon folks that we have uh, working with us on items. Um, we don't have a report right now uh, from the California tribes um, signaling uh, its its high priority, um, which could certainly come. But at this point, I, I feel like the council um, is uh, going to let this one uh, rest for now and uh, pick up at a later date uh, when it appears to be uh, maybe a little bit more bandwidth, bandwidth to uh, do the work and um, maybe when it becomes a, a little bit more um, uh, relevant. Also, understanding that the information in this report um, is essentially long-lived and, and um, no more work would need to be done to update it uh, when uh, it was brought back to the council. Marcy? 
Thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Robin, for the summary. And I, I guess I, this is my chance to ask a few additional questions that might um, shape the next steps. Um, and again, I have no intention of, um, I mean, clearly the tasks involved that are listed in items one and two would need to be conducted by other agencies. Um, but I'm not, I didn't hear from the Northwest Indian Fish Commission or WDFW or NIMS um, about their potential capacity to complete these two uh, top priority items. Um, Again, all I can do is note that it's not on the methods review and I'm not hearing comments from agencies suggesting an interest in taking this on. Um, but I guess, again, I would, you know, reiterate that we're just learning how important these forecast exploitation rates are to our preseason process that we have in the face of no scheduled fishing opportunities for Chinook um, south of Falcon that would have associated um, sunk coho exploitation were already at 15% against the allowable 16% impact rate cap. Um, so that's concerning. Um, I guess I'm just, you know, um, wondering if we might hear back about the potential for again, you know, completing these two tasks that do not appear to be associated with um, a substantial amount of workload or, or better, how we might accommodate these two items in the methods review list, if possible. All right, thank you. Kyle Addix. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <laughs> Earlier when we were <clears throat> on the methodology review topic, I mentioned that our modeling staff are always eager to get things done and I hesitate to overcommit them. One thing I didn't share was that our WDFW modeling staff essentially lost half of their unit since we were sitting here last April, um, trying to fill some positions and get back up to, to full strength there. Um, certainly willing to help. I'm just I'm not quite sure I have my head wrapped around what a time commitment it would be for them, um, knowing there's probably only one person that has the expertise to work on it. Um, so just hesitant to make, make a lot of promises that we can get something done this summer. Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, our salmon modeling unit consists of one person. Um, and he is also uh, uh, very much um, uh, tasked with all of the Pacific Salmon Treaty technical uh, work that goes on in the interim. Uh, we also have a couple of um, killer whale analysis that will be done for other time sensitive biological opinions. So as soon as he leaves here, he will be um, working on those um, agenda items. And so I don't anticipate probably at least over the next year that we, he will have a lot of bandwidth um, to do that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have anyone else working with us that has that expertise. Um, so, uh, you know, if this could be something that we take up next year, that might be something that we could do, but at least for the rest of this year, I think that he will be fully committed. All right, thank you. I'm not seeing any more hands, so I might summarize and uh, Robin can correct me then. What we're hearing is at this point, there's no future work associated with this, but we're prepared to take it up again should somebody bring that. The report that's in there does not become stale. It is relevant when it comes back to us and would inform that decision process. Is that correct, Robin? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, that sounds right to me. So with that, I think you have completed your work under this agenda item. All right, I'll make sure there's no last comments. 
people want to make, and I don't see any hands, so that completes work under this agenda item. And I will pass the gavel back to our chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Hassemer, and I will continue the gavel down the table to Vice Chair Pettinger as we move on to coastal pelagic species. Okay, we're back. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'd just like to welcome Brianna Brady and uh, Karen Brady and Corey Niles and uh, Josh Lindsay to the table for the uh, CPS. And with that, I'll turn to uh, Jesse Dorfby House for, uh, to kick us off. Jesse. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. This is agenda item H1, the National Marine Fishery Service Report for CPS. So under this update, you will hear a regulatory update from the West Coast region, and then an update on research and other science center activities, including a report on the Pacific Sardine Stock Structure Workshop um, from Dr. Uh, Dr. Yao of the Southwest Fishery Science Center. In terms of reference materials for today, um, in your briefing book, um, advanced briefing book, there was a NIMS report one, um, which has been replaced by a supplemental uh, copy after um, a figure was updated. There is also a regulatory update um, supplemental NIMS report two, the Southwest Fishery Science Center presentation, uh, which Dr. Yao will go through today. You, in addition, you have a supplemental SSC, CPSMT, and CPSAS report, um, and you did have one public comment in the briefing book. That is um, your council action for today is a discussion, um, council discussion and guidance as appropriate, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Jesse. Questions for Jesse on her overview? Okay. Okay, with that, I'll turn to Josh Lindsay in the NIPS report. Josh. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, we included just a brief update on some of the regulatory activities we've been doing. I didn't intend to read the whole thing which is good because my computer won't boot up either, um, but I'm happy to take any questions if there are on that list. Very good. Any questions for Josh? All right. With that, I'll turn to uh, Dr. Yao in the Fishery Science Center um, report. Dr. Yao. Um, good afternoon, can everyone hear me? We can. Welcome. Great. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Yanni Yao. I am the director of the Fisheries Resources Division at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. Here to present today uh, an update on CPS research. Um, just a reminder, the last time I presented on this topic was in November, so this is mostly new material since then. Next slide, please. 
brief outline of what I'll talk about. First, the CPS assessment schedule, the starting stock structure workshop report, survey updates um, for Cal Coffee, the summer CPS survey for this summer, and then the integrated survey efforts that will start in 2025, um, life history activities, and then a future C's project update. Next slide. Thanks. CPS assessment schedule. So, um, Nothing that um, everyone doesn't already know here. Pacific Macro Benchmark um, completed sometime in May of this year. So we have a draft report. The start panel is meeting April 11th through 13th at the Southwest Center in La Jolla. Um, and we'll go through that process with a presentation at the June council meeting for Sardine, Northern Stock of Sardine. Um, so first, a report is available that came out of the Sardine Stock Structure Workshop that happened in November of last year, hosted by the Southwest Center. That is in your um, briefing materials. Um, the SSC CPS subcommittee review uh, reviewed a few things from the center um, in preparation for the benchmark that happens uh, next February in 2024. Um, so that CPS subcommittee review happened recently and the items we presented there are proceeding. Um, I have a little bit more content on that in subsequent slides. So first, the starting stock structure workshop report. Um, it was held November 15th through 17th at the center. Um, again, a center hosted workshop um, open to all. We had about 60 participants, about 25 in the room on any given day and 35 virtually. They came from a very variety of different organizations and entities, um, NIMPS, the council industry, nonprofits and state agencies. Sometimes people had more than one you know, hat on when they were at the meeting. Um, and that workshop report is now available. Um, the link there will take you to the link in the repository. And that again is in your briefing materials. Um, so the motivation behind the workshop for those who were not able to attend was um, that we received comments from the PF, from the council's SSC um, when they were discussing the 2021 catch only assessment update for Pacific Sardine Northern Stock. And those discussions um, requested that we use recent years of data to update the habitat model that's used to separate northern stock sardine from all other sardine in our CPS survey data. And that also to revisit the method used to separate northern stock landings from all other landings of sardine. Given that recent years of high catches from the Baja California fleet were being included in the stock assessment to the extent that those amounts of catches did not seem, did not pass sort of a logic test. Um, so those are the comments we received and the primary motivation for motivation for the workshop. Um, the, the workshop also offered up an opportunity to sort of more broadly discuss um, whether there was new research happening that had been published or was ongoing for sardine stock structure. Next slide. So the outcomes from that workshop, um, the two stock structure remains the working hypothesis so we actually did not find that there were any new, like recently published scientific studies supporting an alternate stock structure hypothesis, although there's recognition that there are alternate stock structure hypotheses out there for sardine in general. Um, and then the two sort of main um, comments we heard from the SSC um, about the habitat model being updated and then the landing data separation method, um, those were discussed at the sardine stock structure workshop those have since been reviewed by the SSC CPS subcommittee, and we are proceeding um, per their um, recommendations to implement those. Um, updating the habitat model resulted in minimal impacts to the CPS survey biomass time series, um, but we will implement that new model, habitat, habitat model, and we will also then use the new habitat model to separate um, landings data instead of the previous uh, method, which was primarily temperature-based. Um, and then at the workshop, we had um, several presentations from Southwest Center scientists about ongoing um, research into the topic of sardine stock structure. Those are um, those abstracts are provided in that report, if you are curious. So this um, is a sort of seminal product from the workshop relating to sardine stock structure. Um, it is an archetype. It is a schematic illustration of what we currently understand to be the operational definition of the Northern stock. So this is figure one from the report. Um, just a quick note for folks, there was previously distributed um, a figure that had 
an incorrect color coding on one of the panels. We've since corrected that. And the figure legend itself, the text was updated slightly as well. So if your figure does not match this figure in your um, that you're looking at, then I suggest, you know, please delete the incorrect version and re-download the correct one, which I understand is now available to you. Um, so this, this figure, um, we spent time discussing this at the workshop, um, but this figure shows what we think is happening with, um, for the northern stock of sardine in the spring and in the summer in both high and low abundance scenarios. Again, this is sort of like a, an amalgamation of the knowledge of the folks in the room during the workshop um, for what, what we know is happening sort of in recent years. Moving on to survey updates. So Cal Coffee surveys. Um, so our last report on this in November. So since then, the fall Cal Coffee has gone out on the SIO contracted vessel, the Sally Ride. Um, the winter Cal Coffee was completed on a NOAA vessel, the Ruben Lasker. The spring Cal Coffee is out now on the Shimada. The spring Cal Coffee is one of our longer ones and it incorporates, um, this time is it incorporating what we're calling the Enhanced Cal Coffee Project, which I did talk about last time. So it is a collaboration with um, the National Marine Sanctuaries of Channel Islands and Monterey Bay. Um, enhanced Cal Coffee also includes some sites within the proposed um, Chumash National Heritage, uh, Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, and then also a proposed wind farm site. And so those sites are all being sampled this time in the spring. They're out right now. Summer Cal Coffee will happen on the SIO contracted vessel, the Sally Ride. For this summer, our CPS survey will proceed. Um, it is going from uh, Vancouver Island down into Baja, California. Sorry, it actually will start in Baja, California and move up um, north to Vancouver Island. Um, several different vessels are listed on here. So we'll have the usual of our, uh, the NOAA ship, the Lasker. 82 days at sea, that's our primary um, vessel that's being used. We have co um, collaborations with industry vessels, the Lisa Marie and the Long Beach Carnage to sample near shore. We're also looking at asking them to help us do some um, gear sampling to look at um, biosampling methods that would get at both HAKE and CPS as we move towards the integrated survey in 2025. So I'll touch upon that point in a subsequent slide. Um, we have some sail drone days that we are um, using to uh, help with acoustic support to free up time on the Lasker and the other vessels for other things. Um, Mexico is um, surveying using their um, research vessel, the, the Dr. Jorge Carranza in their waters. And actually they're looking at um, deploying a smaller vessel, uh, the last one on the list there, to try and get at their near shore area as well. Um, so lots of coordination happening here. Um, some of the efforts are again, like I said, geared towards um, getting us ready for the integrated survey in 2025, but we will also be collecting our usual CPS um, data in its usual fashion. Um, so the integrated survey, integrated West Coast Pelagic Survey, um, if you recall, we've been talking about this for a while, but by 2025 and thereafter, we intend to integrate the Northwest Center and Southwest Center's surveys of Hake and CPS. Um, the idea is here to optimize resources. So instead of using two NOAA vessels every summer to sample the entire U.S. West Coast, we are going to use one NOAA vessel. Um, the primary um, scientific objective here is to ensure the continuity of data collected for stock assessments. Um, so both for both Hake and CPS, like maintaining that biomass time series is, is like the primary goal when we're looking at integrating here. Um, Meetings and conversations between both centers are continuing. Um, some of us, you know, meet once a week. Um, some of us meet a little bit less frequently than that, but like frequent conversations, trying to get some more details into place. Um, in 2023, we um, plan to hold stakeholder meetings, which I'll go into more detail in the next slide. We plan to compare catches using various methods. This is the biosampling comparison I was alluding to in the previous slide. So we need to find some sort of solution to sample both Hake and CPS in the waters at the same time, presumably, um, to again, maintain that time series. Um, <clears throat> a fully integrated survey will have um, the data stream on the back end integrated as well. So we're looking at um, the AIML, which is um, artificial intelligence machine learning 
um, can we apply these new technologies to try and uh, help us automate the processing of the acoustics data on the back end? Um, the centers are different spots as far as um, automating the classification of the acoustics data, but neither center fully automates it. There are some steps at each center that are, um, you know, still sort of visual, visually pulling up um, acoustic maps and, and looking at it. Um, and then the Northwest Center has eDNA that they collect already on their surveys, but CPS um, survey does not do it regularly. So we're looking at, can we sort of bring CPS up to speed with that and then start exploring it for use as a, a way to estimate whether species are present or not. Um, I'll sort of say that the, the last two um, bullets here are pending um, some funding sources coming in. And so, you know, we might, we might be scaling some of those efforts accordingly. Uh, okay, so again, uh, we anticipate that it will be operational as an integrated survey in 2025. So moving towards that now, um, this slide goes into stakeholder uh, meetings, a little bit more detail. So back in March, we put out a request for information. Um, that request for information was really driven by um, our efforts to um, try and get, procure a net that we think it would be suitable for sampling both HAIC and CPS. Try and procure it now so we can test it in 2023 and possibly 2024 um, if, you know, if the testing isn't completed, modify it as needed because 2025 is fast approaching. So that was the primary motivation behind the RFI. The RFI also then asked, you know, people, hey, if you have other general comments about the integrated survey, um, you know, feel free to include them here. So we did get um, comments back from the RFI. Um, several of us at both centers have read those, um, all of those comments in detail. Thank you for um, those that submitted them. Um, just wanted to make it clear that was, that was never intended to be sort of the, the only source of input that we would receive about the integrated survey. I'll say, for example, like our scientists who are heavily involved in like the details of trying to plan for the integrated survey are conferring with um, some industry persons regularly. Um, and, and so sort of those conversations continue. We are looking to expand our outreach on this. Um, so uh, we, I had hoped to have some more concrete um, dates and times, but we're having um, some challenges with finding suitable uh, locations that allow for hybrid um, options. Um, our intent here is to hold several events across the US West Coast over the next few months. <coughs> excuse me, um, where um, we're considering them outreach events. So we will, you know, come with some information we're describing about um, the integrated survey, where we're going with it, um, open it up for questions and comments, and just have a conversation in that way. We hope to provide the same content to those sets of meetings. We had hoped that the first, uh, the first meeting we're tentatively scheduling, tentatively scheduling for April 19th um, in the Seattle area. Um, like I said, it, I, it, I say tentative because we're, we're having some issues with nailing down a proper facility for that. Um, when those details of those meetings are finalized, they will be broadcast to all of the industry contacts we have. And certainly, um, you know, through the council channels, um, we, we want to reach as many persons as possible. Also, you know, I, I keep saying the word industry, but um, stakeholder, stakeholders, what we're really reaching for here. So um, any and all persons interested in the integrated survey um, efforts are welcome to attend. Um, trying to make them all hybrid to the extent that we can, trying to publish the schedule of all the meetings um, up front so that, you know, folks can take a look at it and sort of pick and choose then the one that works best for them. So more coming from us on that. Um, welcome suggestions for other engagement activities. And um, also just wanted to mention that we do have, you know, folks reaching out to our scientists um, who work on this and <laughs> excuse me, please don't feel like you have to wait for one of these outreach events to reach out if you have a question or something like that. Um, on our side, um, Dave Deemer is the Southwest Center lead for the integrated survey efforts and Julie Clemens is the lead on the Northwest side. Myself and my counterpart at the Northwest Center, who is Craig Russell, we are um, heavily involved as well. Feel free to reach out to us um, at any time. Moving on to life history activities. So um, for the 2023 Pacific Macro Benchmark Assessment, which is slated to be reviewed by the STAR panel very soon, um, there was quite a backlog of ages, um, OLIS to be read, and that backlog was cleared in part 
thanks to the pandemic, but also because like, you know, we have some new hires who um, are uh, meant to be agers, among other things. Um, and then the group has also uh, provided updated estimates of length and age at maturity from several samples. So they're working to publish all that in a NOAA tech memo and all that information is been, has been incorporated into the draft benchmark assessment. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so their life history activities um, continued. So there's ongoing research about growth patterns in CPS. So a couple of different ones um, are listed here. So modeling somatic and otolith growth of the CSNA, central subpop of northern anchovy, by incorporating seasonality. Um, they're looking to validate Pacific sardine annuli in a captive growth experiment. So we have a one-time experiment where we um, use tetracycline to dye otoliths um, of some sardine and, and then it allows you to um, actually count the rings over time and confirm that the what we think are you know rings of a certain um, age are actually the correct rings that we're counting. And then finally variability in age and growth of Pacific sardine in US waters during the recent population period of low population biomass um, is an ongoing research topic again related to um, stock structure as well. Um, automated automated aging efforts. So there's an agency-wide effort to look at the um, possibility of using FT NIRS, Fourier transform near infrared spectroscopy as a new method to um, age fish. Um, it's meant to be uh, more efficient. This is true for uh, fish with large otoliths in cold waters. So we know this to be true there. The agency is exploring, you know, where else might it be applicable? Um, so just sort of the, the short message here for CPS, we're still working on it. We're not sure the extent to which it'll be suitable for CPS or not. Um, so far, we've determined the best method to scan Pacific sardine otoliths. Um, and we're going to present that work at the FT NIRS workshop, um, a NIMS workshop um, in April. Um, and so past that, we're also trying to develop a method for Pacific mackerel otoliths and write some of these results up. So like I said, to be determined, but we... Um, it's an initiative on the agency's part, and we are trying our um, we're trying our best to see if it works for CPS. Um, okay, so another life history uh, slide here: investigations of life history traits relevant to Pacific sardine population structure. So, um, a couple of different um, ongoing uh, research topics for this group. So, they're looking at a critical review of selected foundational studies of population structure for sardines. So there's a couple of papers that are commonly cited. They took a few of them and just them and are looking to see if they still hold up in um, with today's scientific uh, methods and knowledge. Um, there's a preliminary review of spatial temporal patterns of spawning of sardine in relation to population structure, and then exploration of variations in length at age to inform stock structure. So those are ongoing. Future Seas update. So if you call the Future Seas project is a uh, uh, UC Santa Cruz scientists collaborating with um, some NOAA scientists across both Northwest and Southwest centers, um, looking at climate driven impacts to US West Coast ecosystems and fisheries. Um, the Future Seas held a workshop to engage stakeholders, uh, CPS stakeholders. That happened November 20th through 29th. It was a virtual workshop. We had about 30 participants from NIMS industry, nonprofits, state agencies, and the Quinault Indian Nation. Next slide, please. So this is um, <clears throat> a lot of text, but um, trying to give an overview of the motivation for the workshop um, to improve stakeholder understanding and awareness of the project, um, to engage CPS fishery stakeholders, to help the team better understand fleet dynamics and fisheries operations, because the team is looking to produce socioeconomic models engage CPS fishery stakeholders to identify perceived climate-driven challenges in the fishery, the fishery's ability to adapt and limitations on adaptation and flexibility, and to engage CPS fishery stakeholders to help advance the development of climate-informed ecosystem management strategy evaluation. So the outcome is that uh, with input from all persons represented there, they will be able to synthesize key drivers that affect fishing operations, species portfolio and fishing behavior, sorry, switching behavior. They were able to summarize decisions on harvest location and 
port landings. Um, they were able to summarize uh, key climate vulnerabilities and performance metrics for their ecosystem MSE. Um, they're going to use the findings to guide the development and execution of the models elaborated for the project, trying to address concerns and ideas of stakeholders. So just a plug for one of the more recently published Future Seas papers, starting so northern subpopulation landings projected across three model ensembles. Just a reminder, they tend to project pretty far out um, because they're climate-driven scenarios. That's, that's sort of often their funding source and the motivation of the um, project in general. Um, so they're longer timescales. Um, but in this paper, they found high confidence across their models that northern sardine subpopulation will shift north in their habitat. Um, there was low confidence in future sardine landings amount, meaning that model was highly uncertain in trying to predict landings. There was some high confidence that the California contributions to the total landings of northern sardine are going to decline and the Pacific Northwest contribution would increase. This is, of course, tied to the high confidence of the models that the habitat of northern sardine is going to shift north. Um, this is my last slide. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Yao. Questions uh, on the presentation? Oh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Dr. Yao. I appreciate the report. My interest here is the integrated West Coast Pelagic Survey and how it integrates with the U.S. the Canada Whiting Survey. And when we get to 25, I understand we're going to have one ship rather than two because of maintenance schedules within the NOAA fleet. So in this effort to design a Swiss Army knife that can do both the pelagic survey and the whiting survey, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of changes. And I know the industry, that, at least the whiting industry for sure, has suggested many of those changes over the years and we've always been, um, you come up that we have a, you know, we can't change anything because it's a, you know, it's a fixed gear and, we don't want to change it because it changes our time series. So, but here we are, and I understand all the limitations, and I think we need to be very, very uh, complete because this represents a, a, a huge change and a reset. And I've, I've been involved with some of the uh, people that have commented, at least from the Whiting side, understand some of the comments from the CPS folks as well, They're concerned about the consistency over time and making sure that we take this opportunity to do whatever is being done to integrate these surveys to make sure they're both serving their need. And I think a big part of that is the net design. And when you talk about net design, it isn't simply the net, it is the whole system. Because to enable to fish on the surface at night and then down to 300 fathoms in the day, that's a pretty specialized tool. And it represents a, a big change. There are people that have the expertise in industry, and I suggest that we, we we make sure that we get their input and listen to it because they have the experience. They understand they understand this this gear, both from CPS and Whiting Midwater Trawl. Um, I think that there are there. I I have done some research on this and since our whiting meeting, understanding the integrated survey. And I think that uh, I've learned a lot. I've been out of the directed fishery for a number of years since 2014, and there have been a lot of changes. And there was a lot of comments that were offered. So the one I would really like to see is when you have outreach, it would be good to get fishermen on the Shimada to look at that, or the or the Alaska, whichever one, to look at it and, and really see what you're doing and understand the total system. And remember, these people do it daily and make, you know, they understand how this gear operates more than more than I understood when I was doing it. There's more more technical adjustments and more uh, technology available and more gear available. I think it's doable. 
I worry about the transect changes and how we lose the data in between. Understand there'll be sail drones, but it's a big departure. And to keep the data set the same is going to be a it's going to be a heavy lift. More importantly, keeping the trust of all involved in this process is really important. We, I know from a Hake perspective, we we trust the science. We understand it is it's our basis, and I'm sure CPS is the same way. It is it's what we live by, and with this opportunity, and I look at it as an opportunity to get a fresh start on how to make sure our sampling. Uh, protocols are, are doing the job on both counts, that it's going to take more than just a net change. There's a bunch to it. So please listen to industry. Please invite them. Please, um, I would suggest getting, getting, uh, getting skippers and fishermen on those boats to look at, look at the, what you're doing because this is their livelihood and they do it on a daily basis. We, you know, don't even attempt to suggest that I could do the science part of it. That's, you know, the agency and the, and the folks that do that are the, they're the experts. But when it comes to fishing gear and deploying fishing gear and maintaining fishing gear, it is fishermen that do that on a daily basis. I don't, when I, when my house is on fire, I don't, I don't call the doctor. I call the fire, fire chief. So, and the fireman. So please, uh, Take that into account. I know you're doing, you've outlined a system where they're going to do that, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention. So thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? Carl Braby. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I, I wanted to go um, back to the sardine stock structure workshop report and um, just probe a little bit more on kind of the readiness of um, the science on differentiating uh, the two stock system. And uh, it, the bottom of slide six, you know, indicates the Science Center is continuing uh, stock structure research. And I, this is just an area of interest for me and I think will become a discussion point later today and just wanted to offer or request any additional thoughts you have on uh, the ongoing research and, and uh, where we are in state of the science. Um, sure, thanks. And, and just um, quickly, thank you to Mr. Dooley for his comments. Um, there's, of course, a, a review process. The data will go through. We're looking to, anytime you, you change a method, you want to you overlap the two methods, new one and old one, so you can calibrate the two methods. Um, also happy to receive names of any persons that you feel it's vital we talk to um, to make sure we don't miss anything, and we, we can do that outreach. Um, we can make sure we do that outreach. Um, so appreciate those comments. Um, uh, so... Let's see, um, stock structure research. Um, I guess, um, and I'm sorry, um, just want to make sure I understood the question. You're looking for some more details on um, total efforts of stock structure research or like direction of stock structure research. Um, can you give me a little bit more here, please? Through the through the vice chair, yes, please. Uh, I I'm just I'm interested in in kind of the the readiness of of our stock structure science right now, and and whether you have any further thoughts for the council on on uh, the readiness to incorporate um, stock structure results as they are at this point um, in in our management and kind of what the timeline is of ongoing research and when that might be ready for future decisions. Thanks. I, I better understand. Um, the, the stock structure research has, there's a couple of different components. They're all on different timescales um, as, and this is, I think, true of all science that comes out of the science center and into the literature, you know, from outside the Science Center, um, as publications come out, 
we sort of take each of them, look at them against the other scientific body of evidence and how it fits in, have some scientific discussions about it, um, and, and go from there. So I guess I don't envision, so I envision the center and other scientists will continue to investigate sardine stock structure. Um, for those of you who are at the workshop, you, and, and if you're familiar with sardine literature, you know, there's, there's always sort of been, you know, different competing ideas about sardine stock structure. Um, that's, that's, I think, um, that's, that's normal for a lot of scientific topics. Um, and so I think sardine stock structure research will continue to trickle out from the center over the next few years and beyond that. And that um, with each publication, like I said, it, you, you sort of look at where that fits in with the other literature and have a discussion about, um, about sort of the end conclusion of that. Um, it, it's often, it, you know, the, 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 the definity of the results coming out from that paper versus the other evidence for other competing hypotheses. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have sort of a lot more detail here, but um, that, that's kind of the general process that I see that happens within scientific community, having discussions as literature trickles out and evolves over time. And so we would consider each paper as it comes. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else? All right, Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Dr. Yao. On, on, um, on slide 19, on the Future Seas um, paper that came out, I opened, happy to see that's an open source uh, paper that all of us can read but haven't got to it yet. And I'm guessing the answer is no, but given the title of the slide, but did you, we're, as uh, Dr. Bray just said, you know, the, we're going to be thinking about the stock structure and shifts to the north and the uh, the habitat model that we'll be hearing about here you, was surprising to a lot of us and how, how far north that habitat went. But so you're seeing a slow, or maybe not, you know, um, decades long trend here of moving north but did, did they look at the what's going on in the southern stock too and is it shifting along with the northern stock or my guess would be it wasn't even looked at at all given the title but any any just want to know if you had any uh, information on on that on whether the, the southern stock was looked at as part of this this uh, climate change oriented uh, study as well um thanks for the interest um the, this paper specifically did not look at southern sardine. Um, there's there's not a one I think sort of scope of the paper trying to make it manageable, but then also we we don't ha there's not the level of knowledge of southern sardine stock that there is for northern stock, and we don't have like a defined agreed upon habitat model for southern sardine, which is you know would be one sort of one of the first steps you would need to to get at something like this. All right, thank you. Thank you, Corey. All right, anyone else? All right, thank you, Annie, for the presentation. Uh, with that will be the SSC report. I believe we got uh, Dr. Southerweight is gonna be uh, giving that report, so. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Will Satterthwaite from the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. I will be reading agenda item H1A, Supplemental SSC Report 1. The next full assessment of the northern subpopulation of Pacific sardine was delayed until 2024, so work could be conducted to better understand stock structure and other uncertainties. A work plan was developed that involved the Southwest Fisheries Science Center conducting a stock structure workshop in November 22 the outcomes of which were reviewed by the CPS subcommittee of the SSC. The SSC was briefed on the report of the November 22 workshop on Pacific sardine stock structure, that's attachment one, which summarized a conceptual model of Pacific sardine, including the characteristics of the northern subpopulation 
and proposed methods for assigning landings and survey biomass to the northern or southern subpopulations of Pacific sardine, given the working hypothesis of two subpopulations of Pacific sardine off the west coast of North America. The SSC also discussed the report of the SSC's Coastal Pelagic Species Subcommittee related to how to estimate CPS biomass from the 2022 Summer Acoustic Trawl Survey. So Pacific Sardine Stock Structure Workshop. The SSC agreed with the definitions of the northern and southern subpopulations for management purposes, given the working hypothesis of two subpopulations. The workshop report includes a figure showing the typical seasonal distributions of the northern subpopulation, given the current working hypothesis. The SSC endorsed the CPS subcommittee long-term request that other stock structure archetypes be presented and considered in, future, in further work. The SSC is willing to work with the Southwest Fisheries Science Center to develop the details of these archetypes. Mm -hmm. In terms of revised methods for separating northern subpopulation of Pacific sardine, the catches of sardine off Ensenada, Mexico, attributed during the last assessment to the northern subpopulation, are large relative to the estimates of biomass for the northern subpopulation and were part of the justification for the value of sigma used to calculate the acceptable biological catch for the northern subpopulation in 2022. The CPS subcommittee reviewed an updated habitat model to optimize sampling of northern subpopulation sardines and to allocate catches and survey biomass between the northern and southern subpopulations. The modeling approach has not changed, but is now based on a wider environmental footprint, especially at the transition sea surface temperature between the two subpopulations. The value of the threshold used when applying the model was selected so that the large 2021 and 2022 catches off Ensenada are assigned to the southern subpopulation rather than the northern subpopulation. Overall, the SSC agrees that the revised approach is reasonable and an improvement to the earlier model and endorses use of the updated habitat model to apportion sardine catch and biomass estimates between subpopulations for use in assessments. The 2024 assessment should explore the sensitivity to the threshold value used to separate the northern and southern subpopulation catch and biomass. The SSC notes that the stock structure assumption of the northern subpopulation and southern subpopulation is a working hypothesis with supporting evidence. The algorithm for allocating catches and biomass to the northern and southern subpopulations should be revisited as more information is gained or if there are large changes to the abundance of the two subpopulations. And that concludes the SSC report. I'd be happy to take any questions. All right. Thanks, Will. Uh, questions on the SSC report? Corey Niles. Yeah, uh, thanks, Will. And well, good to see you here in person. Um, I guess a couple of questions. I'll, I think they're small enough. I can get them out at the same time. But kind of along, if you heard uh, Dr. Braby's um, question to Dr. Yao on how does the um, timeline look in terms of getting a, more um, more of these studies into our process where we better understand the stock structures of this of this of these population or populations? So, yeah, did you have thoughts on the timeline and how it fits fits in with our council process based on what the SSC discussed? And secondly, I think um, I'm not used to the word archetype uh, having seen this, but do you, can you can you uh, elaborate a little more on? I'm assuming you're part of the subcommittee. I think you are, if memory serves. But what what kind of archetypes? What are you talking about? Looking at other archetypes, and what are the other leading um, hypotheses, archetypes, whatever you would call them? But see if those those two questions made sense to you. I can rephrase if not. Right. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Mr. Niles, or questions. Um, so, in terms of the first question, I don't think we really discussed any kind of timeline. I mean, I think the sort of expectation with all these sorts of scientific questions is that, you know, if new evidence comes along, we'll take a look at it. Um, but I don't know that there's any timeline associated with that. Um, in terms of archetype, that wasn't entirely my word choice either. So I don't know entirely what people had in mind there, but I think it's generally just sort of what's the overall sort of narrative for what are the characteristics that define one subpopulation versus another, or even sort of the existence of subpopulations, but just sort of what is the collective set of evidence that suggests that this group of sardines that's spawning in the spring off of California that has, you know, one size distribution and seems to have, like at any given time, seems to have something of a gap in terms of you encounter sardine, continue moving north or south, you don't encounter as many sardine for a while, then you start encountering sardine again. Um, but it's sort of, 
I think the way I conceive the archetype was just sort of saying, what's the sort of collective story of like what defines this subpopulation versus that subpopulation? Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Oh, Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thanks, Will. Um, I had, I guess it's a similar question, but the language working hypothesis was a little confusing to me. Um, can you define that a little bit better for us? Um, another great question. Um, and I'm not sure that we really, as a group, specified exactly what we were meaning by working hypothesis, other than, I mean, it's sort of, there was acknowledgement that there were other hypotheses out there. This hypothesis seemed like it was the most strongly supported by the evidence available to us at this time. This hypothesis is also sort of the basis of the status quo. Um, so it's a working hypothesis, and as we say, it has supporting evidence. There are other hypotheses out there that can continue to be evaluated. Please. Thanks. Well, just a quick follow-up there. Um, so is the working hypothesis, this particular working hypothesis, essentially equivalent to best scientific information available? I think you could say that. Um, I mean, we do explicitly endorse using the updated habitat model to attribute biomass to one subpopulations versus the other for use in an assessment. Um, so I am not a lawyer, but I think you could read between the lines that if we support apportioning between the subpopulations, that means we're endorsing the having two subpopulations to apportion among. Thank you, Corey. Dr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and I'm going to keep um, I'm going to keep going this direction. Um, so, thank you for your patience and answering these questions. Um, I think I I'm still really uncertain about um, where we are with the state of the science, where we are with the projects that are underway at the Science Center, and our immediate need to make decisions, management decisions. Um, we're currently under a non-directed fishery situation. Um, and so my question to you is, um, it, can you um, help us understand what the gaps are in information in, in kind of better defining these stocks so that we have something to make actionable uh, and and how those relate to the projects that that you know about i know this isn't this isn't you per se but that you know about that are happening at the science center and how those dovetail that's the timeline that i'm you know that i'm interested in are there are there gaps that are going to be filled in the near term that are going to be uh, more actionable than than maybe what we have in front of us now, which is best defined, but not well defined is kind of how I'm summarizing it in my own mind. Thanks. I mean, for the most part, in terms of timeline or, you know, projects underway, I think Dr. Yao would be the person to ask more so than me. I mean, I do work for the Southwest Center as a salmon biologist. Um, you know, I'm in Santa Cruz, most of them are in La Jolla. Um, you know, one particular planned piece of future research that was discussed at the subcommittee meeting was further genetic studies using SNPs or single, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, I don't know what the timeline is on that, but that was discussed as a piece of information we don't have now that we would be looking at or that is being looked at, I believe, by researchers now. It probably would come back to us at some point, but I don't know that there's a timeline for that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Thank you, Will. Yep. Okay, next up will be the CPS AS report and then David Crabb. David, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'll be reading from uh, CPS AS. Um, supplemental report. 
Uh, the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel thanks the National Marine Fisheries Service staff for their CPS report. We thank NEMPS staff for its work last fall refining the habitat model used to delineate the northern subpopulation and southern subpopulation of Pacific sardines. We are optimistic that the refinement of the habitat model more accurately attributes survey estimates under the two-stock hypothesis. We are encouraged by the breadth of research currently underway that is useful for testing the currently prevailing hypothesis of two subpopulations of Pacific sardines. Uh, research on sardine, somatic growth patterns, aging, life history, and genetics. We strongly encourage NEMPS to continue to draw on all available sources of information and research to understand the Pacific sardine stock and its distribution. NEMPS continuing efforts should include not only testing the working two stock hypothesis, but also alternative hypotheses such as single population with different age and size components behaving differently with changes in temperature, ocean conditions and population. We encourage NEMPS to extend efforts to share data and collaborate with Mexican management authorities to further the understanding of the sardine stock. We fully understand the use of data from any source may be limited or results qualified by their uncertainty. We continue to be frustrated with the current management of only the northern subpopulation and the pace of progress toward a manageable fishery. Fishermen in Southern California are observing large numbers of sardine. We believe that the stock is likely adequate to support a directed fishery, as demonstrated by the presence and stability of the ongoing directed fishery in Mexico for the last several years. Yet we believe undertaking a revision to management at this time would be premature. The novel research currently underway is likely to be critical to the development of a management program that is robust to the complex dynamics of the Pacific sardine population. Uh, integrated West Coast Pelagic Survey. In recent years, portions of the CPS fleet and members of the CPS AS have collaborated with the Southwest Fishery Science Center survey team to maintain and improve the quality of the CPS acoustic trawl method survey. We appreciate the openness of the Southwest Fishery Science Center ATM team to suggested improvements in the survey and the time and the effort expanded to improve our understanding of their survey methodology. As the team moves forward to integrating the surveys for CPS and Pacific Whiting, we appreciate its commitment to ensuring that the integrity of neither survey is compromised. We can only support moving forward with this effort if the joint survey maintains the reliability of the current surveys. We support the proposal by NOAA Fisheries to hold hybrid workshop bringing in expertise from the science community and the whiting and CPS fisheries. The workshop can be used to further the dialogue between the ATM team and industry and develop a plan for advancing the integrated survey in a manner that achieves both budgetary and scientific objectives. We also ask that the ATM team move cautiously toward gear modifications. Any modification should be thoroughly trialed prior to being deployed in the survey. Industry representatives from both the CPS and Pacific Whiting Fisheries who have extensive experience should participate in all trials. We are encouraged to hear that the joint survey will be conducted on an annual basis and support maintaining this frequency. The radical swings in recruitment across years for CPS stocks require annual surveys. And that concludes the CPSAS report. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, questions on the CPSAS? Report. Corey Niles. Yeah, th uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, David. On your sentence about continuing to be frustrated with the current management of the northern sub population, I, I think I've, I can, I've been confused by this issue for a number of years. Maybe looking for you to elaborate more. Is it now I'm, I'm kind of, we have two stocks potentially is the hypothesis. One is in the FMP. The, the northern stock, the, the southern stock is not the FMP, yet the catches of the of the southern stock are basically managed in season and taken into account as if they're the north. Is, is that what you all are meaning by the frustration and only having management 
I should just say, could you please elaborate on that sentence before I get it? Get it. Sure, yes. Um, yes, you definitely hit on part of the frustration, which is the um, the situation how it's used in the stock assessment, but then um, or delineated, separated in the stock assessment, but not separated as far as management and catch. It's all attributed to the northern population, so that impacts um, the harvest. The other uh, area of frustration is the observance by industry of both, you know, volumes of harvestable sardines as well as the catch that's going on down in Mexico. Uh, so the, you know, the California boats are sort of observing this fishery going on down there, basically on kind of the same stock that they're seeing in Southern California. And, and we don't, we don't seem to have any ability to, you know, one measure that stock and then two, you know, potentially create a, a directed fishery on it. Hey, Corey, anyone else? Corey Reddings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thanks, David. This is a follow-up to the other Corey's question. Um, given what you just shared um, in the statement, it says, yeah, we believe undertaking a revision to management at this time would be premature. I wonder if you could just elaborate on that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think some of the other council members are sort of expressing the same frustration is that we just don't feel like we have all the information to, um, to you know, create that management or that, uh, you know, to estimate that biomass and then to create a directed fishery. And so that's, you know, we're asking for more work in that area so that we can, you know, that we can feel confident on a, on a directed fishery that will be sustainable for a long period of time. So it just, it doesn't, we don't have the information or the pieces in place to move forward right now, but we want to, you know, express the urgency to develop that information so that we can develop that potential fishery going forward. Thanks, David. Just one follow-up on that. Um, and this is mostly in light of what we heard from Dr. Yao uh, just a little bit ago, kind of talking about the ongoing nature of science and um, how that's coming in and how it's being used. And it didn't sound terribly different from any of our other fisheries. So um, I'm just wondering if there's like one particular piece of information that folks thought would be critical, that would be a tipping point or that would change the way that we view this potentially different stock or just looking for a little more on the discussion y'all had or the knowledge that you have. Sure. Um... I mean, I don't know if we discussed in our in our meeting what is the most critical piece of information to move forward with a with a management and, uh, but I know uh, we have had conversations, you know, of is a is single stock management more doable or than uh, a two stock hypothesis, and so. Uh, I think there's just uncertainty moving forward if it should be managed under a single stock or two stocks. And, and I know that right now the, you know, the best available information says that the two stock hypothesis is the way we should go. But, you know, with more information, with the genetic work that's being done, you know, we don't know if that's still going to be the, the, you know, the best available information or the best available hypothesis going forward. So, uh, I would think that resolving that issue would be um, really important as far as a, a future fishery on how to manage both these stocks. A trend, you know, we've got transboundary, and then we've also got the issue of identifying harvest. So we've got a mixing going on, and so that mixing is an additional problem. Well, I, I think that if you, and this is probably me speaking, not necessarily the advisory subpanel, but I think if you you know, if it is a single stock, then you're not so much worried about mixing. You're not saying, oh, were those northern stock or those southern stock here? But you are then just dealing with transboundary and how much how much stock is on each side of the border. Thank you, Corey. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, David. Good to see you here. Um, you heard my comments on gear with Dr. Yao and, and the concerns there, and I'm happy to see that it's in your report as well. My question is, do you have you heard from any of the industry folks whether they actually responded to the request for comments and engagement? And uh, that was finished, I think, March 25th or something. I think there was a, a deadline. 
Did they, did they put comments in? You know, that's a good question. And, and there may be somebody on the advisory sub panel that are, is aware of that, but I personally did not, or I'm not aware of, of comments that were made, but um, there may be others that know that. For follow up. Yeah. Please, well, I would encourage them to reach out because it's, it's important that we, as you outline, have industry input into these designs and understand the systems they're designing. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, David. Great to see you. You too. Thanks, okay. Richard. Next up will be CPS management team and uh, Dr. Spurskoff. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and Council Members. I will be reading uh, the CPSMT report on the National Marine Fisheries Service Report. Uh, so this is in regards to the presentation you just saw by Dr. Yao. So the, the Sardine Stock Structure Workshop Report. The CPSMT appreciates the center hosting the Stock Structure Workshop and publishing the revised Sardine Stock Structure Workshop Report. The results of the revised habitat model and new operational definition for the northern stock of Pacific sardine should alleviate issues related to stock structure that have been problematic in recent sardine assessments. The CPSMT recommends that this operational definition of the stock be reviewed on a regular basis as suggested by the SSC. The CPSMT recognizes the working hypothesis of two subpopulations off the west coast of North America and also looks forward to seeing the results from ongoing genetics and life history research being conducted by the center to further investigate this and other hypotheses. The CPSMT does want to note that the archetype figures provided in the workshop report were designed to capture the recent observations of sardine in the California current ecosystem and may not be representative of the full range of archetypes for the sardine population that have occurred in the past or could occur in the future. In regards to the Integrated West Coast Pelagic Survey, the CPSMT appreciates the goal of this to ensure that the integrity of both CPS and Pacific Whiting surveys are maintained. The CPSMT supports conducting the joint survey on an annual basis and supports the CPS advisory sub-panel recommendation that industry representatives with extensive experience from both the CPS and Pacific Whiting fisheries should be involved with any survey gear modifications. CPSMT was notified by Dr. Yao about proposed hybrid workshops um, planned for this month for gathering input from stakeholders on the survey design. We support these workshops being held, but encourage better communication about future workshops with more advanced notice for potential participants. Thank you. Okay. Questions on the CPS management team report? Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, thank you for that report. Um, in your first section there, um, your last sentence got my imagination going a little bit, but I was wondering if you could have uh, just it stopped <laughs> your, the, the phrase, like the, the past or could occur in the, in the future. Can you, did you all have um, discussions on what, what the stock may have done over time, like north, south? Did, can you bring that, bring that a little more detail to that one if, if possible? Right. We did not have actual discussions about what it looked like in the past. There, you know, there's papers with sediment records, these long boom and bust cycles, um, so we did just kind of want to bring it into view that Dr. Yao did say that this was the current view. And so we just kind of wanted to make everyone aware that this may not have been what was in the past or could be in the future, but we did not actually talk about anything that was in the past or what it could look like in the future. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? All right. I'll see that. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. All right. That brings us to public comment. Do we have any? Yes, I think we do. <laughs> I did my best guess. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, we have one, one, one signed up. That'd be Jeff Shester. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Good guess. Um, <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. My name is Jeff Shester. I'm representing the conservation organization Oceana. Uh, we wanted to start by um, thanking the council and NIMPS for the sardine stock structure workshop in November. Uh, I was able to attend that um, 
And uh, I just, I guess in terms of the bigger picture, the, the, the council asked uh, the workshop to provide the best available science on starting stru stock structure. And uh, you, you got a response, which is that the, the workshop included and the SNC endorsed that there are two separate stocks off the US West Coast, a Northern and a Southern stock based on the best available science right now. There are also major improvements to the habitat model that will help us better assign catch and survey biomass to the Southern versus the Northern stock. And this will help correct some of the concerns in the 22 assessments attribution of high Mexican catch and high exploitation rate um, that will now be attributed uh, to the Southern stock instead of the Northern stock. To, to, and this will result in a more robust 2024 assessment. Um, the SSC recommends um, that uh, the southern subpopulation is is not currently included in the in the in the CPS FMP, and this is kind of some of the discussion that has just been happening here. Um, and, and the SSC says that consequently the catches of the southern subpopulation are counted against the allowable catch for the northern subpopulation. And so the SSC in the statement, this is on H4, recommends the council consider an appropriate means of identifying management approaches for the southern subpopulation given its inferred presence in U.S. waters. Um, and we've also seen an increasing southern subpopulation uh, proportion in the U.S. catch. And by the, the last assessments, it looks like over 80% of the total U.S. catch is actually coming from the southern stock based on the apportionment in the, um, in the stock assessments. So following this recommendation, we wanted to kind of point you to um, the Magnuson Act of Section 302H1, which describes what you, the, the council must prepare a fishery management plan for each fishery under its authority there's a need of conservation and management and so these are for stocks that are caught in federal waters and the national national standards actually go through a whole set of criteria that the council should consider when deciding whether to include a stock in a fishery management plan so i'm just going to kind of go through these very quickly as a reminder but kind of go through what we believe is the rationale for including the southern subpopulation in the fmp um, the stock is an important component of the marine environment, certainly. So we, we know that sardines are recognized as important forage for whales, dolphins, pinnipeds, seabirds, and also essential fish habitat for um, HMS and groundfish species. Two, it's caught by the fishery, certainly. Three, um, can, the, can an FMP improve the condition of the stock? We believe yes, through annual catch limits and management measures. And we also believe that managing the Southern stock would actually help pave the way for better coordination with Mexico. Um, four, the stock is a target of a fishery. Clearly, yes, the stock is being targeted by the live bait fishery. Um, five, the stock is important to commercial, recreational, or subsistence users. Yes, there's a commercial fishery for live bait. There could also be a directed commercial fishery for the major uh, CPS fishery, as well as the recreational fishery. We know that the live bait fishery is very important for that too. Uh, Six, the, rep, the fishery is important to the nation or to the regional economy. Um, certainly, we know that the live bait fishery is very important. Actually, Amendment 17 did a lot of economic analysis showing the importance of this fishery. Um, seven, uh, th this could help, an FMP could help resolve competing interests and conflicts among user groups. Um, we believe, yes, we, we believe there's a need to uh, protect the forage uh, base there in Southern California and uh, better attribute the catch between live bait and commercial fishing. Um, it, some number eight is the economic condition. Can the FMP produce a more efficient utilization? Well, we believe if there was a catch limit that was specific to the Southern stock, it would actually allow more efficient harvest of that subpopulation that wouldn't have to be conflated by using the Northern subpopulation as a justification to fish the, the Southern subpopulation. Um, nine, is there a developing fishery? No, we don't think so. It's already developed. Uh, and 10, is the fishery adequately managed by the states? And right now there is no state management that we're aware of for the Southern, Southern, uh, Southern sardine population. Um, so going through these, uh, clearly we believe there is a management need and, and, and we also are seeing that in light of climate change, we should be expecting the Southern subpopulation to be more in our waters as we see this Northern movement of these sardine uh, subpopulations. And so we, we would suggest that right now, we're not saying go and start an FMP amendment tomorrow on this. What we are asking for is to ask 
the SSC and the Southwest Science Center and your management team to lay out options for what managing the sub southern subpopulation would look like consistent with the SSC recommendations. Look at the trade-offs. Maybe what, what if we manage it all as one stock? What if we manage it as two stocks? Are there ways to do that hybrids? Can we look at the trade-offs there and lay out what information would be necessary under each of those approaches to actually realign the science and the management of the stock? You're currently doing this also for ground fish, right? now in terms of the the stock definitions and revisiting those in the fmp we believe now could be a good time and ob obviously we'll the stock understanding will change over time but we've had this same uh, hypothesis for you know since the beginning of the fmp that there was two stocks and so um, we believe that until something changes let's work on what the science is telling us um, and then just noting in terms of future science after the um the, the, the stock workshop, the SSC said the next step would be to actually go and revisit the uh, EMSY, the harvest rate for the northern subpopulation. So I wanted to talk about this under this item as well, because we do believe it should be the next step following the, the, the sardine stock structure workshop. The SSC noted last year and this year that since the harvest control rule changed in 2013, this EMSY uh, is close to the upper end of the range, despite evidence of low productivity and abundance since that time. So essentially, the stock is very low uh, in terms of its productivity, yet we're using a harvest rate based on a very high productivity stock. So we're overshooting the overfishing limit by doing that. Um, NIMS published the analysis showing that the Cal Coffee Index was, um, was not indicating productivity in 2017 uh, and published that in 2019. And the rebuilding plan that this council adopted did show that an inflated catching at the inflated EMSY level of over 20% um, results in catch limits that will not rebuild the stock under the current low productivity state. Yet, if we lowered that EMSY to around a 5% rate, rebuilding would occur. And uh, the SSC uh, also is saying now this meeting that there continues to be evidence that the adopted relationship between sardine productivity and ocean temperatures is not currently valid. And, and also pointed out that the Cal Coffee survey isn't even occurring in the same place where we're, we're seeing most of the northern subpopulation and where that subpopulation spawns. So we wanted to support the SSC recommendation to direct uh, the, the, the CPS subcommittee of the SSC and the Science Center to conduct uh, the next workshop to actually reevaluate EMSY so that it reflects the current productivity and stock structure as informed by the previous workshop. Um, and we note that the, uh, Southwest Fisheries Science Center scientists have already suggested that the best way to do this would be to use recent assessments and survey results to infer recent actual recruitment that's happened rather than using some environmental predictor. But we think that, we, that a workshop could look at those various options and come up with the best one reflecting the current productivity. And we believe that this should happen this year so that it can inform the 2024 specifications under the upcoming stock assessment. So these, these requests follow the advice of your scientists um, wanted to add and manage the southern subpopulation uh, in the management in the CPS FMP and do a workshop this year to produce an updated EMSY. And then lastly, just in terms of the NIMS regulatory update, um, we did have a concern on anchovy, the central subpopulation. Um, as, as you all know, NIMS uh, did not implement new specifications for the central subpopulation of northern anchovy by the start of the fishing season as per the Council Operating Procedure 9 schedule, which states that um, the, the Council basically does specs in June, and then the Department of Commerce is responsible for putting in the specs prior to the start of the next fishing season. That would have, that would have been before January 1st of 2023. Here we are, it's, it's April, we haven't even seen a proposed rule yet. Um, we do believe that um, it is important for the council to hold NIMS accountable to its commitments and, uh, and management schedule and to prioritize making sure that we stay on track for these important timelines. So um, we, we, we are concerned that the COP is not being followed uh, in terms of that schedule. And we did wanna reiterate the request to add anchovy harvest control rule in the FMP. Um, and then lastly, we, we did want to just on the point of the science and the ATM survey, we do support the, the combined uh, CPS Hague trawl survey. Uh, we, we believe it will be better result in better science and consistency and will increase the likelihood of annual surveys 
and we we are we are convinced that this will be a helpful uh, new data stream that can be improved over time, and we hope that to see this uh, go at the full scale of the full southern or the full uh, CPS stocks down into Mexico as well. So thank you again for our um, uh, considering our request to help improve coastal pelagic species management under this item. Thanks. All right, thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff on his testimony. Oh, Corey Niles. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jeff. You had I think, three issues there. On the, my mind is on the on the first one. On, on your second one, I'm mean, yeah. I still think that we need a place other than the NIMS report at some point to talk about um, various science needs for CPS and and how we prioritize those. Kind of like we do for ground fish. So hearing you there, but mine's kind of fixated on this stock structure. Um, so I'm just going to maybe do a quick summary of where my mind is and see if you have any difference is with it um, on sardine. We, there's a, we've always the science has told us there are two stocks, northern and southern. The northern, at one point in time, well before um, my the, the council said the northern stock needed was in conservation of management. Only a portion of that is really in U.S. waters. That's where the distribution parameter comes from. The southern stock, not in conservation, not Indian conservation and management. Now, what we're seeing is, you know, it's not just the distribution is about the northern stock, or maybe I've got that wrong. But now, yeah, I was really surprised to see when when we were talking about southern stock coming into Southern California. You know, I haven't lived in in Southern California since I was, uh, you know, 20 years old. But Southern California to me stops somewhere near Santa Barbara and, and Sardine were uh, in this model up way, way past that into Monterey Bay and North. So is so that's a big change that on that question of whether the Southern substock is in need of conservation and management raises that question. Is that, is, am I on the same, am I following your argument uh, or am I, are, are there differences in, in what I just articulated and, and what you're seeing? Um. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and Mr. Niles for the question. Um, uh, y yes, the, the, that uh, summary, I think, is consistent with what we've seen and, and our, our, I guess, understanding of the science on this is that, especially in the last few years, I think there's been a growing scientific uh, recognition and additional evidence that has supported the idea that you know, in, in terms of the two stock understanding that the southern subpopulation is in Southern California for a growing um, you know, portion of the year. And I, I believe we've even seen evidence in some of the, I guess, that latest archetype or, or, or narrative describes that even year round, there are uh, southern uh, subpopulation sardines in the Southern California bite area. And so um, I think, you know, in particular, because, for example, now that as a result of that stock structure workshop, all that high level of catch that was resulting in an exploitation rate of like 40% for the northern subpopulation, we're now going to attribute that to catch on the southern subpopulation. So, in fact, that means there's a pretty significant um, level of catch uh, on the southern subpopulation. Clearly, we don't necessarily have a full stock estimate of what the southern subpopulation contains. There, there are some estimates that we have in the um, from the trawl survey. We saw the draft 2022 trawl survey estimates that basically have an estimate for the southern subpopulation in U.S. waters, and I think right now it's larger than what was estimated for the northern, and the catch is certainly a, a much greater percentage as well for the southern. So um, I think that's, you know, based on some of that more recent evidence, we believe that now there is a conservation and management need. There may have been for quite some time, but it's not, it hasn't been as apparent as it is now. Okay, hey, Corey, what else? The other Corey. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Jeff, thanks for your input. Um, I think this was your point number three. Uh, at the end, you briefly met, mentioned that the, the new joint survey could actually be better. And I'm curious if you have anything to add um, beyond what we heard from Dr. Yao today already, um, why you think that is. Um, be good to know. Thanks. Um. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and, and Ms. Ridings for the question. Yeah, I, I think certainly we would not say that there shouldn't be uh, work and thought put into making sure that the, the techniques for the new survey are 
are going to be robust and maintain the time series we have. But we are aware that they, there have been joint CPS Hake surveys in the past that have produced adequate and I think robust estimates for both whiting and uh, the CPS uh, assemblage. So this isn't the first time this has happened. Um, in speaking with some of the the, uh, the, the acoustic survey experts, uh, uh, for example, like Dr. Diemer from NIMS and, and others, um, we, we are convinced that they, they do have the methods and by combining resources into a, a single survey that will provide for greater consistency, a higher likelihood that we're going to use the limited resources will, will enable a survey to happen every year and that by, by combining these efforts, we can get a, a single survey that potentially is more robust and has advantages and can improve um, over, over the recent surveys while still maintaining the ability to provide a consistent time series for both the CPS assemblage as well as the, the whiting. So that's, that's our understanding. Obviously, that's not going to happen just automatically. It will take some work, but we are convinced that this is an improvement and we're, we're, we're confident that the, the scientific staff will be able to produce Produce robust surveys for both. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. All right, that takes care of uh, public comment. And um, I would like to say that if we had a word for the day, I think it would be uh, archetype. I believe that's what it would be. <laughs> which, uh, if you're confused, it's a, uh, a very typical example of a certain person or thing. Just to make sure everybody's key on that. So. Okay, and with that, I'll open the floor for discussion and uh, Brianna Brady. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I just wanted to say thank you to the Southwest Fisheries Science Center for holding the starting workshop in November and for bringing forward a new fix to the habitat model. And then also to express appreciation to the SSC for noting that the revised approach is reasonable and an improvement to the earlier model. And I'm looking forward to hopefully having some of the major uncertainty be removed from the next stock assessment. So thanks again. Thank you, Brianna. Anyone else? Corey Dallas? Um, I might have a couple of thoughts here, but just, I know Josh was having problems with his computer at the, at the start. And, um, I get, uh, and I'm probably um, gonna get wrong exactly what Jeff just raised to our uh, attention here on the anchovy rule and it not being um, in place according to our COPs, but I didn't, I'm not seeing much explanation um, in the report. Just wanted to know if you had any response to that, or I know there, um, this was the first time I think we have been using those COPs and um, just, just if you had, a, if you had an explanation um, to that response would, would be appreciated. the chair vice chair uh thank you for the question corey um i'm gonna use that w word that you often hear from nymph staff in this chair of workload unfortunately um we've been focused on some of the other amendments assisting sort of in the background and getting amendment 21 which you're gonna be looking at tomorrow as well as getting amendment 20 in place um we've also been continually working on defense litigation for the sardine re rebuilding plan that takes a fair amount of staff time and has certain deadlines that we have to meet. Um, and there was some, even though we were following along, assisting in the development of that COP and the, the framework, there were some nuances in the implement, implementation of that action that we, we've been working on, but we feel like we're ready. And I expect a proposed rule within the next two months or so. So it has not fallen off our radar. It's been there in the queue. Uh, thankfully, the ACL that the regulation will put in place of 25,000 metric tons is currently in place in regulation. So um, the fishery is operating at the same ACL that would be in place once the new regulation is in place. Hopefully that helps. Okay, thanks Josh. Anyone else? Dr. Brady. Thank you. Um, just just a couple of thoughts. I appreciate the discussion today. Um, and uh, obviously, we have more agenda items that we'll come back to this, this agenda item on. Um, that was terrible syntax, sorry. Um, but I, my sense 
leaving this discussion and update is that we seem to be on the right track in kind of setting up uh, survey design, setting up uh, projects to better inform the council management in the future. And, and there are some needs or uh, flags that have been expressed around the table in terms of making sure that this is best available science and making sure to work with industry on survey design and comparing against past survey designs to make sure they're comparable. And that was all really good, good, good discussion. I'm glad that we had those questions and those answers. Um, so uh, I, I think with that in mind, um, some additional work uh, in the future makes sense, including, you know, thinking more about evaluating the temperature productivity relationship uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm not sure on the timeline of that, but uh, I'll just say that I think in the current uh, low directed uh, fishery situation that we're in, uh, particularly on sardine, that I think uh, we're in a, in a good place to invest in more learning and bring more information to the table. So I just uh, wanted to share that before we move on to our next agenda items. So thanks. Thanks, Gordon. Anyone else? Corey. Yeah, quickly, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and just following on part of what Karen said, I do, I hope, and maybe for council staff, NIMPS, to think on of um, where do we have these talks about the science priorities. I'll, I'll, I echo Brianna's thanks to all the Science Center and all the efforts they did in the workshop, and we are pushing uh, for more than they are able to take on, and so you, you need a question about, you know, setting priorities and the SSC, the AS, the public to be able to weigh into us in, in a in a measured fashion. So I'm hoping we can find a way to do that. Yeah, and I think maybe we'll get start to get into it more tomorrow, as as uh, Karen also alluded to. But this question about um, the, the range of the southern substock and how it's deducted from from the northern substock, the catches and, and uh, all that. I think that. It does need to be talked about over time, and we, science will be coming in at you know some unknown timeline. But yeah, just those are I think those are some key questions. As, as Jeff said, we are taking them on a ground fish. They're raising some of the same questions um, here. I understand that I think the history of, of the FMP, and there has been a determination that the southern stop talk substock does not belong in the FMP, and in our understanding is maybe. Um, opening that question again and hit the question to I me mean, is where do we do that and, and on what timeline and but yeah may, uh, maybe we'll get more into that tomorrow uh, workload planning but yeah we will appreciate all the all the thoughts um, that were, were put into the NIMS report today okay thank you Corey Bob Dooley thank you Mr. Vice Chair <clears throat> following up on Karen's comments I hope that uh, as we go forward, I really do appreciate the the openness that's been presented today in, in collaborating on the uh, with industry on this survey design, the integrated survey. But I would hope that it's not just a listening session or a, a check in and then go forward from there without industry. I think this is a very important <clears throat> issue, and I think that uh, it it you know it it would warrant check-ins and understanding as they go forward and make decisions on the changes they're going to make that they're informed by that fishermen have a chance to the industry has a chance to weigh in on that and understand what they're doing i think it leads to better trust in the end of the of the end product and i think there's a lot of expertise there that that is that is really needed as we make this big change so i hope it's not just a one-time check-in and that we follow it up all the way to the end and and continue with that. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right. See other hands. Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just wanted to express my concern based on what we've been talking about today and seeing today that there seems to be a lot of evidence that there is a need for conservation and management 
of the southern subpopulation. Um, I'm opening that question. I, I don't want to sort of put NIMS or GC on the spot, but I would be curious if they have a response now or curious, I think, to what other Corey just mentioned about um, when and where to have this conversation. Um, I think, you know, we, we heard a little bit today about allowing access at some point and how we do that. Um, also accounting for climate change, um, anticipate, anticipating a potential northward shift of maybe both of these stocks. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, Josh? Actually for NIMS to answer that question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Corey, um, I don't know if I have a direct answer. I think it's in, you know, it's a an open question. That's a question you guys have been dealing with in ground fish. I think uh, Dr. Shester read the list of factors that can be reviewed. No, not one of those factors has to be the one factor. Um, I do think in this case and what we're seeing currently without not looking into the future um, is the amount and type of catch we're seeing on, on a stock and whether or not that is necessarily impacting or if we think changing that level would somehow help the stock, um, a stock that we don't really have a good handle on or exceed, at least right now, presume is at fairly high levels given some of the catch that's occurring in, in Mexico. So whether or not the 1,500 tons we're taking at the moment dictates the need for conservation management, I think that'd be a conversation the council can have. Um, and if I can, well, I'm oh, sorry, Corey, you may have a follow up. Thanks, Josh. Okay. Dr. Brady. Thanks. And th thanks, Corey, for asking that question. Um, and, you know, the way the way that I'm thinking about this is that we're we're actually in a good situation because we have a larger population of sardine in the south moving north with climate change and pushing a more but less populated stock north. And so the fishing that's occurring is not only limited, but it's being replaced by this larger stock. And, and so I feel like we, we have that evidence and we have um, some need for uh, additional clarity on the definition of where those stocks stop, start and stop um, and how to define those and have time to, to do that. And I'm, I'm curious about council discussion on whether that is um, different from other council members, but that's, that's why I, I feel like I have some confidence in um, allowing for some time on some of these questions rather than jumping to an urgent conservation and management action that I think is less, less urgent than is being portrayed. Hey, Gordon, good point. Anyone else? Okay, Josh. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just wanted to respond to a little bit more of some of the comments made by Mr. Niles and Ms. Braby earlier before the question on conservation management. Um, and not to speak fully for the Science Center, but the, the, the charge for the stock structure workshop was really the immediate needs. And the immediate needs was to produce the best possible assessment for the Northern stock in 2024. And it appears that that workshop will in fact do that. It's resolving a lot of the uncertainties in that. Um, but as you saw in, in Dr. Yao's slides, that does not mean we're not looking towards the future also, although we are focused on the present, trying to assess the stock currently that is managed by the, the FMP and the council and the agency. Um, I see this really tied into a lot of the conversations we had in the um, Climate and Communities Initiative, making sure as we move forward, talking about CPS management, sardine management, not maybe a specific action, but ensuring when we do take actions, we're cognizant of this potential, this potential change in the past archetype, to use our word of the day again, and a potential future one. Um, because it's based on the updated model over the last 20 years, it's really only been three years we've seen any sort of level of southern stock in U.S. waters. Um, is that a trend? Is that the future? I think that's still some questions to be answered, but I think being cognizant of that and making sure we don't um, have a blind eye to that is going to be important and something that the agency is actively thinking about and considering. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you, Josh. All right. Jesse, I think we've had good discussion, which is what we need to have here. Pretty thorough. Um, how are we doing? Mr. Chair, or uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I completely agree. I think you guys had a good conversation around the reports in front of you, and I expect we'll continue some of this discussion tomorrow under agenda item H4. Okay, wonderful. Um, we had a short, short intermission there, which is, but besides that, we've been out a long time. So we're going to take a break here. So um, we have two items still to do today. Um, we, we believe E3 is going to be at the end of the day. Uh, so let's break till um, 3.30.
Okay, if we could take our seats. All right. Okay. Welcome back. And uh, with that, I'll look to Jesse to start us off on um, H2. Jesse. Yes, this is agenda item H2, EFPs for 23-24 final action. The CPS MP allows for EFPs to be considered uh, to be conducted under a permit issued by the National Marine Fishery Service. And um, COP 23 describes that process, which includes initial consideration in November and final action scheduled for um, this April meeting. So in November, three EFP notices of intent were submitted and were approved for considerations for pr full proposals at this meeting. If approved, the allowed take of Pacific sardines under these EFPs would be considered along with the management measures for the 23-24 um, sardine management measures, which is tomorrow's item H4. The proposals from the California Wet Fish Producers Association are included as attachments one and two. Over the winter, it was determined that the activities proposed under the West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group uh, EFP fall under the scientific research permit for survey activities performed by the Southwest Fishery Science Center, and therefore an EFP is not needed. A letter from the WCPCG is included in the materials um, for a letter as attachment three for removing their EFP for consideration for 23-24. So I spoke to your reference materials that were in your advanced briefing book. In addition, there are two statements from the CPS MT and the CPSAS. Your council action for today is to adopt final EFP recommendations for 23-24, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Questions uh, on Jesse's overview? All right, I'm not seeing any. Okay, with that. We'll go to the um, CPS management team report. And Trung uh, Nguyen. Uh, thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and Council Members. My name is Trung Nguyen, and I will be reading the supplemental CPS MT report on exempted, exempted fishing permits for 2023 and 2000, to 2024. The Coastal Spe Pelagic Species Management Team revealed two proposals for exempted, exempted fishing permits for the, from the California Wet Fish Producers, Producers Association. The CPS MT sees value in the data collected from these EFPs for use in stock assessments and recommends council endorse both EFP applications. The CPS MT acknowledges that the West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group has withdrawn their EFP requests, as this work now falls under the scientific research permit for the survey, survey activities performed by the South, Southwest Fisheries Science Center and appreciates that it will continue to help inform management. Right, thank you, Trung. Uh -huh. Questions on the CPS management team report? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. The next up is the CPS AS. And Steve Crook. Steve, welcome. Microphone. That that green light's gotta be on. Uh, oh, we turned it off. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I won't go through the first part. I'll be reading to you from agenda item H2A, supplemental CPS report. Uh, 
It's entitled Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Exempted Fishing Permits for 2023-24 Final Action. The Coastal Plastic Species Advisory Subpanel discussed the requests for the two exempted fishing permits by the California Wet Fish Producers Association in cooperation with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. The collaborative projects intend to address the continuing need for data, including alternative biological sampling and collection by per se net to assess CPS biomass inshore or current National Oceanographic and, and, and Atmospheric Administration Acoustical Survey trawls. The CWPA is working collaboratively with NIMP Southwest Fishery Science Center in an effort to improve survey data collection that will lead to better informed stock assessments and fisheries management. One survey will focus on confirming biological composition and school size of CPS estimated by acoustic surveys and spotter planes. In addition, the second survey will collect biological data, especially fisheries age structure data. Data from the CWPA biological sampling EFP was used in the stock assessment model for the first time since the directed fishery closed in 2015. Approving the two EFPs will allow the continuation of biological data stream for sardines started in 2018 in California. Therefore, the CPS strongly urges the council to approve the final EFP proposal as submitted. And if there are any questions, Mark Fina is here to answer them on the two EFPs, so. All right, thank you, Steve. Questions on the um, CPS AS report? I think you're good, thank you. All right, that takes us um, to the public comment stage here. I believe we have two. All right. <clears throat> First up would be uh, Mark Fina, followed by uh, Jeff Schester. Mark, welcome. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Mark Fina from the CWPA. Um, so we were the ones who submitted both these EFP applications. And as Steve said, I'm here to answer questions. I guess the couple of things I'll point out to start with are that um, in the first EFP on the point sets, we've reduced the ask from 300 metric tons, which was approved last year down to 150 metric tons. The reason for that decrease is that there's increased emphasis on anchovy sets or mixed sets as opposed to sardine sets because they feel they've already collected um, most of the sardine sets they need. There's still maybe a few as they go, but the um, they feel like they have the uh, curve for the sardine sets uh, about where they need it to be. Uh, the second point I'll make is that with respect to the second EFP, the one for collecting uh, data that mimics the fishery dependent data for use in the assessment, we uh, have uh, agreed with our fleet and the processors to reduce the use from or the targeted amount on any trip from uh, 17 tons down to 10 tons uh, for any trip that we can get independent funding for. And we have independent funding right now for about 10 trips uh, into next year. We already are starting to do this currently um, in the, under the current EFP, which runs until June. And then we'll continue to do it with probably hopefully about 10 or 11 sets um, into next year it, with the funding we currently have. If we have other funding that's supporting research, then we'll continue that process as we go. But I just wanted to let you know that, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Um, last thing, just sorry. Uh, we still have kept our ask at 570, just because um, we're not certain what's going to happen when they go out. Uh, it will likely won't hit 570. We haven't hit, come close to 570 in the past. Um, we are a little more systematic in the way we're doing it right now because we're doing the collection not only for the directed fishery, um, the fishery dependent data, but secondarily we're using the data as part of the SK grant that we have that's looking at kind of the stock dynamics and distribution uh, that's described in the EFP application. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mark. Uh, questions for Mark on his testimony? Maria. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I just wanted to clarify. I thought it was a request for 520 metric tons. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> it is. It helps if I look in the right one. Yeah, it's 520. I'm sorry. Thanks. Thank you, Brianna. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, Mark. Thanks. Okay, next up will be uh, Jeff Shester. Welcome back, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, again, my name is Jeff Shester from Oceana. Um, we just wanted to make a couple comments reiterating previous points we made about the on the, the EFPs the, the, that are um, proposing to catch sardines. Um, our, our concern is that the, sub, the northern subpopulation of the sardine um, is currently overfished, and we believe that the, the nymphs and the council have a responsibility to minimize fishing mortality and rebuild uh, this stock. Um, we are concerned with the overall EFP amounts, even though they fit under the ACL, because we, we are concerned that the overfishing limits, as indicated by the SSC and H4, are inflated due to the EMSY being set too high. Um, so that we, we hope to see a workshop on that, of course, but um, we're concerned that, that because of that, the OFL is failing to prevent overfishing and that the, and the ACLs are set too high and we would like to see stronger limits on the EFPs. We did want to point out that um, over the last two years, according to the CDFW report, that uh, the EFP catch hasn't uh, approached the, the limits that, that have been set for the EFPs. Um, in uh, last season, only 327 of the, of the 920 tons was, was actually caught. And so far this season, only 146. Um, those are numbers to date from the C CDFW report. So um, we don't believe that the, that entire high level of catch uh, is, uh, is needed. And it, it sends kind of the wrong signal that we're not actually going to be constraining these EFPs to just the amount that's needed to, to get the science. So we did want to uh, appreciate the 50% reduction in the aerial survey EFP from 300 to 150 metric tons uh, that still allows the fishery to, to get that same calibration for the aerial surveys. And we appreciate the shift to anchovy uh, in doing that. So um, I think at least as far as that EFP, we didn't have any concern with the 150 tons as proposed and really wanted to thank the CWPA for reducing that request. Uh, we do remain concerned with the biological sampling proposal of 520 metric tons. Uh, we note that most of this is actually going to compensate fishermen for their time, not actually for using those sardines in research. Uh, we raised this point in November and did have some discussions. We're glad to hear um, what Mr. Fina just, just remarked about the ability for, at least on some of those sets, to use funding to reduce the amount of catch per set so that they're still able to get the same biological data while reducing, it sounded like, by around a third the actual catch. Um, and uh, so we at this point we are concerned about the 520 but um i think similar to last year what we're going to recommend is that the council at least under this agenda item uh, approves both of the efps but actually waits on deciding the allocation amount to the efps until uh after the the acl has been determined for this stock so that you can kind of figure out how to allocate to the efps versus the other uh sectors of the fishery um as as, as per what was done last year so um, again, we, we we are indicating that our position has changed. We're not opposing these EFPs, even though we are concerned about the take of sardines. We are supportive of them, but we just want to see a better balance achieved and a more reasonable uh, limits that actually constrain these EFPs to really just the minimum sardine necessary to get that science to keep those data streams going. Thank you very much for the opportunity to make comment. Thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff on this testimony? Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair and Jeff. Um, maybe the question for tomorrow's item, but that's the, the concern. Um, you know, we're basically we're we're uh, the, the OFL being too lower than you think it should be, or I probably have that backwards. You know what I mean? Yes, but the um, but a, a large portion of the catch is actually coming from a different from the southern stock. So, can you um, 
in, in, at large, the, the live bait fishery, for example, could, could be coming from a large part from that southern stock. So we would actually be well below the OFO, whatever it was. But can you, uh, you get what I'm saying? And can you explain your, your thinking there? Um, yeah, th thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair and Mr. Niles for the question. Um, yeah, I, th I think what we're seeing now is there's there's certain elements of the current sardine situation that are kind of bi are biasing this thing in, in either direction. So we think that the, the EMSY is biasing the overfishing level up. But of course, that may be offset by the fact that some of that catch is coming from the southern subpopulation. And that's precisely the reason why we have been asking for kind of a more rational approach to managing and setting catch limits for both populations respectively that would help kind of dif differentiate those two things but I think the the part of the idea for these EFPs specifically is that the EFPs are intended to at least do, do uh, a significant portion of that fishing on the northern subpopulation and so we believe that is why that's relevant and just because there is sort of a bias in there we don't believe that that um, sort of justifies setting a, a catch limit that's 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 more than is needed for uh, for the stock given that it's overfished condition. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Corey. Anyone else? All right, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, that concludes public comment. It takes us to council action, which is to adopt final EFP recommendations for 23-24. And so with that, I'll open the floor for discussion. Brianna? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I um, just wanted to briefly say thanks to CWPA and the West Coast uh, Pelagic Group for their continued contributions to collecting data for use in the sardine stock assessment, and also that I support adopting the CWPA EFPs for the upcoming season. Thanks. Thank you, Brianna. Okay, anyone else? Take a motion, Rihanna. Thank you. Um, Sandra, may I please have the motion displayed? I move the council adopt the exempted fishing permit proposals and agenda item H2 and attachments one and two for consideration of harvest amounts under agenda item E3. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, thank you. Okay, looking for a second. Second by Bob Dooley. Thank you, Bob. Please speak to your motion. Thanks. Um, just briefly that these EFPs provide information for the sardine stock assessment by verifying the tonnage estimates that are associated with near shore aerial surveys and also maintaining the time series of fishery dependent data. Um, this collaborative effort by industry fosters participation in collecting the science used in the assessments and benefits our management process in general. So, thanks. Thank you, Brianna. Okay. Discussion of the motion or questions for the motion maker? Corey? Um, yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Thanks for the motion, Brianna. Uh, supportive. Um, also want to you know, thank NIMS and, and the West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group for moving that effort into the scientific permit. That makes a lot of sense, and we're supportive of that. And, and very, you know, it's uh, um, as we said in the past years, really appreciate the uh, cooperative research effort going on there. Yeah, on the on the amounts on the EFP. I think maybe tomorrow we'll. It'll, it'll might make more sense, but to my, my, I think what, the, what they're asking for sounds reasonable, um, especially they're unlikely to take, but yeah, low probability of taking um, that 520. I probably got the number wrong there, but, and, and, but yeah, I think um, supportive don't have much more to add than Brianna, and we'll have a look at the, uh, the catches in total tomorrow under H4, I think it is. Um. It's come to our attention that um, we think it's the item H4 instead of E3. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, how do you want to handle that? Is that? I can rescind it. A minute. Up. Oh. Uh, Car. Mr. Vice Chair, I'd be happy to offer a friendly amendment. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> I'd like to change agenda item E3 in the motion to reflect that it is actually H4. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. For a second, seconded by Krista Vincent. Thank you. 
I guess we don't need to necessarily speak to it since we know what it is. So, all right. Um, no discussion needed. Oh, yeah. We got a cover ball. <laughs> uh, so actually, yeah. Confusing me here. Uh, okay. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those no. Abstentions. Okay. Motion passes unanimously, and now we're now we're back and all good here. So. Uh, with the amended motion. So, okay, any discussion on the amended motion? All right, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Abstentions? Okay, motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Jesse, how are we doing? I don't know if you beat the record for. Todd's item last time around, but we got pretty close. So, uh, <laughs> but you have uh, adopted the two EFPs for consideration um, under agenda item H4. So we will discuss those amounts tomorrow. Very good. Okay. Well, with that, um, that'll close out this agenda item, as Jesse indicated, and I will pass the gavel back to Chair Grolnick. And I'll give the gavel to uh, Vice Chair Hassamer, who has some news. All right, thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Um, we are coming back to agenda item E3, which we left open yesterday. And I'm gonna look around the table, unless there is any new information, we would close that agenda item for today. Uh, oh. Excuse me, pause for one moment. I'm sorry, we are not going to close that agenda item out right now. We are going to take a break until 5 p.m. That correct? Yes. We will resume our session at 5 p.m. with agenda item E3. And I would say if they're not ready at 5, we would close out. <laughs> and so we are just on a pause right now, a break until 5 p.m. The recording has stopped.
the Paul Blake, Mark. Three for Paul Blake. Yeah, somebody. <laughs> This meeting is being recorded. Yeah, I want to welcome everyone back here for agenda item E3. And oops, um, the Clarify, clarify council direction on 2023 management measures. Since we left this yesterday, there was a new report that had been put in the briefing book, agenda item E3A, supplemental STT report two. Because we have a new report, we will be hearing about and there will be some discussion. The public comment opportunity has been reopened. So if anybody wants in the public wants to make comments, that portal is open. Um, you can sign up while it's open. And with that, I will ask Dr. O'Farrell to come up to the table and present the SDT report to, to us. Dr. O'Farrell, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, um, Council Members. I'll be referring to agenda item E3A, Supplemental STT Report 2. And I think I'll just cut to the chase of the, um, anal the analysis of uh, the um, management measures put in place yesterday. I'm going to <clears throat> table five on page 16. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I missed one page, on page 15. Um, there are still a number of um, bolded values in uh, Puget Sound um, um, column there. Um, that uh, There has been some movement and, and, uh, and work continues there is my understanding. Moving to the next page, um, for Lower Columbia River Natural Tules, the uh, um, exploitation rate is 38.7% uh, currently. Continuing down, on page 18, um, Skagit Coho uh, exceeds the 35% total exploitation rate ceiling at this time. And I believe that is all the bolded values that I um, wanted to bring to the council's attention. Um, and the remaining tables are um, updated as um, the changes were made and um, are available um, table seven uh, and the uh, and the appendix tables are available in the back of this package. I can try to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Are there questions for Dr. O'Farrell on the SDT report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, earlier under this agenda item, I had a question for you on table seven, page 21. Uh, with regard to Sunk Coho. And my question at the time was uh, surrounding the 
recreational and troll inputs, um, those reflect the fishery alternatives that we have in this package. And I was noting that uh, other than um, fall fisheries, there's no Chinook opportunity south of Falcon. Um, and I had asked if these rates might appear differently if we had both coho and Chinook fisheries uh, slated. And I was wondering if maybe you can answer the question now. I think you had indicated you'd go back and check in. So I was wondering if you can respond. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, Ms. Ms. Remco. Um, let me just make sure I fully understand. Um, there are some coho only fisheries pre September one in Oregon. And if I understood it correctly, the question is if there was Chinook opportunity during those coho fisheries, those fisheries were co that are now coho only fisheries, would that change the impacts? The answer is no on that. Um, we would not expect a change in effort and therefore a change in impacts. <clears throat> Marcy, follow up. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, can you remind me um, if these exploitation rates shown for Trinity for ocean fisheries um, reflect impacts that are expected to be be accrued in fall fisheries as well? or are these just pre-September 1 fisheries? I'd like to double check on that one. Um, through the fall? Yeah. Through October? Through December. Through December. Thanks. So I, I'm hearing that uh, these impacts are through the end of the year. So there's not the cutoff that we have for the California models that at the end of September. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So just to clarify that there won't be credit card fisheries or credit card impacts that would accrue next season from these, from fall fisheries. This is a total 2023 look at the impacts for what's scheduled. Yes, for, for, Coho for Saint Coho. That's right. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any further questions for Dr. O'Farrell on the STT report? And I don't see any, so thank you. Thank you. And uh, that completes our reports. I'm gonna look, I don't see any signups, but just to make sure there are no public comment signups that will take us into our council discussion guidance and direction so before i look for guidance is there any further discussion on this item i'm not seeing hands for discussion any further guidance to provide kyle addicts thank you vice chair hassamer and thanks to the council for leaving this item open yesterday and for your patience today, I thought it was a critical critical step to bring some more North of Falcon guidance to position us to finish up our inside fishery planning over the next couple of days. I'm not, not seeing it on the screen, there we go. So my guidance is um, in reference to agenda item E3A supplemental STT report two dated April 4th, 2023. Implement the following changes for table one, adjust the overall non-Indian TACs to 78,000 Chinook and adjust and 190,000 marked coho and adjust all corresponding allocations, guidelines and caps accordingly. Thank you. And uh, as usual, I will just look to Dr. O'Farrell, the SDT, and make sure that's clear and there's no questions. We're good with that. Um, further guidance? Joe Oatman. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, so, uh, appropriate, I'll go ahead and just read uh, the guidance that I have. Uh, so, I do have guidance on the Treaty Troll Salmon Management Measures for STT analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, this would be for Table 3 of the Supplemental STT Report 2, dated April 4, 2023, and it would uh, be as follows. Uh, 45,000 Chinook and 57,000 Coho. Uh, the alternative consists of a May 1 to June 30 Chinook directed fishery and, and a July 1 to September 15 all species fishery. Uh, the Chinook quota should be evenly split between two time periods. Okay, thank you, Joe. And I'm gonna again look to Dr. O'Farrell and. We're good on that guidance. And anything else on this item beyond that guidance? I don't see any, so Robin, we'll turn to you. Does that complete our work on E3? It does, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, the STT has guidance and they'll run a second round of analysis and uh, they're scheduled to come back to the council uh, tomorrow morning so and yes that concludes your work with that i will close this agenda item and pass the gavel to our chair for any closing uh, comments or announcements all right thank you very much vice chair hasmer good job uh council getting through today's agenda and completing one from yesterday before we break i'll ask executive director merrick burden for any uh comments or predictions Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I do have comments and predictions, but no, no announcements, as the question usually is. Uh, let's see. So as uh, Robin indicated, tomorrow we were scheduled to pick up E9 or E8, I'm sorry, which is further direction on 2023 management measures. Uh, given the action here this afternoon, I, I don't think that makes sense. And we should delay till the time as they are ready. And so I would advise the council pick up E9 first thing tomorrow morning, which is the Klamath Dam removal update. Robin? Thanks, sorry to interrupt, but I uh, did want to just make a note that uh, Jim Simade is our person that's going to be presenting uh, the Klamath Dam presentation. And I did let him know previously that being here around eight o'clock would probably be a good idea, um, but he is traveling in in the morning. I just sent him an email uh, letting him know. So I don't think that there will be any issue. I think he will be here on time, but I did want to let you know of that caveat. Well, I wonder whether we should have uh, CPS on standby for first thing in the morning, uh, just in case uh, we don't lose any time in case he's held up in traffic or whatnot. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We can certainly do that. We'll get the word out for CPS to be ready uh, in case uh, Mr. Simone is not ready in the morning. But otherwise, we'll try to make uh, E9 happen for us first thing. All right, thanks everyone. Have a, have a good evening and we'll see you in the morning. <laughs>